narratives uh, of the past in, in, it's been a long day yesterday, narratives of the past in, in Central European region, uh, the next panel on politics of memory, and the third one on uh, philosophy of history, followed by a keynote with Phil Gamagelian on memory as an obstacle to peace in Nagorno-Karabakh. And the final, uh, the final point on our program is a round table with uh, six scholars from Brazil, Israel, um, Tunisia, uh, Congo, Pakistan, and Hungary. So we hope you join us for all or some of the events today. We're looking forward to it. James, would you like to say something as well? Uh, well, you've covered everything that I had been planning on saying. So uh, other than that, I think the best thing to do is say welcome and to uh, go to, if you're watching on YouTube, to go to Slido, S-L-I.D-O, and type in the hashtag Harold in the uh, event code to this is able to pose questions, See? which Dagmar is holding up right now. Okay, uh, with that, I think we're going to hand things off to Tomasz and uh, enjoy. Thank you very much. So once again, good afternoon. So, so thank you for our organizers for, for a short introduction of our second day. So we are in a panel number four called Narratives of the Past. We have three presenters or three panelists, two, sing two single panelists and one group panelist, namely Lucia Nutova, Slavka Ochenashova, Veronika Budajova and Jona Zianski. In this panel, you will see a few papers about Charter 77, about Slovak national uprising, and also about the history in the textbook in Czechoslovakia. Our first panelist is Lucia Janotova. Lucia is a PhD candidate in political science and sociology at Scuola Normale Superiore in Florence, Italy, and member of the Center of Social Movement Studies, Cosmos. Her research fields in the social movements and culture studies with a specific focus on artistic activism and protest visual analysis. When not at the university, she tours European film festivals with the documentary film, The Free University About Exile from the Central European University from Budapest, which she co-directed. Her paper is called View from the Gray Zone underground journals as testimonies of alternative histories of narratives. Lucia, stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I just need a second to prepare this. Sorry. Um, okay, so this should be, should be fine. Uh, yeah, so uh, as I was said, the title of my paper is View from the Grey Zone, Czechoslovak Underground Journals as Testimonies of Alternative Historical Narratives. And yeah, it's a pleasure to be presenting here today, and I hope that you will enjoy it, even though it's still a bit early. Uh, as an introduction, so uh, the Velvet Revolution has, in Czechoslovakia has obviously been analyzed multiple times with a particular attention to the first the causal chain that preceded it and also then the transformation processes that came right after. However, as is usually the case, only some stories were afterwards chosen to be lifted to the role of national collective memories and thus became part of the new historical curricula. And logically this way, many important alternative narratives uh, were left out or some of them even forgotten. And I believe that the case of the Czechoslovak underground is a great example of an um, oppositional movement uh, that basically can provide us with an alternative testimony of the Czechoslovak cultural opposition, but whose voices remain mostly um, overlooked. Uh, okay, uh, the reasons uh, for this are manifold, and I believe that I, I will stress some of them later on and can be made mostly attributed to the movement's peculiar position in the political uh, gray zone. Uh, what it means, they basically consciously try to distance themselves both from the regime, so from the official culture, and also from the dissidents. However, this changed in the mid-1970s when their unconventional artistic expression and also their attempts to live in truth, which is something that Havel spoke about a lot, uh, made them a target of governmental repression, and this led to the uniting of the two separate tiers of the country's cultural opposition and culminated in the end in the foundation of the Charter 77. 
However, uh, despite this active involvement basically in the in the charter, uh, the underground's contribution to the Velvet Revolution is usually downplayed or even forgotten in post-revolution memory narratives, especially compared to their more established uh, dissident counterparts. Uh, so in this paper, uh, this paper is basically one of the like first steps of uh, broader PhD research that I'm now focusing on. I would like to have a closer look at the hidden histories of this movement and provide sort of more complete narrative of the cultural opposition in that era. And in order to achieve that here, I will focus on the underground's first Samizda journal, which was called Vokno or a window translated to English, which played a role basically of a traveling archive of the movement's uh, beliefs and activities and served as a meaning making tool, keeping the community together. In this sense, I uh, treat the artists as storytellers of their own fate and pay a very close attention to their self-archiving and self-historization activities that are basically stored on the pages of these texts. And I hope that this way their alternative narratives can at last be heard. I'm also in this presentation using only a visual material that was basically provided in these journals. So for instance, here you can see a graphic about the repressive tactics used by the regime like surveillance, et cetera. So a little bit of history. So a quick genealogy of the underground movement, uh, starting with the roots. Um, so the underground was a cultural movement which emerged in socialist Czechoslovakia in the second half of the 20th century. All those scholars uh, disagree about the precise time frame of his activities. Some characteristics can be applied more uh, generally. Uh, its predecessors can be found in the avant-garde literature and alternative music bands of the 50s and 60s. So for instance, Egon Bondi or the uh, bands like the Primitives Group or Milan Knižák's Actual, whose unconventional lyrics, stage performances and absurd poetry try to capture the surreal reality of the newly established socialist regime. We could also uh, see its roots in the legacy of the so-called dancing hooligans. Uh, those were uh, swing dancers whose activities were illegal during the Czechoslovak protectorate or rock and roll enthusiasts who were heavily persecuted during the 1950s. Then the so-called second generation of the underground uh, emerged in the late 60s and early 70s, and they already resembled a more coherent social and cultural movement. They were grouped primarily around an alternative rock band called the Plastic People of the Universe. And their activities span across diverse art forms, everything from literature, cinema and theater to fine arts and music. Later on, they also became very active in Samiza publishing, which is very much topic of uh, this presentation and the organization of illegal apartment lectures. The mid seventies basically mark an, a very important threshold in the history of the movement. So starting or being self-proclaimed as an apolitical movement after two constructed political trials with the Plastic People of the Universe band and with other people affiliated to it, the underground was forced to change this proclaimed apolitical nature and sort of embrace the role of a cultural oppositional movement. Uh, this was even strengthened afterwards by the creation of solidarity alliance between the underground and uh, official intellectual dissidents, so Havel, uh, Patočka, etc., eventually leading to the foundation of the Charter 77. With 40% of the movement affiliates, so 40% of the underground signing the Charter, uh, it became the largest participating group in the Charter. And finally, the youngest generation, um, it emerged in the 1980s, so all of them were already born in Czechoslovakia after 1968, so already during the normalization, and um, they became active while major figures of the previous generation were either in forced emigration already or imprisoned, and imprisoned mostly due to their involvement in some of the publishing. They have a slogan, out of the ghetto, they called for a more direct political attitude, which was back then enabled by relatively lower levels of uh, state repression. Uh, when it comes to definitions, uh, some perceive the underground as a merely specific stream in literature, whereas for others, its meaning is much deeper, uh, and I belong to the second group. And I think that possibly the best account of the movement is provided by Ivan Martin Jiros, uh, who was one of the underground's main representatives. He's even called the father of the underground because he kind of came up with the label, the underground, which sort of put, uh, brought all of them uh, together. And you can see him in the photograph on the, in the back. Uh, and what he said is, uh, I'm quoting, the underground is not part of any artistic movement or style, although when it comes to music, we can mainly speak about rock music. The underground is a spiritual movement of intellectuals and artists, consciously critical of the world they live in. Although it gets manifested mostly through artistic creation, art for art's sake is not and should not be its final aim. 
underground consists of people who understood that they cannot change anything within the system and therefore decided not to even participate in it. Simply put, the underground is a product of artists and intellectuals whose work is not accepted and acceptable by the establishment. However, despite its non-acceptance, these artists do not give in to bitterness and passivity, but are instead trying to use their work and their way of life to destroy the establishment. Generally speaking then, until the 70s, the underground did not really get that much attention from the regime because they were really on the fringe and no one was focusing on them that much, only the ones who were really enthusiastic about music and stuff. Uh, if we obviously do not count regular repressions connected to their appearance, so primarily the long hair was uh, one of the biggest examples of uh, repressive actions by uh, the government who was forcefully cutting their hair, etc. However, uh, their non-conformist behavior and overall independence from the regime's conventions was so sort of radically new in the society uh, that it became the main confusion and so, uh, for the authorities and then afterwards one of the main reasons why they became persecuted on a much more regular level. In 1976, so shortly after the Festival of Second Culture in Bojanovice, that's how they call themselves, Apparel Culture or Second Culture, and you can see some photos of it on uh, the left, uh, two separate judicial trials against the underground were launched. These were supposed to serve as a universal condemnation of the degraded nature of the movement and a warning to anyone willing to follow in their footsteps. The underground artists were portrayed as unchained and immoral drug addicts, hooligans dangerous to the public order, and mentally ill musical analphabets whose art was of no interest to anyone. The regime was also trying to attach a more conspiratory nature to their activities, but with no evidence. They simply could not believe that so many young people would turn up for an illegal gathering only because of art. However, to the surprise of both the regime and uh, the underground, dissident intellectuals like Patochka and Havel showed support for the arrested artists and reported about their trials abroad. Although they were not always sympathetic to their lifestyle and art productions, they understood that an attack on the underground was also an attack on everything they deemed important, which was living and creating in truth. As Havel explained, and I'm quoting, I suddenly felt that the truth was on their side, no matter how vulgar they are and how long their hair is. Somewhere deep in that movement, I could feel a special purity, shyness, and vulnerability. In their music, they were shines of metaphysical pain and a desire for salvation. So in the end, only uh, seven people out of 17 were sentenced to prison, but in the courtroom, one could already see the main groups forming the basis of the future oppositional movement, which were long-haired 20-year-olds, former members of the Communist Party uh, that left after 1968, and prominent intellectuals of that era. Um, in order to grasp the importance of the underground for the events preceding the revolutionary year in 1989, I believe the best place to look is the vast archive that the movement basically left behind. That's numerous literary pieces that they helped produce, um, music, uh, visual artworks, short films, theater experiments, and also semi-public art happenings and various photographic collections that sort of give us at least a glimpse of how diverse and why their range of activities was. Here I decided to primarily focus on their Sum is the Journal publishing, which I think provides us with the most complex overview of their diverse cultural activities, also the value system and the meaning making processes. Uh, serving as a traveling archive, these journals provide us um, an alternative testimony of life in, Chicoslo in socialist Czechoslovakia through the eyes of its self-proclaimed second culture. And I believe that they also help us break through this rigidity of our mainstream historical narratives. What is more and very important to me is that I believe that focusing on the meaning making documents themselves rather than drawing conclusions based mostly on historiographical accounts helps us to avoid this often problematic practice of imposing the researcher's narrative and allows, us, uh, allows the involved actors to become storytellers of their own fate. Uh, in this presentation, uh, further, I will just uh, focus in more detail on the first official underground semester journal, so the second generation Bokno or window. Uh, which was the first successful underground journal and managed to achieve a nearly cult following and served as the main platform for defining the community that was being built around the underground artists. Uh, so many underground representatives have long felt a need for a common journal, which would serve as this like binding platform for their diverse and widespread uh, activities, especially when concerts and other physical encounters became nearly impossible to organize due to bureaucratic constraints and police repressions, the idea of a collective journal became imminent. After some failed attempts, the first Vokna had been released in 1979 and was then issued uh, irregularly as a Samizda journal until 1989. During this time, they managed to publish 14 full issues later on complemented by a monthly cultural events newsletter and two issues of a video magazine. 
The title refers to the journal's main goal, which was basically to break through the information blockade, which prevented young people from accessing uncensored information. As the author says, you can see it in uh, Czech, but I can give you a short translation in English. Vokno gives you a chance to also look beyond where the current society forces you. We are offering you a little window into the world, ready to release long forgotten authenticity and the full potential of human existence. To reach this goal, the creators built a large distribution network covering a representative proportion of the whole territory, spanning from HEP in Western Bohemia to Košice in Eastern Slovakia. Based on the chief editor's retrospective calculation, the total readership was around 7,000 supporters. And I think if we take into account the complete illegality and the modern nature of Samiza publishing, this is an impressive number, speaking both about the vast outreach of the underground, but also about its popularity. The focus differed issue from issue, gaining a more coherent structure only later on. In general, aim, the aim was to inform readers about everything the second culture care about, and the subtitle was even a journal for a second and other culture. Um, and its topics therefore ranged from rock music, fine and performance arts, theater, film, literature, poetry, to also essays about Western counterculture movements, translation of, of anarchist philosophy and other theoretical texts that were related to nation of uh, creative autonomy. In order to live up to their aim of breaking through the information blockade, the editors also publish essays discussing contemporary political situation, biographies and pieces written by political prisoners, debates about ecological issues, and reviews uh, of any organized concerts, exhibitions, or lectures. In order to prevent police raids or putting anyone in danger, cultural events were always reported about retrospectively. They also paid special attention to more localized topics like the problematic of drug addiction in Northern Bohemia, which was completely ignored by the official press. Importantly, uh, the, journals, um, the journal distribution network was established as a two-way stream, which meant that readers were strongly encouraged to share their own literary text, reviews, essays, or topical letters, which were then included in later issues. In this sense, the journal basically served as this collective identity building tool where anyone who was interested could join the discussion about and thus form the nature and the meaning of the underground community. This open and participatory nature of the journal also applied to the published literary work and visual material, with a particular focus on unknown and debuting artists, or those who were for their non-conformist work persecuted and imprisoned. So in issue seven, we, can for, we could, for instance, read the first publication of Ivan Martin Yero's prison poetry labeled Megor's Swan Songs, or work by imprisoned poetist Lenka Marečkova. And now the most important part and sort of uh, concluding as well. Uh, so the Wokno Underground Journal was, uh, I think, fulfilling at least two functions. Firstly, it served as a bonding glue, bringing together interested cultural enthusiasts and eventually leading to the creation of a community. With fewer opportunities for physical gatherings at concerts and exhibitions, and with the need for secrecy and limited number of uh, participants at any organized event, detailed reports represented sort of the only way of sharing this communal experience with wider public. That is also one of the reasons why most of these reports did not primarily focus on the technical review of the event, but rather paid strong attention to its atmosphere, concerned physical sensations, and the performance interaction with the public, and also this creative intersection of all of the various forms uh, that the underground cared about and that made these events distinct, like videos, you know, music, poetry, everything was there. Secondly, the journal fulfilled the already mentioned function of the movement's traveling archive. Because of frequent police checks, building a physical archive of the community would be too dangerous and would also go against the value of openness and non-hierarchical relationships that the movement adhered to. The editors were clear about the fact that individual issues of the magazine should not be hoarded or kept in private archives, but instead they should be copied and sent around to be shared with as many people as possible. The journal does serve as a chronicle of the underground's activities, and also the plethora of, only, of newly formed and disappeared art formations, their beliefs, key figures, and more salient topics like immigration, social problems, the relationship with the dissidents, and so on. Its textual form was also complemented with photos, sketches, simple graphics, and other visual material, making the archival memory even more vivid. Such processes of self-historization, self-archiving, and in some sense also self-theorization led the movement members to at once becoming interpreters, historians, and archivists of their own work. So basically they're greatest supporters, but also critics. This is a direct result of living on an invisible edge of a dictatorial society in their own self-sustained merry ghetto or a gray zone in which conscious self-historization served as an indirect criticism of the regime. However, I believe that its importance goes even deeper. Thanks to its autonomous production, this journal was directly involved in the formation of a parallel memory and parallel identity of the movement, which was 
uninfluenced by the regime's ideology or self-censorship. It helped elaborate and preserve new forms of counter history, and its production also personally tested social conditions, allowing for the existence of any authentic art sphere or lifestyle in the midst of a totalitarian regime. Last but not least, it served as a powerful instrument of individual subversion. Because of these reasons, I strongly agree with Daniel Grun, who says that the artist archive is not just a data bank for the documentation of artistic activities, it is also an echo of a contradictory historical memory. For me, it's also a tool for establishing one's own place in the mainstream historical narrative, and it is why I believe these journals and the whole underground community deserve more attention. Concluding with the words of the poet and philosopher Zbigniew Heide, after a couple of years, we can always witness that what used to be on the periphery ignored was in fact much more important than the mainstream. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much. That was Lucia Janosova with her presentation about underground journals, Wokno or window in English language. Thank you very much. Now we are coming to our second presentation or paper by Slavka Ochenashova. Slavka is an associate professor at the Department of History of Shafargi University in Košice. Since her master studies at Central European University, she has been dealing with history of history textbooks, which gradually evolved into broader topic of her research such as politics of memory, ethnic stereotypes and historiography. Since 2018, she has been a seconded national expert to the European Research Council Executive Agency in Brussels, where she supports as a call coordinator, investigator driven frontier research across all fields. Her paper is called Our Heroes, Your Enemies, using historical personalities as identity formation elements in history textbook. Slavka, stage is yours. Um, hello, thank you very much. I will share my screen for the presentation. Uh, I hope you can see it well. Please not, I see that you are nodding, thank you. So dear colleagues, uh, thank you very much for giving me opportunity to present at this interesting event. And uh, as Tomas has just said today, I'm going to talk about the part of the research I have conducted for my new book, which will be on heroes in history textbooks. So unlike Lucie, I will talk about the hardcore mainstream narratives, but uh, what makes me similar to Lucie is that I will have to speak as rapidly as she did because it's really, really very hard to narrate about the narratives. I'm, I'm cutting all day this text. So I'm, I'm sorry for this, but I will have to be very fast. Mm, so as, as you could hear, I started to deal with the narratives in history textbooks some 15 years ago when I was doing my MA in history in Central European University. And although the scope of my research has stretched since then, um, this is still one of my favorite topics as I deem history textbooks as one of the really influential means of forming history historical memory and creating collective identity. Um, so, in terms of scope and time, my current research involves Czechoslovak and Slovak textbooks published since 1918 until 1989. That means these were published in three different political regimes in the interwar Czechoslovakia during the uh, World War II Slovak state, and then in the period of 1948 to 89 when Czechoslovakia was ruled by the Communist Party. The main questions I have been asking myself were, what does it take to become a national hero? What qualities are important uh, in in order to enter history textbooks? And are these desired qualities constant or do they change with the change of the regime? My work stemmed from the hypothesis that narratives about historical heroes have the task of presenting them as the ideal representatives of the nation and as desired prototypes of the individuals. Concurrently, I contextualized the work under the assumption that such representations of national heroes can also contribute to the creation of negative images of the other. Uh, Svetopluk was a 10th century ruler of uh, Great Moravia, a medieval state, and different and contradictory images of Svetopluk have been produced in literary and historical sources from the times of his life until today in the past 1000 years. Some sources describe him as a brave king, a founder of the nation and its first state, a unifier of all Slavs, even a saint, 
while in others he is represented as a traitor, an uneducated oppressor of Methodius students, and a prototype of a wrongful collaborator with the enemies. A dramatic dispute over Svetopluk in Slovak society erupted in 2010 after his monument, a bronze statue, was unveiled in the courtyard of Bratislava Castle by the highest representatives of the state less than a week before the elections to the National Council of the Slovak Republic. Two committees were appointed to judge the relevance and political correctness of the statue. Political utilization and media coverage of the event provoked a lively and controversial debate in Slovak society and among historians and even attracted attention from abroad. And then following this public discourse, I decided to have a look at the 100 years of developments of the narratives that were presented to students in primary and elementary schools. So, um, now I would go immediately to the interwar uh, Czechoslovak history textbooks, but a little bit of contextualization at the beginning. Czechoslovakia was established after the World War I following the disintegration of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The new state consisted of several regions with different historical, political, and economic developments, and it became the homeland of different nationalities. Czechs and Slovaks were in the position of the state-forming nation, others in the position of national minorities. There was a necessary socio-political need to justify the existence of the newly formed state. To achieve this, an official concept of the Czechoslovak state building nation was promoted. This was necessary mainly in order to, to counterbalance distinctive national minorities of Germans and Hungarians. And this agenda also found its way into the state education. These ideas were reflected in the contemporary history textbooks and narratives about the national heroes. Searching back for the common roots of Czechs and Slovak, the medieval principality of Great Moravia seemed like a handy solution, and it was depicted as the first joint state of Czechs and Slovaks in history. At the same time, the textbook narratives promoted the idea of cultural superiority of Czechs and Slovaks over the outside world and clearly defined the competitive relationship with the neighbors. Narratives about Svetopluk presented him as a brilliant politician who turned the land of our ancestors in a significant state power in Europe. The tense international relations that Czechoslovakia had with Hungary and Germany in the interwar per period, as well as the internal social context in the country, characterized by the need to cope with the distinctive and numerous national minorities whose members were suspected of inclination and loyalty to neighboring states, had an impact on creating historical narratives about Germans and historians. <clears throat> Interwar history textbooks de de depicted them as vandals trying to dominate the territory historically belonging to the Czechs and Slovaks and as the cause of the subsequent decline in any significant attempts in the state formation done by our ancestors. Uh, now I will proceed to the developments during World War II. Uh, the disintegration of Czechoslovakia at the end of 1930s, the establishment of the Slovak Republic and the World War II influenced the nature of school history education. Propaganda disseminated by political elites reflected such interpretation of the past, which was supposed to portray the independent Slovak statehood as the optimal culmination of historical development. A direct historical continuity between Great Moravia and the new state unit was emphasized. The Slovak Republic was declared to be the successful successor or successor state of Great Moravia, and President Tiso was sometimes portrayed as Svetopluk's successor. The disintegration of Czechoslovakia also required a change in the concept of national history. In the new political context, it became essential to clear the narratives about Slovak history from the image of the common Czech and Slovak past. Therefore, in history textbooks published during World War II, Great Moravia was no longer interpreted as the common state of Czechs and Slovak, but as a genuinely Slovak state. The idea of an alliance of Czechs and Slovaks under Svetopluk was not needed anymore, and therefore he was no longer presented as a unifier, but as a conqueror. 
Narratives about the life of Svetopluk were also used to promote the contemporary image of neighbors who were regarded as enemies. The disintegration of Czechoslovakia, fresh border changes in favor of Hungary after the Vienna arbitration in 1938, and the dominance of the German Empire influenced the way in which history textbooks represented the other. The political relationship that existed between Great Moravia and the Kingdom of Franks was presented as an analogy of the contemporary 1940s international political relations between Germany and the Slovak Republic. While the interwar textbooks emphasized the conflict with German power and Germans were perceived as aggressive, offensive, and unfair, in the case of World War II textbooks, the image of the German neighbor is already much different under the influence of the changes in the international political political situation. Svetopluk himself was portrayed as an extraordinarily capable and independent ruler who was able, thanks to his military availability, uh, ability and strategic political decisions, to establish an equal relationship with his powerful German neighbor. <clears throat> Although the World War II Slovak Republic together with Hungary formally belonged to the German sphere of power and both countries stood in one international political bloc, the Vienna arbitration and the subsequent territorial losses in favor of Hungary marked the bilateral relations between the, the two countries with a bitter taste. Therefore, the representations of Hungarians in history textbooks published during World War II did not differ much from those <clears throat> presented in the interwar history textbooks. The Hungarians were once again described as primitive savages, as at a lower level of civilizational development than our ancestors. <clears throat> uh, World War II textbooks represented the clash between great Moravian Slavs and Hungarians from the point of view of the so-called hospitality theory promoted since the 18th century. So this was the idea supporting the, 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 the concept that in 10th century, the indigenous Slavic population accepted and welcomed the newly arriving Hungarian tribes and helped them settle in their new joint homeland. The presented narratives were supposed to enhance the image of superiority of culturally more advanced Slavic Christian ancestors and their civilization mission in relation to barbarian immigrants. Now I'm moving to the next period, uh, and that's uh, Czechoslovak history textbooks published after 1948. That means uh, during the rule of the Communist Party. And this time, the interpretation of the history of Great Moravia and the significance of Svetopluk in history textbook books brought together an old historiographic tradition. Great Moravia was depicted as the first common state of Czechs and Slovaks, a true golden age of the nation. Svetopluk was portrayed as a great ruler political leader, a unifier of the strong joint medieval empire of our ancestor, and a successful conqueror. There were also significant new motifs included, in which defined our ancestors within a wider group of Slavic peoples and incorporated fewer hostile descriptions of the other, both Hungarians and Germans. An important component of historical narratives were the ordinary people, the masses, who were represented as the carriers of progress and thus became the archetypes of heroes themselves. The transfer of heroic competencies to ordinary people was also reflected in the reduced space devoted to specific historical personalities in the narratives examined, including uh, Svetopluk. So, we could speak a lot about uh, how um, the situation has changed after 1989 and after 1993. Uh, we can say that after also turbulent period in the 90s, where 1990s, where many um, uh, ultra patriotic or even nationalist narratives were offered to students in school education, present day history textbook provide a quite a neutral uh, depiction of the Svetopluk and his role in the history. Uh, however, when, when, when working on this topic, I came across one interesting competition. And uh, one of the ways of seeing how some students may uh, internalize the story about Svetopluk today can be seen through the annual artistic competition called Revival of the Kingdom of Svetopluk. Mm, the images students frequently present in their 
poems were those of our good ruler or a Slavic hope or our role model, but also as the one citation whose sword cuts the hands and heads of Franks and Hungarians, end of citation. Well, this is certainly of anecdotic character and a far more intensive and complex interdisciplinary research is needed in order to analyze how the images of Svetopluk or historical heroes in general are understood by students through history education nowadays. The fact that this competition is supported by state institutions, some schools and some universities, also Matica Slovenska is involved. Uh, and that they also may contribute to the negative promotion of the other is an important indicator or a byproduct, as you wish, of the contemporary politics of school history education. And just to briefly wrap it, uh, the analyzed texts have shown that the interpretation of life, deeds, and the importance of the selected national hero were subordinated to changing political contexts, and their primary aim was to contribute to the indoctrination of ideals and values currently promoted by the state power. This is not surprising. Analyzing these texts within the contemporary historiographical production, it also showed up that the textbooks did not necessarily follow the historical research, but they were very much reflecting, or to a big extent reflecting the 19th century romanticist ideals of apologetic nation defending narratives. Indeed, the hero was an important figure in creating a cohesive community, but he was also used in the narratives that defined the national community against imagined enemies, and in this case, it was even a group of citizens, certain national minorities living in the state. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much. This was presentation made by Slavka Ochenashova about history textbooks. And now we are approaching the third panelist. It's a group, group, um, group by Veronika Budajova and Jona Jansky. Veronika is a master student from Slovakia. She is currently doing her master program in political science at Central European University. Her main topics of interest are the influence of the media on public and how the media discourse is developed in totalitarian regime. Jona Jansky is currently a master student at History Department of Central European University. His main Areas of interest is the Second World War in the Eastern Central Europe, more specifically Slovak national building during this period. Name of the paper made by Budejova and Jansky is Changing Narratives of Slovak National Uprising, Analysis of the Presidential Speeches and Remembrance of the National Building Events. Veronika and Jonas, stage is yours. Oh, thank you very much for uh, possibility and for space to speak. Uh, I will start our presentation with a quick introduction of our topic, why we decided for this topic and what actually we see through our topic. And then Veronica will take over and get, get to the nuts and bolts of our research by showing our, our methodology, our findings and our conclu conclusion. So uh, as uh, Tomasz already mentioned, we are looking at the, at the commemoration of the Slovak national uprising. Uh, we are looking at the commemoration specifically by political elite, which that's why we uh, political elite. Uh, we find uh, we find it important as the political elite is, uh, of course, important for uh, historical narrative of the nation nation and for create creation of idea of the nation. Uh, and we think that uh, looking at Slovak national building is important because Slovakia self identifies uh, uh, itself to great extent as an ethnic state of Slovaks, which can be seen, for, for example, from the constitution of the, of, of the Slovak Republic. And so this is very important in the discu discourse. Uh, furthermore, we are looking at uh, president, uh, presidential speeches made uh, from 2009 to 2020, uh, during these commemorate, commemorative celebrations, we are looking at president from two main reasons. One is practical, and second is more of um, more methodological in a certain way. We are looking at president because uh, uh, because uh, they are the highest uh, highest 
constitutional office in, Slo in Slovak Repub Republic political system. What's more, uh, they are take they are of they are they are mostly representative uh, in their function, and uh, they are often viewed as sort of unifying force in the Slovak politics, because they are uh, there is certain uh, uh, preconception that they shouldn't be they shouldn't be part uh, partisan very much. And our more practical reason for looking at the presidential speech speeches is the fact that uh, presidential office or the web uh, of the president's presidential office have much better archives than the office of the prime minister and uh, and the speaker of parliament, which are other two offices that tend to speak at these commemorative events. So to SNP, uh, Slovak National Uprising was uh, uprising during the Second World War from end of the August till the end of the October. It was uprising against the uh, German ally allied uh, Slovak Republic. Uh, it was uh, uprising from the both uh, communist and the, and the civic resistance supported by the allied powers. Uh, it was unsuccessful, but uh, its commemoration became become important point of the Slovak historical narrative. What is more, uh, this importance is quite striking, for example, in comparing to the Velvet Revolution in 1989. As yesterday, Dagmar in her in her introduction said, that there, there are not much of the official commemoration of the Velvet Revolution, but for example, Slovak, uh, uh, Slovak National Uprising is commemorated every year on the huge celebration in Banska Bystrica, Bystrica which was the city that was center of the rebel territory. Uh, and uh, throughout the, and because of this important event, there are Three, my, three main uh, sort of uh, historiographical narratives concerning this event. This, uh, these narratives are very much tied to the political ideology. And uh, these narratives are the socialist narrative that was prevalent or communist narrative that was prevalent during the previous regime, which sort of uh, shows a, a Slovak national uprising as a, as a anti-fascist struggle with great importance on the Soviet, uh, Soviet help and communist resistance. Then there is a revisionist ultra-nationalistic narrative that tend, tend to be associated with ultra-right politicians that sort of argues that the Slovak national uprising was a coup against the legitimately uh, legitimate, uh, legitimate uh, government of the Slovak Republic. And then there, there is a third uh, third uh, narrative, which I've seen described as a civic liberal narrative in certain ways that focuses on the plurality of the of the forces within uh, within the the uprising on the, and on the uprising as a role of the sort of as a of the Slovak part of the of the pan-European struggle against fascism. And uh, based on these narratives and ba uh, based on the presidents uh, that were three during our time range. It was the career politician uh, uh, Ivan Gasparovic, which, uh, which was close to the nationalist parties. Then there was uh, non-partisan Andrei Kiska and then uh, current president uh, Zuzana Čaputova. Uh, we sort of hypothesized at the start of our research that the sort of the civic liberal uh, interpretation of the of the event will become more prevalent throughout the, throughout the time. Now I give floor to Veronika. Thank you, Jonas, for your introduction to our topic and thank you, organizers, for the opportunity to be here. Now I will proceed to uh, methodology, then findings, and I will speak about uh, limitations. So methodology, uh, as Jonas stated, we assume that uh, at the beginning, the, there was more nationalistic narrative in the speeches and uh, this narrative changed uh, to civic engagement uh, and uh, promotion of democratic and liberal values. Uh, we looked at uh, this uh, shift in narrative through uh, three main shifts. So the first one is shift from national remembrance toward civic engagement and democratic values. Uh, second one is shift from nationalism and national unity toward citizenship and promotion of uh, Slovakia as a part of the European Union. And the last shift is uh, the use of emotional language uh, was uh, decreasing uh, with the disappearance of uh, part of 
nationalistic narrative. So uh, these three sheets were analyzed in 11 speeches given by three Slovak presidents, as Jonas mentioned. Uh, through, they were analyzed through the lens of content analysis. Uh, and we established three main categories. Uh, uh, so this is part of our coding system. The first category is nationalism, and it um, looked at the speeches in terms of belonging to a specific territory or belonging to a specific nationality or being part of the European Union. Second category is emotional appeal, which is closely connected to the nationalism, but in this context, it needs to be separated because while nationalism uh, refers to a notion of belonging and the president expresses the opinion about uh, ourselves and who we are as a Slovaks, emotional appeal uh, looks uh, at the who we ought to be and also refers to a concrete uh, feelings which the speakers in this uh, case presidents want to convey uh, in, uh, for the people or to the Slovak people. And the third category, uh, current problems, it's pretty straightforward. It uh, looks at what type of problems are referred to in the speeches. And so uh, we assume at the beginning that Ivan Gasparovic with his background in uh, politics and uh, would be more, uh, would use more nationalistic language and therefore also emotional appealing language and uh, wouldn't uh, refer to current problems uh, at the same level as Andrei Kiska and later Zuzana Chaputova, who would uh, focus more on civic engagement and promotion of democratic values and liberties. We also established uh, two separate categories or additional categories uh, just to uh, show or analyze the overall feeling of the speeches. So we looked at the connotation and uh, elements of storytelling. And again, we assume that with more nationalistic narrative, there will be more uh, use of uh, elements of storytelling and also connotation. Uh, so for the findings, uh, just really generally <laughs> speaking, um, for the first shift, so the shift from national remembrance to the promotion of civic engagement and democratic values and liberties, uh, the first part, uh, use of nationalist language was, uh, as we expected, uh, at the uh, uh, beginning. Uh, so the speech from 2009 given by Ivan Gasparovic used more nationalistic language and this was slowly decreasing. But uh, reference to current problems, mm, uh, Ivan Gasparovic was referring to the problems of uh, uh, civic nature, uh, democratic values and liberties and present anti-democratic values and ideologies, but in very scarce way. And this was, uh, these references were increasing uh, and the highest number of references to current problems was uh, in a speech given by Andrei Kiska, but this can be explained by the parliamentary change or aftermath of uh, parliamentary election in Slovakia, uh, after which uh, uh, neo-fascist party uh, in seats uh, in the Slovak parliament. But the references were uh, decreasing and in um, Zuzana Chaputova speech from this year, there were almost no references to the problems. Uh, quickly to the second shift, so uh, from uh, narrative uh, promoting nationalism and national unity to citizenship and uh, Europeanism, so uh, belonging to European Union. Uh, the second part 
wasn't uh, found in our analysis. Uh, while we can see here that belonging uh, uh, to or being part of the uh, European Union uh, is mostly present in a speech given by Ivan Gasparovic during his last speech, but then this narrative was disappearing. But the first part uh, referring to Slovakia as a nation and national unity was present in his early speeches, uh, so Ivan Gasparovic's early speeches. And looking at the last shift, so shift in use of uh, emotional triggering language, uh, this was as we expected uh, at the beginning uh, of uh, our analysis. Uh, so in the speech given in 2009, there were um, the most uh, use of emotional language uh, than uh, in any other in any other speech, and also the addition of findings so connotation and storytelling. Uh, this was also uh, present as we assume that uh, uh, even Gasparov with his uh, political background will use more nationalistic language. So um, more uh, uh, language uh, triggering emotional response will be more present and also elements of storytelling and connotation. So this was also uh, proved in our analysis. And quickly to limitations. Uh, one limitation is with pluralistic nature, while uh, we uh, need to include it to our analysis. Uh, for the from the observation, we can say that uh, it was present. With Ivan Gasparovic wasn't uh, referring to uh, Slovak national uprising as uh, mm, like part uh, uh, like a fight. Uh, uh, at which were uh, Slovaks, Czechs, uh, French people, and all other nations present, but it was only Slovak. Uh, it was only his Slovak achievement. Uh, but this uh, narrative slowly changed, and with Andrei Kiska and Zuzana Chaputova, this was uh, present more and more, or referred more and more. Another limitation is. Uh, we are aware that uh, there is potential bias uh, because of uh, our focus only on presidential speeches, uh, but it's a way of introducing the topic and we, are, we know that another additional analysis is needed. So thank you for your attention. So thank you very much. This was the presentation made by Jona Zianske and, and Veronika Budajova. Now we are coming to the, to the discussion part. I would like to ask those who are in Zoom, they can raise their hands if they want to ask something. And also we have some, some question in Slido. You can still ask your question through slido.com, hashtag Herald. The first question is to Jonas and Veronika. The question is, do the narratives of the Slovak national uprising have also different meanings to different generations? How it may be adapted in a generation Z in the near future? Well, uh... Honestly, I'm not sure we are able to satisfactorily answer this question as we did not look at this uh, different uh, uh, dif uh, generational difference. But on my very much biased and restricted view, I would maybe argue that uh, depending on as because it's a very politicized topic. So depending on the political allegiance of the given person, I would argue that the younger people would be more, uh, more aligned with that civic liberal 
uh, description desc uh, description of the of the Slovak national uprising than the other older older generation that was uh, raised and educated in the communist system but this this is also limited by the fact that uh, also the the far right parties had quite a support uh, in the young generation in Slovakia so people supporting these parties would probably be much more much less liberal and pluralistic in their narrative and that's probably the best way I can answer this so thank you. Now there is a question to, to Slavka, to history books. There are the, there's a two part question. The first part is how you see the quality of the textbooks nowadays? How, how do you see the development of the, of the quality of the history textbooks based on the presenting the history? And, and the second question is concerning Matica Slovenska and how do you think that there is influence from these institutions to the history textbooks and how these institutions influence the education in Slovakia? And these are the questions. Thank you. So first of all, the quality of the textbooks, I think that we still didn't reach the interwar period in the sense that we never repeated the the plurality of the textbooks uh, published that was available during the interwar period. And the plurality of textbooks, I think, is very good to have the selection, to have the, the offer, the variety. Uh, so we still um, are more or less uh, entrapped by the custom that was developed during uh, socialism when there was one textbook uh, um, confirmed and agreed and used in, in, the, in the school. Now, today we have more than one textbooks. Uh, I think that their narratives are, uh, are really aiming for political cor correctness uh, as much as they can. However, they still keep this traditional point of view in a sense that there is a general history or the world history, and then there is a Slovak history, you know, and this brings a lot of conceptual issues of also how we present ourselves, how we understand our sense and our history. So I would have wished for a little bit more of entanglement with the <clears throat> with the world history not to not to really divide the 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 students and the textbook chapters into general history and world history because then sometimes we are losing a little bit uh, of the importance of particular topics from national past and its uh, and its uh, and its uh, relation to the other developments uh, other historical developments in other countries other nations and so on so i think it would be very good to little bit uh, look at the different concepts and possibilities maybe uh, promote the discussion about the change of the curricula and so on and so on but this is a really very long process and requires a lot of resources and also a lot of uh, it, it shouldn't be just really put on the on the shoulders of professional historians, I must say, because there should be a little bit broader social discussions about this. Not, historians should not be always asked to transfer the, their scientific research into school history textbook, because history textbook, I mean, it should be based on the scientific outcomes, but it still it shouldn't be. I think uh, it, it's, it's very different to write uh, professionally and scholarly about the topic and then write about, uh, about the topic for children. Also, the question is, what do we want to achieve with our history education? Do we want children or students to know the great plethora of facts or would we like them to develop some critical skills and so on and so on? And I think here it could be a little bit of space for the more, you know, the societal discussion, how to form this history education. With Matica Slovenska, I mean, it, it depends. Uh, their impact depends. Of course, uh, the, the institution is active culturally is active. I think this really depends to big extent nowadays on the preference of the teacher herself or himself, whether she follows different initiatives and chooses from different initiatives. And of course, uh, we, we don't have only Matica Slovenska, it's one side, but we have many, many other organizations that are very active in promoting very good educational material. So there is a, a variety of choices. And I think it's very much up to teacher to, to choose and there should be also space for educating teachers in this sense. This is a very huge topic and I don't want to go further because I will take a lot of time, but thank you for the question. Thank you very much. There, is, there are many questions once again to, to Veronica's and Jonas paper. I would ask you, um, 
you you understand you they understand that you didn't look at the other actors in politics like the the prime minister or their speeches but what are you expecting from them and what are may, maybe your expectations from the other political actors than than just the president in their speeches regarding to Slovak national uprising or other historical events Veronica, do you want to take this or should I answer again? Uh, I can answer. Uh, so, well, as I uh, said, uh, uh, we are uh, only looking at president because of the archives and the possibility to uh, compare uh, the narratives. But uh, yes, so we uh, in know that it is very uh, it can be very biased view but when we look at other politicians for example um, speaker of the parliament it uh, in my opinion or what I can say uh, it uh, depends on the political party uh, for example we can't uh, uh, expect that uh, the use of language will be more nationalistic or uh, more promoting extremist view when the uh, speaker is from extremist party than someone from a uh, more moderate or liberal party. So uh, I can't say uh, about the overall narrative. Uh, we it requires analysis uh, as uh, as we saw uh, the uh, we uh, some expectations weren't uh, fulfilled in our analysis so we can't say uh, we never can say for sure Jonas you want to add something no I think I th I think that uh, only thing I would say that it, it is very much uh, dependent on the on the political allegiance, as uh, Veronica said, but I would maybe guess that there wouldn't be the shift uh, to more plur pluralistic and sort of the 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 civic narrative wouldn't be as pronounced as it was in president as with presidents, because the succession of the presidents was very specific concerning who they were as a people in certain sense. So it would be a little less, but uh, but. That is just that is just why what I think from like educated guess or not even educated it's just guessing. So thank you very much for the question. So thank you very much. There is other question to Lucie Janotova. Um, there was interest in the idea that the publication is sort of a social glue. And can you please expand this idea? What you meant by this idea? Yeah, sure. Thank you for the question. Um, so the idea was that before, like basically before the normalization process in the 70s, uh, the underground community had a chance to sort of come together and uh, basically become a community while meeting at all of these cultural events that still at the end of the 60s and beginning of the 70s were still possible to organize. So there were many uh, underground concerts, but also some exhibitions that were still allowed to proceed, or even if they were kept maybe in private flats or uh, abandoned gardens and uh, sometimes even in forests, uh, they were still possible to organize because the repressions were not as, hi as uh, high anymore. But this really wasn't that much possible anymore in like the middle of the 70s or like 1977, 78, because it was already after the two political trials and many of the representatives were already in prison and uh, basically the whole community was suffering and sort of falling apart because many people were also forced to emigrate uh, during the assassination process. That was one of the big campaigns by the regime to try to basically force uh, many of the underground artists to leave the country. Um, so basically the idea of uh, having a journal was uh, basically to continue this process of uh, gluing the community together. So those who stayed felt really isolated and abandoned, which was also given by the censorship, obviously, and almost 
like the regime wasn't really uh, writing about the community anything. So like if you didn't know someone or if you were not from Prague, you basically had no chance to get connected. So the idea of this journal was to overcome this blockade and bring them back together. So that's kind of the social glue idea. And it also served afterwards as like an information thing because yeah, obviously overcoming censorship and trying to uh, communicate any information about any of the events that actually managed to be organized even in the in the 70s but that was usually for like you know 20 people or something so people from i don't know um eastern moravia or like even from slovakia wouldn't be able to come to that so the journal kind of served as an uh, as a glue for this Thank you very much. And there is the last question because we need to we need to continue according to our program. So the last question is: How do you think that it's it's to Jonas and Veronica? And the question is: How do you think that the ideological background of the president may affect their discourse? I can answer it. Uh, so, ideological background. Um, as we saw in the analysis, and then as I mentioned, uh, there is not only ideological, but overall background uh, of the um, presidents in this case, uh, changed the overall narrative. So even Gasparovic, he uh, had, uh, he had, uh, he had, <laughs> Uh, for her uh, background in politics, uh, he was also oh, a member of the parliament. Uh, he was uh, also present uh, in the constitution making process in Slovakia. Uh, uh, so uh, he had, uh, as a politician, he had more uh, nationalistic narrative and discourse and also more use of uh, emotional language. And he was referring, um, at least at the beginning of our analysis, so in 2009, he was really referring to Slovakia as a nation of Slovaks, and he was on, uh, mentioning other nations fighting in Slovak national uprising. So, and with also uh, background of Andrei Kiska, uh, so uh, he, uh, as an entrepreneur, who was um, uh, promoting more nature, uh, neutral uh, narrative, and with Zuzana Chaputova, also uh, with uh, her uh, uh, membership or alliance uh, with uh, more progressive party in Slovakia, as uh, she uh, was using less and less nationalistic language. Thank you for the question. Janusz, do you want to add something? I don't think so. So thank you very much. This was everything for the panel number four. Now we are approaching the panel number five in approximately 10 minutes. So please stay tuned through Zoom or to YouTube. We'll continue in the panel called The Politics of Memory.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our fifth panel. Uh, my name is Vivienne, and I'll be the moderator for this panel, which is dedicated to politics of memory. In this panel, there are three presenters, and each of them will be given 15 minutes to elaborate on their theme or topic. If you, as the audience, have any questions regarding their presentations, please feel free to ask through, through Zoom or on the website called slido.com. On Slido, do not forget to enter the call for the specific event, which is Herald. So I hope everything is clear, and I'd like to introduce our first presenter. His name is Michael Samjetsabad, and he is a PhD candidate who's currently enrolled in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay, India. Michael is from India's northeastern state of Manipur and belongs to the Mai Tai community. Today he will be presenting on the theme called History of the Puyas, the case of Mai Tai community in India's northeastern state of Manipur. So without further ado, Michael, you can introduce your topic and the stage is yours. So I can start the presentation, right? The title of uh, the paper is History and Puyas, the case of Maitai community in India's northeastern state of Manipur. The ethno-linguistic community that I discuss in this paper is the Maitai community. The majority of the Maitai community, a population of around 1, 000, uh, one, uh, one and a half million uh, people live in Manipur. Uh, this is uh, the map of Manipur. The small patch of flatland uh, in the middle of Manipur is called Imphal Plains. Imphal Plain is around 690 square miles and majority of the uh, Maitais in Manipur live there. So this is the map of India. The blue dot is Manipur and Manipur borders Myanmar, Myanmar in the east. So uh, let's now go back to the, you know, go to the background of the paper, a brief history of Manipur and the Maitais. In the second half of the 18th century uh, and the uh, early 19th century, there were numerous uh, uh, raids conducted by the Burmese and 90% of the population of the Maitais that time, which is around half a million, according to some estimates, were taken as slaves in the Burmese kingdom. In 1826, with the help of the British, uh, the Maitai feudal lords finally recaptured Imphal and Manipur became a buffer country between the British India and Burma. After a half a century of British interference, uh, some Maitai lords fought a war with the British in 1891 and British defeated them decisively. Till 1947, Manipur remained a princely state under the British. When British left Manipur in 1947, uh, Manipur became a constitutional monarchy with its own constitution and people of Manipur voted for the first time in uh, 1948 and there was an elected assembly of representatives. In 1949, Manipur merged uh, with, the cons uh, with uh, India uh, after the Maharaja of Manipur, the nominal head, head of the state, signed a merger uh, agreement with the Indian authorities. So the merger remain, uh, remains controversial till today. For many scholars now, the Maharaja did not uh, have the authority to sign the merger agreement, given that there was already an elected assembly of representatives. Second, uh, many scholars have also argued that Maharaja of Ma Manipur signed the merger agreement under duress and he was forced to sign the agreement. So now we see uh, different insurgent groups uh, waging an armed struggle against the Indian state for the independence of Manipur and insurgency began right immediately after the merger uh, and it continues till today. But those who support the merger with India uh, justified it using a narrative called Aryan theory of the origin of the Maitais, uh, which they draw out from the Hindu epic uh, Mahabharata. So Mahabharata is a remembered tradition uh, or smriti of the Indian civilization. The narrative of Mahabharata revolves around uh, Pandavas, the ruler of, uh, rulers of Indraprastha and Kauravas, the rulers of Hastinapur. When Pandavas uh, lost their territory, Indraprastha, in a gambling match with Kauravas, they were forced into exile. During, uh, uh, during their exile, Arjuna, uh, the third uh, uh, brother of the third one among the Pandava brothers uh, came to Manipur and he married Chidrangada, the princess of Manipur. And they gave birth to Babru Bahana, 
Babrubhana later becomes the king of Manipur. This is the Aryan theory of the origin of the Maitai. It says that Maitais are a descendant of Arjuna. So Aryan theory of the origin of Maitai has two uh, premises. Uh, uh, one is Maitais are a descendant of Babrubhana, the son of Arjuna. And Maitais uh, have always been Hindus since the days of Mahabharata. These are the two premises. So in 18, 19 centuries, Maitai kings have used this narrative because of the Burmese raid in order to gain support from the Hindu neighboring Hindu kings to fight the Burmese. So colonial ethnographers were also very much aware of this uh, debates and colonial historians, historians have also talked about this debate. They debated on whether Maitais are uh, half Aryan and half Mongoloids or Maitais are just Mongoloids. That was the, uh, there was a debate they had. And, but, uh, but most of them seem to agree that, uh, that Hinduism is very new to the Maitais. So on, uh, writing in the 19th century, uh, historian, British historian James Willer calls the uh, Maitais uh, barbarians because they have been learned, uh, they have learned very little of the Brahminism from the uh, Hindu from their Hindu neighbors. So to these ethnographers and historians, it was clear that the second premises of the Aryan theory is at best doubtful. So <clears throat> this narrative is used by the um, 20th century intellectuals who were mostly Congress, uh, International Congress party sympathizers to support the merger of Manipur with India. They argued that Manipur has always been part and partial uh, of India as this narrative in the Aryan theory states. So uh, uh, now uh, uh, contemporary scholars have rejected this narrative. They have argued that Manipur, Manipura in Mahabharata uh, is not the present day Manipur. They claim that uh, the Manipura in Mahabharata is somewhere else in Central, Asia, uh, Central India. While others argue that Manipura is not mentioned in Mahabharata at all. The place which is mentioned in Mahabharata is Manalpura. These two arguments are designed to puncture the first premises of the Aryan theory that Maitais are descendants of Arjuna. Their objections to the narrative come from their reading of Mahabharata. So, uh, like uh, recently, uh, so recent scholarship attacked the second premises that Maitais have been always Hindus. So, recent scholarships hold that Hinduism started spreading in Manipur only in the 18th century. So when we talk about the contemporary histories of Manipur, we see scholars mostly constructing national history of Manipur now. So this project of national history emerged after the merger of Manipur uh, with India. These histories are attempts to show that Manipur already was an independent nation state before the merger of Manipur with India. This project of national history uh, counters the implication of the Aryan theory that Manipur has always been part and partial of the Indian civilization. Now the question comes, what are the sources of this uh, history, national history of Manipur? This, uh, the sources of this uh, national history of Manipur are the Puyas. Puyas are the indigenous uh, literature written in Maitai script. So national historians like uh, Joy Kumar Naurem rejects, that, uh, rejects the Aryan theory saying that this so-called theory is not reflected in any literary source. By literary source, he means the Puyas. So he also further claims that Aryan theory might have been developed only in the 18th century. So now let's come to uh, what are these Puyas. So I have, uh, this is a facsimile of a Puya uh, and Puyas are, uh, uh, written uh, in Maitai script, Maitai script, uh, and they are either written on the bark of a tree or dried leaves or a paper. So uh, we now know uh, we now know that the existence of a large number of puyas, these manuscripts, and uh, they are now being published and sold also in the market. So uh, these are uh, so that some of the examples of the puya are Loyumba Singen. So this is an this is one of the early puyas. So in this, uh, it, lays, uh, uh, it talks about the duties of various Maitai families or Sagais. Uh, so Nautinkong Pamban Kava is, the, is about the coronation of the King Nautinkong. Sang Panava Masil, or it talks about the offices in the feudal system in the late uh, 18th century. And there are other Puyas like court chronicles also. And these chronicles, especially the Chaitharal Kumpapa, the court chronicle is very important because every event that is entered over there are assigned dates. So it, this Puya is used to date all the historical events and also it, uh, other puyas are dated according to this 
code chronicle. So these are very uh, important puyas which help reconstruction of the history uh, uh, for the national history. So earlier Pandit Loishan, an institution in the Maitai feudal system, wrote and used to preserve these puyas. But with, uh, with British abolishing the feudal system in 1892, uh, the British and in introduction of the Western education system, Bengali script and Bengali language was introduced in this uh, schools. So indigenous literature in Maitai script uh, was marginalized and Puyas were also marginalized. So uh, the Puyas which, uh, the kind of Puyas which seriously damages the narrative of the Aryan theory falls under the category of Larai Lathub. Okay. So Larai Lathub are oral and written texts consisting of narratives which are inconvenient to rulers as the narratives in the Larai Lathub goes against what was promoted by the kings and or the ruling class. Hence Larai Lathub, uh, Puyas were earlier um, secretly and privately circulated. So, uh, uh, so the two most popular Larai Lathub Puyas are Sembi Mukaklai and, and Mitamba. So Sembi Mukaklai is also known as Pamhaiba Larai Lathub. Uh, Lare, uh, so Pamhiba is a king who's, who ruled in Manipur in the first half of the 18th century. And this Larai Lathub is about this king. So Mitambal is known as Bhagya Chandra Larai Lathub. So it is about the king Bhag Bhagya Chandra who ruled Manipur in late uh, 18th century. So these Puyas, both of these Puyas are attributed to an 18th century writer called Angom Chauva or Angom Gopi. But we need more historical and literary criticism to you know, establish this claim firmly. So, uh, so now there are two common themes in uh, these two Larai Lathub. Uh, so one theme is that uh, this Larai Lathub questions the petri lineage of the Maitai kings to these two kings, Pamhaiba and Bhagya Chandra, so these both these 18th century kings. So these two texts present a narrative that these two, two kings are children of the migrant Brahmins from the mainland India. So, and the second narrative, a second theme uh, in these two texts is that uh, they talk about the measures the uh, taken to force the Maitais into Hinduism in the 18th century. So the first theme sort of justifies the second theme in that according to these Puyas, these two kings were susceptible to the influence of the migrant Indian Brahmins uh, and Hinduized the Maitais at their behest because they were themselves uh, children of the mainland Indian Brahmins. So, uh, so this is the, these are the two uh, themes in uh, Larai Lato. So when it comes to the forced Hinduization, uh, uh, of the Maitais, we can discuss a passage from Sembi uh, Mukakle. It talks about how Hinduization took place in the first half of the 18th century. So uh, it writes, Pamhaiba, who has always been obedient to the Mayans, sent out horse riders to spread uh, the news that everyone must accept Hindu Ramandi religion. Using repressive measures, incarceration and punishment, he made the people accept the new religion. So Ramandi is a sect of Hindu religion. The word Mayan refers to people who come from the West and who follow Hindu religion. The term is still in use. And nowadays the word Mayan refers to the mainland Indians, despite of their religion. It is an umbrella term used by the Maitais uh, to refer to the mainland Indians now. So Sembi Mukaklai shows that in the first half of the 18th century, during the reign of Pamhaiba, Mayan religion was forced into the Maitai community. So there is uh, another episode in, this, in Sembi Mukaklai, uh, where Pamhaiba at the behest of his Mayan guru, uh, uh, Santidas, burns all the, uh, burns all the Puyas, uh, and, uh, and uh, Sembi Mukaklai writes that Puyas dealing with the origin of the Maitais flew away, and, mo and more, but most important Puyas did not burn. So, uh, uh, so this is the story in Sembi Mukaklai. And uh, the, uh, uh, the other Larai Lathuk Mitambal talks about how Bhagya Chandra brought in various cultural changes. He introduced uh, changes in the funeral rites and forced the Maitais to put Tilak. Tilak is a Hindu cultural symbol that you put on, the, on your forehead in the second half of the 18th century. And the text also mentions that Bhagya Chandra forced all the Umanglai, the Sylvian deities uh, in, the Mayan, uh, in the Mayan narratives of the Mahabharata. So the text, uh, the text Mitambal calls the narrative in the Aryan theory a Mayang narrative. And Mitambal clearly uh, 
uh, writes that the king of Ma uh, Maitai king accepts the narr uh, narrative uh, in the Aryan theory in the late uh, 18th uh, century. So later the text claims that peop uh, people of Manipur rose up against uh, Bhagya Chandra because they were fed up uh, uh, with the forced Hinduization and chased Bhagya Chandra away from Manipur. So the first theme in the Lari Lathup, the patrilineage of the Maitai kings, have been avoided by most historians. But the second theme, forced Hinduization, is mentioned in all the contemporary national history writing of Manipur. Though in some histories, the second uh, theme figures, but none of them, uh, none of them uh, uh, deals with these two Lari Lathup in detail. So the, my, one of the tasks of my paper is an attempt, is the attempt to highlight these two um, uh, these two uh, texts. To conclude, I have elaborated on Aryan theory of the origin of the Maitais and have traced how this so-called theories is used as justification for the merger of Manipur with India and how a current uh, a counter narrative to the merger emerged with national history writing. And for the national history writing, they are using the sources, uh, uh, the Puyas as sources. So thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. So I would like to move on to our second presenter. His name is uh, Felix Diaz. He's an associate professor of psychology at the, excuse me, um, at the American University in Bulgaria. He is interested in the narrative analysis of biographic accounts with a focus in vital change and existential meaning. He has published books on the assessment of pragmatic competence, body image as an everyday problematic, and qualitative research methods applied to communication disability. So now, Felix, feel free to introduce your topic and start your presentation. Thank you very much, Vivian. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah? Yes. Perfect. OK, so what I would like to do in this presentation is three things. I want to uh, review different narratives of forced displacement in the Balkans, particularly. Uh, and I, this will correspond to three different ways of accounting for the displaced experience, um, which have been happening through the last five years or so. Okay. A second thing I want to do is uh, describe and uh, discuss uh, my recent work through the last um, about three years, uh, analyzing first person narratives of forced displacement. And finally, I will argue for the need to develop a, an analysis of third person narratives. Uh, in other words, narratives which are discussing refugee and asylum seeking experience in the Balkans from a distanced position, okay? Um, okay, so I will first start talking about how um, there was a development of narratives which were starting at the beginning talking about hope, Let, later they would be talking about uh, stagnation, and eventually they would be talking about a disastrous hell. Um, the story begins with a refugee crisis which starts in 2015 in Europe, okay, when the numbers of asylum applicants are arriving by land increased very much. They were coming through Turkey, into Greece, and hopefully moving into Central Europe. The initial emerging response to this crisis in Europe consisted of opening fast corridors from Turkey to Central Europe. And through the year 2015, thousands of people would manage to find refuge and start asylum applications in mostly in Germany and Austria, in many different countries in, in the European Union. Later, published stories of forced displacement and asylum seeking have been gradually shifting in content and orientation. Okay, so in 2015, there were hope stories, which uh, importantly had to do a lot with the support given to refugees in Greece, particularly. Okay, so there were hundreds of thousands of 
uh, concerned European citizens, many volunteers moving on to Greece to support from more or less polit politicized positions, generally inspired by basic moral values and committed to human rights, contributing with money, with uh, political lobbying back at home in Central Europe as well. Okay. Um, responses of solidarity were inserted in a narrative which was very close to European collective memory for a long time, which has solidified in the Geneva Convention, Convention to the Status of Refugees in 1951. The idea is the general plot is set by war and repression, forcing people to leave their countries. Then during and after war and repression, other countries provide options for refuge to the forcibly displaced. Host countries accommodate guest refugees, stories of successful refuge, map on narratives of hope, where solidarity comes down to dignify the identities of both host and guest, right? So the refugee crisis is star starts featuring human dramas, which exemplify the generosity of host societies. But soon the borders closed, around 2016, the borders closed, and then large numbers of asylum seekers are trapped in the Balkan route towards Central Europe. Many are in refugee camps or funded accommodation in Greece. Also many are in refugee camps across the Balkans in informal precarious housing, surviving homeless and nomadic, avoiding contact with increasingly aggressive police corps until today. A key moment in this process is the Dublin Agreement in March 2016, which involved closing down borders to asylum applicants, except for certain prearranged quotas, okay, and definitely uh, betraying the 1951 Geneva Con Convention, okay? Basically externalizing refugee control and externalizing European borders away to Libya, Turkey, including Greece, and eventually also the Eastern Balkans, okay? So discursively, the Dublin Agreement will incorporate and reinforce uh, a series of assumptions, like assuming that the refugee problem is a problem of refugees coming to Europe rather than a problem with, of human rights, uh, confounding the problem with the solution, uh, assuming that the European states do not want refugees, and uh, assuming a situation of competition, either competition or collaboration, collaboration among European countries to avoid hosting refugees or as few refugees as possible, okay? Um, now, this uh, posits lim the limbo situation posits refugees in a situation of, of stagnation. And uh, for the uh, further situation, which is the third phase in this process for a very short period in the last five years, is uh, the period of hell, which basically involve hopeless attempts to move into Central Europe for asylum seekers in Greece or in the Balkans, okay? So, and, and this is increasingly clear in the last few months, for the last six months or so, okay? So refugees are left with uh, one of two alternatives, either detention leading to deportation or irregular access through smuggling, okay? Both alternatives are no alternatives and are hopeless alternatives. Um, so we have a general process which moves from hope to limbo to hell as existential conditions for asylum seekers, okay? And in hell, particularly, the notion of the jungle as a, as a clandestine space where people are waiting to try to move into the next, across the next border, and the notion of the game as a game where you're risking your life for a basically hopeless attempt to move over the next border, but you are systematically pushed back, uh, become crucial, okay? Composing a narrative of hell, hellish existence. Um, I'm going to try to move, yeah, okay. Um, 
there's a, a, a crucial component of, of, of hell, of the hell narrative, is the notion of pushbacks, which is the current policy with respect to most refugees which, who, who attempt to irregularly cross borders towards Central Europe, which involves the informal expuls expulsion of people from one country to another, different from deportation, which would be conducted in a legal, uh, in a legal framework, pushback, pushbacks become a fundamental component of European policy with respect to refugees in the Mediterranean, in the Eastern Balkans recently, okay? I am leaving here some, some reference to the to entities which have been documenting, documenting the process of pushbacks with great detail. Okay. Um, I'm going to go through, go past some details of examples of narratives of, of pushbacks. This is a general representation of, of the Balkan route, which is uh, uh, basically, we can see in blue the uh, official route, which is followed by, originally by refugees. Uh, we can see in black the borders which were closed in 2000, 2016. And, um, uh, in red or yellow or green, alternative routes which are found by, by refugees occasionally, okay? Now, my, the, my second purpose here is to introduce some uh, research which I will call first-person stories, okay, which I developed through the last three years or so, uh, where the main point was to the main aim was to develop the option for asylum seekers to elaborate narratives as a way of facilitating the process of uh, coming in and getting hosted, okay? Which is something which, is, which, which has become a common practice in uh, most processes of, of forced displacement. Okay, so very, very, very briefly, I was, I, I, I mean, this, this is a story of a failure to try to develop narrative workshops with refugees uh, in 2006, in 2017, where basically my systematic attempts to engage with refugees into developing nar narrative workshops were failing. And this was leading me to, to a series of reflections on the position of Europeans to be able to, to uh, support refugees telling their own stories, okay? And eventually it has been, it has become possible to uh, analyze, uh, to collect and analyze narratives of forced displacement uh, individually uh, with a much more carefully curated approach and I have been through the last year, and I will continue through the through the current year in the spring term, uh, applying this narrative analysis to uh, to courses. Last year it was the course on a course, a globally connected course in AUBG, my organization on narrative identity and transformation, um, on the process of narrative change, the support of narrative for personal change, okay? And uh, next spring, it will be uh, together with the um, Open Society University Network Micro Colleges, which are uh, delivering teaching to refugee communities, a course on displacement, trauma, and survival, which is based on the, li on the analyzed lives of, um, of refugees, okay? Um, Okay, so um, I think I'm right in time to to complete. I have like five more minutes for a brief comment on the need. I mean, this is like a very quick summary of research on first-person stories. Um, what what I have been finding out through through this through this process is uh, basically. Uh, the researching on first-person stories is useful to the person whose narrative is, is delivered, but we have a pending serious 
challenge in the host communities to receive them and to understand them. And this is mostly because there are um, overarching discourses, which are basically third person stories, which have been uh, importantly developed in, in Europe. They are common currency. And so in the last few months, I am developing the interest and the necessity, I believe, of analyzing third person stories, mostly the stories which are current and which are justifying European policies with respect to refugee lives and asylum seekers in the board, on the borders of Europe. And here, I would just like, I mean, th th this is just a, a list which sets a general agenda for an analysis of the narratives which are developed uh, in mainstream uh, discourse in the media concerning refugees, which are quite different from first-person stories, and where I just have a series of intuitions and first notions for a more detailed analysis, which I hope to be developing in the following months, okay? And here I would list. First of all, silencing, silencing strategies, which replace refugee experience with either a concern with the nationality or ethnic origin of asylum seekers, or a concern with whether they will properly inter integrate when we're talking about people who are basically detained in concentration camps. Okay, so the possibilities of, inter of integration are are, are irrelevant, or are concerned with the sincerity of their own stories, okay? Uh, secondly, um, an orientalist discourse, which builds refugee experiences, uh, putting the stress on the difference between East and West, between uh, the, the West and the Orient, reinforcing notions of difference in identity, a um, uh, notion of progressiveness, which holds the European dream as a utopian aspiration or a desired horizon for asylum seekers, a paternalistic attitude, which assumes a cultural hierarchy of value between the host society and the asylum seekers, where the asylum seeker is produced as somebody who is inexperienced, underdeveloped, needing enlightenment, and finally, some sort of programmatic suspicion, which devaluates first person accounts by systematically treating them as self-interested, biased, or dishonest, okay? As I'm saying, this list is rather than the, the results of an, of an analysis and agenda for the future analysis uh, I env envisage. And uh, of course, it is, it is an agenda which is based on general observations through my last five years, okay? So I think it's about time I should be finishing. I would just like to end up by offering the public a series of uh, reference organizations which compose the basis of, of my documentation on refugees in the um, in the western in the sorry in the yeah western and eastern Balkans in the Balkan route, and I should leave it here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank. You. Thank you very much, Felix. So once again, I'd like to remind our audience that if you have any questions for the presenters, do not hesitate to ask them through Zoom or, in, or on uh, slido.com. And I'd like to move on to our third presenter. Um, I'd like to introduce you, Aubriel Harrington, who is a um, who is currently pursuing her PhD in philosophy at Arizona State University in the United States. Her main areas are, of focus are social philosophy, critical theory, and intersectional analysis. Her dissertation project centers on attempting to understand and bring attention to some features of the social position, identity, and intersectional challenges faced by a, a subset of the Latinx migrant community in the United States Southwest. So, Abrio, now you may start your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you so much to the other presenters for your interesting presentations. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I am from Arizona, which is a border state in the United States Southwest. 
My native county has a large population of undocumented immigrants from Mexico and their children. There's a lot of tension surrounding the Mexican United States border, including resistance to border policing tactics, the criminalization of undocumented migrants, and concerns about human rights violations that occur for those who are detained after making it across the border, those who are trying to cross the border in an undocumented way, and those who live in the United States as undocumented migrants. As a PhD student in philosophy at Arizona State University, I am attempting to bring attention to some of the challenges faced by certain members of the undocumented migrants in the Southwest using theoretical insights from philosophy, testimonial and academic work from Latinx academics and my own experiences. I would like to begin by telling you a story from my own history. I attended a small high school with an average class size of 15. One day, two students in my freshman class, Manuel and Jose, were not in class. Because of the size of our class, their absence was noticeable. When I asked my teacher where they were, he became uncomfortable and wouldn't answer. I continued to press until an administrator told me that there had been an Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, raid the night before, and both Manuel and Jose's parents were illegal and must have been detained for deportation. I never found out what happened to them. Until that time, I would have told you that I knew my community pretty well. But at that moment, I became aware that there was an entire invisible subculture I had been blind to. In this presentation, I want to introduce you to the group I'm trying to address by attempting to capture a few features of and bring conceptual clarity to some of the lived experiences and more ambitiously narratives of this group, which is a subset of the undocumented and first generation Latinx community. Then I will try to give a conceptual framework through which to understand and address the experience of oppression or subjugation that this group experiences in the form of being made invisible or being silenced. What are the characteristics of this group? The most important socially salient features are an ethnic and racial identity associated with recent Mexican heritage and a tenuous status. Their political and social identity is not secured or fixed, but in some ways unsettled. This group's unsettled and insecure position is a crucial feature in thinking about their narratives and lived experiences. Philosopher Thomas Nail addresses this position writing, the holes and crossable points in the wall support the regular passage of migrants, but by passing through, migrants undergo a sovereign incorporeal transformation. The misdemeanor of unlawful entry criminalizes them. They become alien and invasive, end quote. This criminalization places the migrant subject in a particularly tenuous situation as they exist in conflict with the government and the society in which they find themselves. One way to conceptualize the impact of this criminalization is a persistent state of being at the border. Suppose we see a border as a space between one social world and another where the successful crossing of a border allows one to integrate successfully into a new social world. If someone crosses the border illegally, then there is an, in a sense, a way which they never cross into the new society, but are trapped in a permanent state of at the border, even when they are in the new society. Crossing as an undocumented subject forbids integration and often necessitates an insecure and socially vulnerable position. These individuals never really progress past the border, but are stuck in a perpetual state of at the border otherness. One reaction to problematizing the position of these undocumented Latinx migrants is to appeal to their choice to come here illegally. There is a sort of unspoken second part to this reaction, that if they didn't want to live this way, then they should not have come here illegally. This notion of choice is one justification for turning away from the problematic social features reflected by some of this group's lived experiences. Theorist Amy Reed Sandoval rejects this appeal to choice. She writes, it is no secret that many poor undocumented migrants leave their countries of origin to escape poverty and threats of violence. In such cases, it is difficult to attribute a, robu a robust choice to migrate to those who will undoubtedly suffer if they remain." End quote. These migrants are placed in a situation where the choice of entering into a permanent state of criminalized otherness and the dual threats of detention and deportation are preferable to the circumstances they come from. At this point, I hope to have provided a cursory insight into some of the so socially salient features of the group I am attempting to address and their criminalization, isolation, and vulnerability. 
While it is not true for all individuals who fit this description, the group I am most concerned with are usually impoverished, which adds to their tenuous social position. I would like to now move into discussing the more specific harms that these Latinx migrants and their families experience when they are, be, when they are made invisible and when their narratives are silenced. There are a few ways that these phenomena can be felt just in my opening story. There's the literal disappearance and sun silence of Manuel and Jose, and the unwillingness to speak about it from the educators in my school. This unwillingness to speak seems to manifest an impulse to turn away. It is a reaction to the suppressed invisible narratives being made salient and a desire to push them back into obscurity. There's also the state before this experience where I understood my community so that Jose and Manuel's entire social group was invisible. My experience of Jose and Manuel's disappearance is just a microcosm of the myriad of ways that the lived experiences and narratives of these Latinx migrants in my community are silenced, but it serves as a token. One way to understand the harm that is occurring when this group's lived experiences are pushed away or their narratives silenced is that they are contradictory to the dominant narratives and therefore are suppressed to allow the maintenance of dominant constructed worlds of sense. What do I mean by contradictory? Max Horkheimer expresses the idea that reason forces society upon people, but at the same time, the conditions of society are alienating, senseless, and contradictory. As a result, humanity is faced with the constant contradictions of being rational and seeking to live rationally, but being forced to exist in irrational systems that contain contradictions. We are faced with the experience of the dissonance of needing our systems and narratives to make sense, but living in a reality where they often do not and where they contain intolerable contradictions. Dominant social truths and narratives often mask these contradictions by suppressing and silencing narratives or lived experiences that contradict them. In the case of the Latinx migrants and their families, their experiences of criminalization, vulnerability, isolation, and oppression are contradictory to the dominant narratives about what it's like to live in the United States. We can also attempt to make sense of the harm that is done to this group when their lived experiences and narratives are made invisible or silenced through the Foucaultian lens of power knowledge frameworks. Philosopher Jose Medina describes this approach writing, different fields or domains of discursive interaction contain particular discursive regimes with their particular ways of producing knowledge. In the battle among power knowledge frameworks, some come on top and become dominant while others are displaced and become subjugated, end quote. The silencing and being made invisible that these Latinx migrants and their families experience can be understood as subjugated knowledge, which is defined as, quote, forms of experience and remembering that are pushed to the margins and rendered unqualified and unworthy of epistemic respect by prevailing and hegemonic discourses. This subjugated knowledge consists of lived experiences that do not fit dominant narratives, which contradict them or show them to be predicated on the subjugation and exclusion of some. The, subjugated the subjugation of these knowledges that do not fit can also be understood as a type of statement about the status of members of this group as knowers and knowledge producers. For example, philosopher Christy Dotson writes, one method of executing epistemic violence is to damage a given group's ability to speak and be heard, end quote. Dotson highlights the fact that communication is reciprocal and that an audience is needed who is able and desires to uptake what we are attempting to communicate. In certain cases of epistemic violence, quote, an audience fails to identify a speaker as a knower, end quote. The social position of this group seems to relegate them to silence. They are not perceived as an epistemic kind that could be producers or communicators of knowledge that members of the prevailing narrative would be willing or able to listen to. This phenomena can also be informed by features of Miranda Fricker's account of epistemic injustice, particularly her framework of identity power and testimonial injustice. Fricker describes identity power writing. There can be operations of power which are dependent upon agents having shared conceptions of social identity. Whenever there is an operation of power that depends in some significant degree upon such shared imaginative conceptions of social identity, then identity power is at work, end quote. 
Identity power can function to police or shape actions despite personal beliefs through the exercise of identity power over someone pulling on some imaginative, socially coordinated conception of identity. Identity power for Fricker is crucial in testimonial injustice where a speaker is afforded less credibility than they deserve. When the status of these Latinx migrants and their families as knowers and knowledge producers is attacked in Fricker or Dotson's different ways, people become positioned as living a silent narrative. Theorist Maria Lagones seems to be pointing to something similar or at least adjacent with her muting. She writes, bilingualism and biculturalism or multiculturalism are very hard to express because they, as well as the racialization of everyone in a learning space are muted. Our ethnicities and races are muted. Since these mutings are not heard, they are not heard as related, end quote. According to Lagonas, there is a sort of whitewashing of differences in these contexts that stifles certain lived experiences or identities, and in some sense, silence a whole world of lived narratives and knowledge by muting them out of the picture that is represented. This seems similar to the other ideas of epistemic violence, but slightly different, as it seems to pick up on another feature of the story I opened with. So far, I have treated the oppression or harm to members of the Latinx migrants and their families as a sort of being made invisible or being silenced. This seems correct, but it is not the case that they are always made physically invisible. In the story, I stated that there was an entire culture invisible to me within my community, but clearly I didn't mean that the members of that culture were completely physical, physically invisible since I noticed Jose and Manuel's absence. To understand my experience of seeing members of this invisible culture, it is more helpful to think in terms of Lugones' muting. What was occurring was not that these people's physical bodies were made invisible, but, but, that, but that this culture's biculturalism in my community was completely muted. I did not see Jose and Manuel as having this different and important narrative or set of lived experiences but instead saw them as sterilized members subsumed under a dominant social narrative. And with this realization, I think I begin to understand the challenge or plea of Lagones when she writes, Resucita conmigo y llamame por mi misma. Come back to life with me and call me for myself or do not call me at all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to also thank our three participants who presented their very interesting topics today in the fifth panel. And now we are moving on to our discussion. Uh, so if you're here through Zoom, feel free to raise your hand and ask directly or in the comment section. And if you're uh, following the conference through YouTube, ask through Slido. So. Our first question would be for Michael. So the question goes, how has Modi's turn to Hindu nationalism impact the Mai Tai narratives and resistance in the Northeast uh, differently than, for example, more Christian Naga community? Recently, uh, in this, uh, in the narrative, narrative is being published again. For example, a history textbook called A Short History of Manipur, uh, which has this narrative, has been published again. And then uh, the family of the author uh, has uh, come out in the media and said that, you know, they don't have anything to do with this narrative. So this kind of narrative, they are pushing it again, all over again. Uh, recently, and there have been uh, other instances where uh, I have mentioned Bhagya Chandra, the King Bhagya Chandra. So there have been books now written about him more and more, this kind of symbols, the kings and all, they, have been, they are trying to bring this, uh, uh, these things up again. So that is one of the things that we see now recently with the coming of uh, uh, BJP uh, in the center and as well as in Manipur. Okay, so our If I can just question. add, because that was my yeah, question. Yeah, of course, of course. 
Um, uh, yeah, I was also wondering if if the impact of, of Modi's turn to Hindu nationalism creates uh, maybe further conflict within the Northeast, like between Meite and Nagas, or how is it impacting the, the Northeast as a region? So uh, the contradiction between uh, the different communities, uh, which was already earlier there because of the intervention of the Indian state from much before. Now uh, the contradiction has taken into a different turn uh, in that uh, different, uh, there they are like, they have been pitting everyone against each other here, different communities, but uh, with the coming of um, uh, this government, there have been cultural, significant amount of cultural changes and they have brought various divisive um, uh, measures also in um, uh, to so that there has there is more conflict among the indigenous people of the northeast uh, so that uh, they fight among each other and uh, like and then they can continue this project of hinduization further hinduization especially when it comes to uh, uh, um, uh, the naga and the cookies uh, so uh, in that also they have uh, tried to uh, settle the various conflicts with them separately without taking everybody in for example three communities are living in manipur but uh, the government would only talk to one particular group and then try to settle issue with them and then this leaves two other groups and then there will be more uh, you know problems and this continues this continues and goes on and on so this has happened uh, like re very recently also, the government is trying to settle uh, the um, uh, Naga conflict uh, with, uh, with the Indian state. So they are talking with the Nagas, but in that uh, other communities are also saying that, you know, we should, it is our problem. We should, these different communities should come and solve these problems. And, you know, this is none of your business, but they will try to make it their business. So that's what is happening right now. Professor Kusa, would you like to add anything or can we move on? Okay. So our second question is for Felix. Uh, Felix, would you say that the Dublin Agreement is somewhat strengthening the racist and nationalist ideology? Um, okay. The, I believe that the Dublin Agreement was definitely marked a uh, shift in uh, the European Union's explicit policy concern concerning the, the refugee and asylum rights situations. It, it involves definitely an explicit rejection of the Geneva Convention uh, because it is, it is clearly against international law in that sense. Okay, I, I, am, I am not an expert in law, but uh, this is quite, quite obvious. And in terms of, uh, of historical aspects and political aspects, it marks a kind of um, moment after which uh, Europe, the European Union will have to respond for serious violations of human rights, which even if they are not performed because, because the, the, the whole program is to, to move the, the problematic of, of refugee income to beyond the European borders, okay? So, so the problem is moved away to the uh, external borders of Europe, to Turkey, Libya, um, even Greece or the Balkans, which are European, but, but kind of second level, okay? So, so Europe will be historically accountable for 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 this for this shift i don't know if this answers the question yeah i think so thank you for your answer and also thank you for your question um so the third question is for Aubrio, and uh people would be interested in if you could elaborate on the concept of power identity i think you mentioned it in your presentation Yeah, so that's actually a notion um, that I pull from uh, Miranda Fricker's account of epistemic injustice. Um, and if people are interested in this topic and this idea of harm that can be done to groups by being um, being not recognized adequately as knowers or knowledge producers, then I would definitely recommend reading uh, Miranda Fricker's book. It's really quite good. Um, 
But this notion of identity power for Fricker is this idea that um, as a society, we kind of help to construct identities, right? And so um, there are cases in which your identity, for example, in the United States um, being female, right? There are certain ways in which the society has constructed that identity that is completely separate from how I see myself as a female. Um, and so the idea is that, or as a woman, so the idea is that um, this identity power can be kind of exercised upon people to shape their identity, their actions, X, Y, and Z, by pulling on kind of a shared social um, construction about the identity that they have. And so that's kind of in a very short way, um, Miranda Fricker's idea of identity power, but I definitely recommend the book. It is excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank for thank you for your questions. Uh, if anybody has any more questions here on Zoom, just raise your hand. But uh, yeah, yeah, James, go on. Thanks. Uh, thanks for being. Um, uh, Aubriel, this is a question for you, and it's it's a bit more of a theoretical question. I really appreciate it you bringing in Horkheimer and Magonis um, into this discussion because uh, they, especially Horkheimer, doesn't seem to always be part of this conversation. Um, and one thing that struck me as you were talking, because I also don't know him as well as I should, um, is that the, the contradiction for a member of a, of a social order or political community or whatever you want to call it is between Correct me if I'm wrong, but is there's a contradiction between the rational per, the person's rational choice and the irrationality of the system. And then you said that, or at least what I heard was that what makes these systems irrational is their uh, contradict internally contradictory nature, which works perfectly well with a little bit about Adorno and Horkheimer that I know. So I'm wondering. Uh, to some extent, uh, how you see the contradiction between reason and unreason as unreason being contradictory, as in uh, to what extent on an Ador uh, sorry, Horkheimerian, Horkheimerian reading, uh, almost as like a, a uh, underside to a Hobbesian state of nature thesis um, that the uh, socio-political systems are not just necessarily contradictory, but the contradict the contradictoriness of them necessarily produces the epistemic violence that you were talking about uh, in terms of Fricker and, and others in the sense that the only way they can function is to silence or in a more Butler, Judith Butler discourse, derealize to make them not just silence, but to make them never have existed. And then, and then, sorry, sorry, I'm still I'm thinking as I'm talking a little bit. Um, uh, and in that sense, from, uh, in the sense of the kind of things that a Gombin will talk about in terms of systems producing those against whom they will commit violence as the necessary other for their constitutional necessity or something along those lines. Sorry. Yeah, no, um, that's great. I, <laughs> I'm going to admit that, that that's a pretty involved question and I probably don't have a, as much background as I should to, to really give a very um, complete answer from like a Horkheimer perspective. But here's, here's my initial thought. Um, I think that it is absolutely true that in, in in all social systems that I've studied or in all social systems that I think have exist, existed and it may be a necessary condition of social systems. I think um, Horkheimer still holds on to this notion. He doesn't really believe that it's possible, but he does hold on to this notion of like all things should push towards human liberation. So I don't know if it may be possible that there could be a social system in which this is not the case. I don't, I don't wanna comment on that, but I think for the most part, in every social system, it is predicated on this like unreason, as you said. Um, it's that we we the the social structures that we exist within seem to be predicated on these kind of tension between reason and unreason. 
So we want as rational creatures to live reasonably, but then also we are forced to exist in these societies in which they are unreasonable. Um, and, and the way that we do that is that we, as kind of a social structure and as humans, we um, subjugate the things that don't fit. So, so this is really easily analogous with human, like an individual case where you suppress a memory that doesn't fit with what you kind of believe about yourself. Um, and so I think that in society, we necessarily have these things that we have to kind of subjugate in order to make sense. So here in the United States, um, what these migrants go through is completely unreasonable. I mean, it is Un, it is unimaginable what these people are forced to live with. And it completely contradicts everything that standard citizens of the United States believe about what it is to be in, in, in America and to live in America. It is, it is unreason. And so we don't talk about it. It is not like there is, a, a, there is more of a rise of awareness, which I'm really trying to be involved in because I think that it's a really important movement for carving out these spaces. But typically... Um, as you can see, for the fact that I didn't even know that this culture existed in my own community, we don't see them. We suppress them as unreasonable. And I think it is absolutely kind of a necessary condition that we produce these dominant narratives, which subjugate and kind of create these others, which are pushed out of the narratives in order to maintain the social structures that we have. So I don't know if that answers your question. It was a really involved question, but that's kind of my initial response. Thank you. No, that was great. Thanks. So uh, we're coming to the end of our fifth panel. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I hope you enjoyed this panel. And now we will have a short break. And after that, we will proceed with the sixth panel dedicated to philosophy of history. And I'd like to thank, thank any, everyone who joined. And I'd like to thank uh, Doug Marcusa for the opportunity to be a part of this conference. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and the rest of the conference.
Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the sixth panel of this year's Liberals Herald, which is dedicated to philosophy of history. We are happy to host three excellent contributors presenting on this panel, so do not hesitate to ask any questions related to their topics. You can do so either di directly on Zoom or using the link slido.com, where you can enter our platform by simply putting a hashtag Herald. All of the questions will then be proposed during the dedicated Q&A time. Once all of the contributors have finished their presentations, for which they have a total of 15 minutes each. Without any further ado, let us start with our first presenter. Dr. Giovanni Patriarca, he studied political sciences at the University of Camerino in Italy and philosophy and the Pontifical Lateran University Vatican City State. He earned a diploma in Islamic studies at the Pontifical Institute for Arabic and Islamic Studies and a PhD in history of economic thought at the Pontifical Universi University at Regina Apostolorum in Rome. He was a DAAD stipendiat at the Humboldt University in Berlin and a fellow uh, at the Mises University in, uh, Institute in Auburn, Alabama, United States of America. Currently, Dr. Patriarca teaches at the Universitat Francisco Marroquin in Guatemala City. So, Dr. Patriarca, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your words. And I shared the screen for my PowerPoint just to have a general idea. Uh, Do you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about Ibn Khaldun, which is very famous in these days due to the consequences of the Arab Springs. Uh, what's happened during the uh, in at the end of the, at, the, at the end of 2010 to uh, 2011, uh, the Arab Springs and the ongoing process of rearrangement in the Middle East have diverted public attention toward Islamic philosophy and Islamic political thought. Although, according to many political experts, the main fuse of the Arab Spring is primarily a consequence of drastic social problems, there is a clear attempt to justify this desire for change on the basis of a common Arab philosophical tradition and spirit. The importance of having an intellectual link that is comprehensible to the confused people in, this, in times marked by disorders and uprisings seems to be a light motive of many Middle Eastern philosophers, journalists, and commentators. Such a process has contributed to reshaping the philosophical attitudes, shifting the focus of political reflection towards the rediscovery of an Arab Islamic way. Within the differences of the various regional experiences, there is a common and undeniable presence of a theological narrative with its origins in their medieval political reflection. On the one hand, this back-to-basis approach has possibly strengthened the ties with the Sharia, while, on the other hand, it has permitted specific changes in the interpretation of the sources and classic authors in the light of the contemporary events, as well as a renewed political theology. The rediscovery of Ibn Khaldun, especially during the 19th century, is covered by a veil of mystery, especially in Western countries, since so little of the value of his research and monograph had known up uh, until recently. Western historians have mistakenly portrayed Ibn Khaldun's method, which is deeply analytical and rigorous, to be a forerunner of the positive theories of history and an antiliteram of historical materialism. Recent research, however, has revealed new aspects to his thought previously unexplored. His critique of the omnipotence of the state, his denunciation of high taxes, and the exaltation of freedom show him to be a precursor to modern political science and classical liberalism. His investigative principle starts from the assumption of the conformity to reality, al as a term for analyzing any historical event. From this perspective, his effort to understand the reason for evolution in history through a study of cause and effects as they 
as they relate to social laws. For a scientifically verified interpretation, it is necessary that the science be independent from political power and influence. Moreover, the investigation primary subject must be that of civilization. At the beginning of the historical investigation, he examines the extent of environmental influences on human nature, as he describes the first nomadic civilizations in socio-anthropological socio terms. The concept of umran, concept of environment, generally speaking, contain in itself a plurality of meaning from inhabited geographical place to society in general. He then shifts his focus to the first forms of institutions and their evolutionary characteristics, later leading up to more developed and sophisticated forms of social aggregation in a urban and sedentary context. In this way, he analyzes the modalities of commerce and the development of manufacturing activities and their interlinked contribution to the thriving of a society where philosophy, culture, and art bloom freely and without impediment. The complex methodology displays a concrete study of the dynamics of history, wherein societal and paradig paradigmatic Idel Tippen appear. He then fully analyzes structural dichotomies, such as town countryside, nomad sedentary society, and tribal solidarity, individual egoism. This holistic vision of history permits Ibn Khaldun to formulate an economic theory characterized by a cyclicity or a theory of cycle in which the state originally has a limited power and lower, lowers the taxation rate, allowing for a constant growth of creative production and consumption. After this phase, the state massively exercises its power and augments, augments the, its fiscal charge or ta and taxation. So we are in the second generation. In the third generation, the, cons the, the subsequent reduction of that initial creative freedom and, and, and spirit of entrepreneurship is closely followed by an evident diminution, di diminution of consumption and production. The final phase is a strong economic stagnation, ultimately causing the paralysis of the state, the entire paralysis of the state. In this theory of evolution and decline, in which all the symptoms and evils of a society are laid bare and are up for analysis, including the stages of birth, growth, and death, the concept of a sabia play a fundamental role. A sabia, which etymologically comes from asava, which means bones, generally speaking, it is, according to the various different definitions of Ibn Khaldun scholars, a sort of public spirit, social solidarity, group cohesion, common will, or, according to the German tradition, a strong Lebenskraft. This Volkstrebe and this strong Lebenskraft is connected to the destiny of the society because the Asabia is the engine of the history of the state. The agreements, but these agreements, this asaba, bind the individuals to a common code of values and respect to assure their survival. This pattern is human universalized such that it is possible to identif identify the development, the acmes, and the deterioration of each civilization's historical parabola. That form these bonds of solidarity and underlying social forces. The capacity of, to read oneself of any form of egotism and to contribute one's one services in the interest of society appears to be the sole and necessary condition for cooperation and public action. This common conviction is considered to be a spiritually bonding agent. 
uh, let's see what he say, and I quote Ibn Khaldun, a dynasty that begin its history supported by the religion doubles the force of Asabiya that helps it in its formation. Following a cycle, close of the quotation, end of the quotation, following a, a cyclical pattern, a civilization in, in its nascent years is characterized by a strong spiritual union among its members. After several years, the state or the political authority becomes the unique administrator of the religious sphere, while the religion assumes a merely social value. Over time, society begins to lose that centripetal and binding force of striving and thus a general apathy driven by a process of extreme delegation, I mean delegation to the state, replaces the spirit of sacrifice and other austere practices. In short, when Asabias decreases in societies, it indicates the decadence of that particular culture and eventually leads to its decline and even death. This generational passage marks the end of so social solidarity and the common good. The original notion of Asabia loses its strong binding power until it is eventually substitute, substituted by other emerging and different social movements. In the Mukaddima, Ibn Khaldun is convinced that an oppressive government brings about the ruin of public prosperity. The first symptom of this decline are, in fact, strictly connected to economic policies and fiscal regulation and taxes. Very often, without the individual's personal stimulus towards productivity and engagement, the society itself is condemned to implode in the apathy caused by a political system that is coercive and disparaging toward individual freedom. The modern reinterpretation of Ibn Khaldun's social philosophy, which is regularly rediscovered and emphasized in time of difficulty and degradation, is nowadays proposed on a global scale as a panacea for the hardships and vicissitudes of the Arab Islamic world. This approach, in sometimes a political politically biased way has been taken in part during the period of decolonization in Northern Africa and Arab territories in the extreme form of nationalism. Furthermore, the idealization of the social body of the Ummah becomes the metaphysical bulwark against any collective degeneration. A contemporary rereading of the Caldunian ideas brings together for the purpose of mere propaganda, different views and school of thought that over the centuries have opposed or even been a source of mutual resentment in the name of a revived Pax Theologica, particularly through an irrevocable, an irrevocable narrative. In this blurred mosaic, we are spectators of the perennial tension between the claims of a glorious return to an early golden age, the golden age of Islam, depicted with clearly metaphysic and meta-historical color, and the attempts of an interpretative modernization, very of very unpopular or even contrasted. The philosophy of Ibn, concluding, the philosophy of Ibn Khaldun is the fruit of a perfect synthesis in which sociology and psychology, political science and economy appear as a oxygen history, which assumes, history assumes in a complex unity, the shape of a modern scientific discipline, but not completely disconnected from an anthropological and religious substrate that justifies and changes it cyclically. Uh, I want to uh, conclude with a um, with, um, quote from Ibn Khaldun. Let's see, his empirical method goes far, be far beyond the cold description of the events, but also offers an interpretation of them as well, such that his writing could be correctly defined as historical science. 
the laws of cause and effect and the distinction between essential and accidental are used as the starting points for its historical definition. Ibn Khaldun admonishes that, it, and uh, I quote, it is necessary that the historian knows the fundamental principle of the art of government, the true character of events, the difference between the nations, the countries and the times in which they observe the costumes, the uses, the behavior, the opinions and the religious sentiments and all the circumstances that influence the society. I thank you very much for your patience and for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you kindly, Dr. Patriarca, for the insightful presentation. And let us move to uh, the second speaker, Dr. Alexander Leskanich, whose research uh, focuses upon the philosophy of history broadly construed. He is a copy editor for the Interdisciplinary Philosophy Journal, Eventual Aesthetics, and an early career member of the, uh, of the Royal Historical Society. He read history as an undergraduate at the University of Leicester, where he also received a master's degree in history before receiving an MSc in philosophy from the University of Edinburgh, an MSc in political theory from the London School of Economics and Political Science, and his PhD from Royal Holloway and Bedford New College, University of London earlier this year. He has begun to work on a book project under contract with Rutledge entitled The Anthropocene and the Sense of History, Reflections from Precarious Life. Uh, so the floor is yours, Dr. Petr. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for the uh, invitation. Uh, so, uh, historiography is a dominant technology for putting human affairs in order, for managing, however belatedly, human existence. It originally emerged, as Priya Satya observes, from a search for meaning that adopted the eschatological structure of religious belief. It was built to endow morally questionable events with purpose and meaning revealed in the narrative end of history. Uh, end quote. However, being diverse and haphazard and resistant to their full or final rationalization, human affairs do not easily lend themselves to historical management or comprehension. At best, historiography can in their aftermath lend to historical events the appearance of a determinate meaning by incorporating them into a larger historical process. Here, a continuous causal sequence links past and future, revealing the progressive unfolding of the universal subject, humanity, whose historical potential is finally realized. Depending on one's philosophical or ideological preference in human history, that is, in what human beings have done, for example, the self-development of the human mind and the human species as, as a whole, towards freedom, as in Hegel, towards the realization of a cosmopolitan plan of nature, as in Kant, or enabled by intractable historical forces towards socio-political emancipation, the liberation of the proletariat from the bonds of economic subservience, as in Marx. Such are examples of positive universal history in which, as Hannah Arendt puts it, the general bestows meaning and significance on the particular. From the 18th century onwards, as expanded in classical philosophies of history, history began to denote not merely the descriptive sequestration of past events into a chronicle or narrative, but a rational system or scheme detectable by human reason, detectable because of an underlying rationality reported to be inherent in history itself. That is, in what human beings do, whether or not they are aware of it. Under historicism, the teleological systematization of history gives the impression of incremental improvement, a gradual surmounting of delimited historical stages leading to an eventual end, whether it be freedom, rationality, enlightenment, or higher forms of civilization. And history can be observed, and from observation of its events extrapolated, the fraught and painful deliverance of the human species from moral impoverishment and material squalor, the technological evasion of disease and drudgery, the rejection of superstition, intolerance, and irrationality. One approaches by degrees a better, more reasonable world built on the intellectual and material labor of humankind, itself informed by knowledge of its own historical development, and able on that basis to alter its self-image and project itself into the future in accordance with more enlightened ideals. In principle, historiography's longstanding efficacy as a meaning-making technology is premised on an identitary move in which human mind and human world are schematically aligned in mutual harmony with each other, thus allowing, upon due investigation, the world human beings have created to reflect back at them their own nature, to confirm to themselves their special historical significance. This epistemological standpoint mimics the purported omniscience of the Judeo-Christian God in regard to his own creation. For Gian Battista Vico, the natural world, in contrast to the world of men, has clearly been created by God, and since only God can fully comprehend what he has made, only he can fully comprehend nature. 
But in accordance with the same principle, human beings having made their own history and having fabricated their own world, have the capacity to know themselves likewise. As Vico argues, the civil world is certainly the creation of humankind. And consequently, the principles of the civil world can and must be discovered within the modifications of the human mind." Uh, end quote. Through acquaintance with human history, our nature is revealed. Whatever human beings are can be seen in what they have done, in what they have been. In Jochen Gustav Droysen's later organicist conception of history as a flourishing plant, this identitary alignment is crucial. As he says, what their genus is to animals and plants, history is to human beings. Uh, here, human beings are bonded to their history, bound to the intricacies of its development, nodes in a larger network of historical meaning. José Ortega y Gasset, too, after affirming that, as he puts it, man, in a word, has no nature, what he has is history, ends up articulating the conclusion to which this line of thinking inevitably leads. That is, to comprehend anything human, be it personal or collective, one must tell its history. Indeed, after God, in order to understand himself, mankind had to make doing and knowing one and the same thing. Hence, the colonized planet becomes a vast experimentation facility or technosphere expressly devoted to the making of man, so that he can finally see, as Vika puts it, its nature reflected in the human mind, and conversely, the nature of the human mind reflected in the world of nations. For as he continues, there can be no more certain history than that which is recounted by its creator. Thus in this synchrony, mankind creates his own world of measurable quantities, wherein, as with God before him, knowledge and creation are the same thing. The latest popular example of this impulse to merge mind and world in a comprehensive and self-reflecting tautology, the geohistorical category of the Anthropocene, while signifying a constellation of processes through which humans have become a planet-altering force on a geological scale, is also another historicization consigning a previous historical epoch that is the approximately 11,700 years of the Holocene to the past. Historicization describes not merely the administra administrative historiographical habit of categorizing any given collection of objects, persons, or events into a historical reference class, such as to render them intelligible, but highlights the tendency of the accelerating world capitalism has created to constantly leave its history behind, to entirely supersede its previous historical formations, its former modes of historical existence. As a periodization in planetary history, then, the Anthropocene constitutes another categorical addition to the chronological structure already imposed upon temporal events. But as another historicization leaving an entire epoch of history behind, it calls into question the reliability and efficacy of historical comprehension itself. Unable to verify or vouchsafe the present ideology of historical progression remorselessly driven on by technological innovation, it can in fact be interpreted as a direct indictment of its failure, in leaving history further behind, in, in inaugurating an epoch unlike any other, the Anthropocene deflates the conventional value placed upon historical knowledge as that which is a, able to comprehend and manage what is happening, or to tell us, based on what previously occurred, where we might be going. In this schism, constitutive of historicity, between past occurrence and present consciousness, can be spied the makings of a crisis in the nature of historical comprehension itself. For Ortega Gasset, an historical crisis constitutes a predicament of history. Usefully, he distinguishes between two classes of historical change. First, when something changes in our world, and second, when the world changes. And what is special in particular about the type of world change we call an historical crisis, he goes on to say, is that, and I quote, an historical crisis is a world change which differs from the normal change as follows. The normal change is that the profile of the world which is valid for one generation is succeeded by another and slightly different profile. Yesterday's system of convictions gives way to today's, smoothly, without a break. This assumes that the skeleton framework of the world remains in force throughout that change or is only slightly modified. That is the normal. Well then, an historical crisis occurs when the world change which is produced consists in this. The world, the system of convictions belonging to a previous generation, gives way to a vital state in which man remains without these convictions and therefore without a world. Man returns to a state of not knowing what to do for the reason that he returns to a state of actually not knowing what to think about the world." End quote. In its further antiquation, if not complete supersession, of the system of convictions that provided the ideational infrastructure on which the intelligibility of the world could be maintained, the Anthropocene could perhaps be characterized as the final fruitless spasm of the historicizing impulse, the ultimate expression of the need to historically grasp and manage what is happening, taken to its tautological conclusion. 
Existing on our authority, the reign of human actualities does indeed make the Anthropocene our syndrome of total accomplishment, to borrow a phrase from Paul Grillo, confirmation, apparently, of an ineliminable bond between mind and world. Yet far from finally securing the historical identity to which human beings aspire, and which the acquirement of historical knowledge is supposed to facilitate, the epochal emergence of a human age actually threatens to eradicate human existence. This anthropogenic world powered by the fossil economy proves inim inimical to life, even human life. Its contradictions are born of what Marx and Engels called the consolidation of what we ourselves produce into an objective power above us, growing out of our control, thwarting our expectations, bringing to naught our calculations. For instance, today microplastic particles containing various chemicals are absorbed by air, food, and water. The means of subsistence, including reliable weather patterns essential to agricultural production, are compromised through the belching of harmful substances into the atmosphere, leading to a rapidly warming world, and nutrients are leached from topsoil faster than they can be replenished, thus affecting our future ability to grow enough food. This loss of control further deepens the contradiction the Anthropocene represents. The confirmation of enormous anthropogenic power simultaneously undermined by the unstoppable momentum of its own creations, which worked away late from within, and over time rendering unsustainable the economic modes of existence out of which it initially emerged. To employ an image borrowed from chemistry, the Anthropocene evinces on a massive scale a phenomenon known as secondary efflorescence, a chemical reaction to the absorption of saline in infrastructure. Typically, a structure may display primary efflorescence, which occurs when water evaporates after migrating to the surface of a porous substance, such as brick or concrete, leaving salt deposits upon the masonry. In secondary efflorescence, however, saline is absorbed and begins to dissolve the material from within. In advanced cases, the integrity of the structure is compromised. And so, by the end of the, of the century, for example, substantial parts of the Earth's surface may be too hot and humid for human thermoregulation. Indeed, as a historical formation presenting the world as it really is, as the way it has got to be the way it is, the Anthropocene affirms the existing world order, therefore becoming indistinguishable from its referent. In these completely historicized circumstances, then, occurs a remarkable predicament, burdened with what Martin L. Davies calls an inheritance of historical erudition, as redundant as it is comprehensive. The Anthropocene leaves everyone in their immediate existential situation more vulnerable and apprehensive than in any previously conjectured state of nature. But the human subject, this finite, finished world, Davies concludes, henceforth confronts in it nothing other than itself, its own redundancy. Identity is, after all, predicated on redundancy. As Gregory Bateson points out, community is the recreation of redundancy, patterning and predictability. In combining both mind and world into one, the self-referential semiotic structure of the Anthropocene conspires, to, as he says, to make the universe of the observer more predictable, more ordered, and more redundant. But when we say that a message has meaning or is about some referent, what we mean is that there is a larger universe of relevance consisting of message plus referent, and that redundancy or pattern or predictability is introduced into this universe by the message. In the consequent isolation it imposes, the Anthropocene neutralizes through the identitary thinking it demands, the requisite dimension of refusal essential to human emancipation. If thinking can aspire only to the self-same, wherein the parameters of understanding are preempted, existential self-orientation is automatically blocked. Thinking and reality conform to, or reduce to, the same dimension of the horizon possible. It operates in the superfluous so-called shadow land where, describing merely its own identity, the Anthropocene orientates the human species around itself. In this, its anthropic bias, the Anthropocene ensures thought and being converge on the same historically preempted reality. Fundamentally, the Anthropocene is a place, as Jean Baudrillard says, in which we are condemned to the infinite retrospective of all that has preceded us, a place where, lacking anything truly other than ourselves, we are forced to look back in apprehension at the accreted waste of human endeavor as its frightful legacy engulfs us. In this way, the redundancy it imposes, the existential irrelevance it ensures, works retrospectively as well as prospectively. Ideally, retrospection offers the capacity to look back with hindsight upon occurrences in the immediate or distant past. It alerts us to what we didn't or couldn't have realized at the time of their occurrence. Through retrospection, the renewed absence of days gone by functions to highlight the disparity between what was and what is. It alerts us to the mismatch between past happenstance and present consciousness. 
In this regard, the Anthropocene categorization not only presents to immediate consciousness the decrepit circumstances of present existence, encapsulated in the degradation of the biosphere, and the diminishment of its existential prospects thanks to the overreach inherent in its means of historical self-reproduction, but prompts a retrospective view of human existence as seen from the far future, after the debris of countless civilizations has sunk over millions of years into the sediment of deep time. In this way, even while being reassuringly modern, at the forefront, ahead of the curve, always seeking the latest thing, human life is in the Anthropocene fundamentally characterized by redundancy, not only in existential terms, but in terms of knowledge, of ideas that are defined above all by their inexpungible lateness, their constitutive inadequacy to cope with their own supersession, their inability to repair their own consequences. Hence what I call retrospective redundancy attempts to conceptualize this condition of unprecedented precarity the Anthropocene generates, symptomized in the radical lateness of human existence, in our being located afterwards, in the aftermath, yet also apprehensively before, as the future dimly hones into view as something radically other than human, which is to say, radically other than historically comprehensible. We find ourselves here at the very limits of historical comprehension or human anticipation. The subsequent despondency, the sense of being historically badly placed, of having arrived too late, stretches credulity, flying in the face of enlightenment hopes for the unfolding betterment of human existence. Thus, in its own way, the Anthropocene fashions a prison house of history. The human species is left at the mercy of its antiquated and misguided historical actions, conceptualizations, and categories intended to guide its future existence. It confronts the situation in which historical comprehension itself its traditional means of orientation of identity is rendered redundant without recourse to what already happened to make sense of what is happening now because it is utterly without precedent in human history. Surpassing history entirely, confronting a schismatic situation of being at once historically stuck and historically superseded, redundancy emerges as the primary consequence of human self-reproduction as traditionally historically implemented. The Anthropocene thus amplifies the historical redundancy already inscribed into the structure of capitalist society and on which that society perversely depends. It affirms a reality comprehensively described yet inadequately controlled, a history for constantly summoned yet continually found wanting, and a future always preempted yet forever unforeseen. The tautological redundancy of this self-same world not only sanctions solipsism, but preemptively prevents any perspective that might supersede it. It is for this reason the Anthropocene exudes the forlorn administrative, administrative effort of a world long since overtaken by history. It signals the time already fading into the past, turning itself into history. In its widespread adoption exhibits what Davies calls the fundamental delusion of the comprehensively historicized world, namely that the historicizing description of the world one lives in has a privileged meaning in that world for the life one lives there. But what connection does the encapsulating conception of the Anthropocene have to the reality it is supposed to encompass? Neither compensating for present troubles nor clarifying any possible resolution to them, the crisis of human identity, if human understanding, the Anthropocene signals, is at bottom a crisis of historical comprehension, of history as the measure of humanity. It becomes a crisis in our sense of history, and so, conversely, in the sense history is supposed to make of us. To conceive of the historical contingency of all things and yet acknowledge the connection between ourselves and our environment in which we are prisoners of historical forces beyond our control and which our predecessors unleashed is a predicament which only amplifies our, our incurable sense of crisis, its signs, its symptoms, its constant and tragic awareness of self-sabotage. It turns the confrontation with anthropogenic change into a constant confrontation with history eliciting a sense of crisis that, that is nothing less than a crisis in historical sense, a deep stabilization of historical meaning. Once, historical comprehension seemed ideally capable of attaining an abstract, a cosmic view of human history, engendering a sense of being at one with the world, attuned most intimately with its ways, surveying its course, its progress, its plan, its, destin its destiny. Sorry. But today, the crisis of historical comprehension is a consequence of the self-induced breakdown in that symmetry or congruence between thought and being, between individual lifetime and the time of the world that historical knowledge was supposed to confirm or provide. That knowledge now proves inadequate because there can be no symmetry or alignment between two points of instability, the human mind on the one hand and the world it creates on the other, both of which reciprocally reshape each other in unexpected and often unwelcome ways. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Leskanich, for your presentation. I would also like to remind the audience that they are free to propose any questions by joining us on the slido.com platform using hashtag Herald for the later Q&A. And now let us move to the last uh, presenter of this uh, panel, uh, who is Dashan Xu. Excuse my pronunciation if wrong. Uh, he's from China and first studied philosophy and social anthropology at St. Andrews in Scotland. Currently, he's working on his PhD in Leuven, uh, Flanders, working on a topic of Aristotle and specifically on his inquiry into friendship and the problem of self-love. Uh, I'm passing the mic to Mr. Xu. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just uh, share my screen uh, for the PowerPoint. Can everybody see the PowerPoint okay? Ah, okay. There we go. Yeah. Thanks. So, um, so it's it's kind of uh, ironic. I was put in the panel called uh, philosophy of history, because Aristotle is known that he doesn't have a philosophy of of history. Uh, however, he, he does have an almost outrageous claim that um, poetry or fiction is more philosophical and serious than history. So. I want to take this opportunity to uh, revisit the text where this uh, quote is from and uh, argue that I don't think the, the statement is meant to disparage, philosophy, uh, disparage history, but rather to show the progression uh, that fiction makes out of history. Hence the title, uh, From the Past to the Possible. Um, I'll start with the, um, the painting uh, on my first slide. I don't know if you know the painting, but uh, uh, it's by Rembrandt. It's called Aristotle Contemplating a Bust of Homer. So I think this painting is really interesting uh, and uh, it helps us to entice uh, this uh, inquiry. Because firstly, uh, if, if I don't tell you what this painting is about, you would not recognize this person as uh, Aristotle precisely because he's dressed in this wealthy Dutch man of the uh, 17th century. Um, and uh, so historically, the identity of the man depicted has always been a problem. And secondly, it's a, it's a, a bust of Homer, which he, he looks at. And we all know that we, uh, nobody knows uh, what Homer looks like. So it's a depiction of, of someone who also nobody knows uh, what, who they look like. And uh, now once we know who they are, it becomes clear that it's a philosopher paying tribute to a poet. And moreover, it is a painter paying tribute to a philosopher paying tribute to a poet. So what I want to say is they all pay tribute to the past from the tradition uh, which breeds their craft. But as Rembrandt probably know, and maybe also Aristotle, that, that the the past that they are train, paying tribute to is preserved via fiction. Uh, but the point of uh, uh, paying tribute is not for the sake of the antiquarian reason. So it's not for the sake of depicting the accurate historical figure of Homer and uh, Aristotle that uh, Rembrandt paints this painting. So that is the theme of my paper today. That is uh, Aristotle on um, fiction's progress from history. I argue that the famous comparison, uh, which I just said before, um, indicates a relation and a progression from history to fiction. That is, poetry or fiction is both indebted to history, but also is able to grow out of and independent of history. This point might be uh, kind of commonsensical for us because now those, the two disciplines are well uh, defined and uh, almost taken for granted. But I think back in Aristotle's time, the status of fiction is very uh, precarious. Uh, it's, it's precarious for two reasons. So first we can think of the Platonic background. Um, so we all know that uh, the ancient quarrel that Arist uh, Plato talk about uh, between philosophy and poetry and he uh, thinks should, we should banish poets from the ideal city. So 
I think it's radical that Aristotle decides to shift from this quarrel between philosophy and poetry, move on to this progression from history to poetry. And secondly, it's for normal audience of the uh, of the uh, of the theater goers of the of the Greeks, because um, the characters of plays are often uh, historical figures, so it's not immediately clear to the viewers whether the characters that is depicted are real or whether the story is fiction. So the deceiving similarity between uh, poetry and history is what motivates Aristotle to address issue, this issue in his uh, poetics. Okay, I think we can go. And uh, my plan today is just to read with you the, the passage. And uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with uh, the poetics and if you have read it. I think it's, uh, it's just uh, beneficial for everyone just to um, go back to the text and see what Aristotle offers uh, from there. Okay, so I'll read um, from here. It says, the task, sorry. Uh, so, so I have the small uh, se section title, which is I made in order to make it clear how many steps Aristotle makes. And this is a quote from uh, chapter nine of the Poetics. From what has been said, it is clear that the task of poets is not to speak of what has come to be, but what kind of things that could and would come to be either probably or necessarily. For the historian and the poet differs not in one writes with meters and the other without. For if that of Herodotus is put in meters, it is no less a history with meters or without. But what differs them is this, one speaks of what actually has come to be, the other, what kind of things can possibly come to be? Okay, so uh, focus here are two things. The idea of the ergon, the task, the notion of speaking of, and then uh, the words in italic, what kind of things. So I want to talk about the idea of, uh, of ergon. Uh, it's, it's a typical uh, word for the, for the Greeks. It means function, work, task, uh, what have you. Um, it's, it's slightly different from uh, what we mean uh, when we say, oh, that's what people does. Because it, it also tells us the reason why they do what they do. So let me use an example. Um, so think about a surgeon, uh, like a surgeon who does surgeries and a butcher. At the surface of it, the, the things they do might be similar. I think they cut a body open and they, they even put stuff there. Um, and in terms, of, in terms of the craft of the dissection, it might also have some similarity. But the reason for, their, for, what, they, for they do, that what we do, they do is so different. Uh, and that would be the ergon. That is the surgeon dissects in order to cure and the butcher dissects in order to uh, make meat, for example. So, but a person who is uninformed with the ergon would be scared at the surgeon uh, in the sense that if a child go to the hospital, maybe he or she would be afraid uh, because he, he or she doesn't know what is the purpose of hospital. Um, I mean, we, of course, we understand, but it's reasonable that a children, if nobody explained to them uh, why they are here, they might be scared in a way that uh, a pet might do in a, in a, in a trip to a, a vet. So that is the, the, the purpose of the, the idea of the task. Um, so the problem is, as we said in the introduction, fiction and history are similar. I think they share similar historical figures to be their subject matter. Um, so we can imagine Aristotle's point here in a way as what parents would do in explaining the, to their children what's the purpose of hospital is. So to, to go beyond the, deceiving, the deceivingly similarity between history and uh, fiction. Okay. Um, okay, so that's the point of the ergon. The second point is the point of uh, speaking of. So 
the idea being the, the play, such as Oedipus, it only depicts what Oedipus does and what happens to Oedipus. In a way, it never speaks directly about what kind of person Oedipus is or what kind of things that has befallen Oedipus. So that is to say, what the poet want to speak of is not explicit in the way the poet speaks for it, um, which is different from what history does. So when the, when the historian tell us what happens to this or that kind of person within a historical account, that directly refers to what the historian, historian speaks of. Whereas the poets uses the imitation of a particular thing in order to speak of something that he couldn't say it in the imitation. So that's the, the unique thing about uh, um, poet, uh, fiction, because it never tells you what is it, what is the condition, or what kind of people that they want to depict. They invite uh, audience to uh, infer. Okay. So that seems to be the difference between history and uh, poetry at the level of the task. Uh, let's go to the next section. Okay, so now it's where the uh, statement uh, comes. Therefore, poetry is more philosophical and serious than history. For on the one hand, poetry speaks of things universally, and on the other hand, history speaks of things particularly. By universal, that is to say, the sort of things uh, the sort of person would say or do either probably or necessarily. That is why poetry aims in naming them. By particular, that is what Asepiades does or suffers. Okay, the ancient uh, paradigm of particular and universal. Uh, let's start with a simple one, a particular. That's just as example says, is what Asepiades does. Now the question is, what is a universal? Uh, and the universal here is in a way a modification of what uh, Aristotle says previously. Here we introduce the notion of the character and the notion of probability and the necess necessity. Um, so it's certain kind of possibility that is not contingent. That's why he qualifies it. Not only is it not contingent, it is also understandable. I think it is understandable via the depiction, depiction of the character. Or oh, because Hamlet is indecisive, of course, he would not be able to uh, take a revenge uh, of his uh, uncle. OK, but the point of this uh, uh, dichotomy is to say that universals are ahistorical. They are not limited from uh, what, has been, uh, what has happened uh, in the past. Okay, but the trick here is they do use names, real names uh, of tragedy. Okay, so now we have two examples from Aristotle. Now in the case of comedy, this has been clear for they construct the plot in the manner of probability and then put down whatever names that occur to them. Unlike the satirists who write about particulars. On the other hand, in tragedies, they keep the real name. Okay, that's really the problem because people get confused about if you have the real name of a person, what do you mean? Is it a real person or is it a fiction? Now I also explains why this is the case. The case of that uh, is what is persuasive is what is possible. A thing has not come to be, where if a thing has not come to be, we are yet to be persuaded of its possibility. But what has come to be is obviously possible. It would not have come to be if it is impossible. Okay, so now we have this extra criteria that uh, a, poet, a poet needs to fulfill. That is, he or she needs to make the story persuasive. Now that's not something that a histori historian necessarily needs. I think a best example would be like news. So when we read news, we already assume that they would tell us uh, what is uh, possible. So, and they just tell us and uh, what, is, what has happened. So we don't need to be persuaded. However, 
with a uh, with a uh, fiction and we know it's fiction and now we demand we are entitled to judge whether it's uh, uh, persuasive or not so a convenient way for poets to to be uh, persuasive is to use historical names but they don't have to that's the point they don't have to use real names uh, and that's what happens for uh, the poets of the time and uh, Okay, here we go. Nevertheless, even in some tragedies, one or two of the names are of those known, while the rest have been made up and in some none are known. As for example, in Anisus of Agathon. For both the events and names alike have been made up in it, and it delights no less. So that one ought not to seek to cling completely to the stories that have been handed down concerning those whom tragedies are about. For to seek that would be laughable. Since even things known are known to few, but nevertheless, they delight all. Okay, that's what I call the progression from, uh, hi uh, from history to fiction. So despite the fact that uh, poets have always been using historical events and figures to tell their stories, but there is a potential true potential to liberate from the past. Um, and I will finish uh, uh, this quote, then uh, we can discuss. So the last part is to say, it is clear from these things, now he now Aristotle returns to his uh, earlier point, that the poet must be a maker of plot rather than of meters. Insofar as he is a poet by virtue of imitation and he imitates actions. And therefore it follows that in making a plot out of things, that have come to be, he's no less a poet. For nothing prevents some of the things that have come to be to be from, say, from being the kind of things that is likely to come to be. And it is in virtue of this that he is a poet. Okay, that's quite a mouthful of a sentence. But basically, I also want to say the, the fact that something has, to, uh, has happened doesn't make it credible. But we can, or people can, uh, tease out what is possible from those events. Now that is what a poets, poets can really learn from history. Not, not some accidental facts, but really something universal from the history. And they can make plot based on that. Okay, I want to finish my presentation by a quote uh, from uh, 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 an author I like, uh, it's from uh, Thomas Wolfe. Since I have no time, I'll just read the last uh, pa passage which summarizes what I want to say. And I notice many authors have similar views and it's from the preface to a uh, homeward, uh, look homeward angel. Uh, the author says, but we are the sum of all the moments of our lives. All that is ours is in them. We cannot escape or conceal it. If the writer has used the clay of life to make his book, he has only used what all men must, what none can keep from using. Fiction is not fact, but fiction is fact selected and understood. Fiction is fact arranged and charged with purpose. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry if I uh, uh, stayed uh, over time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, let's jump to the official time dedicated to questions and answers. And so I'd like to start with a, uh, with a question for Dr. Patriarca. That is, are there any elements in Ibn Khaldun uh, which you would consider to be able to inspire social theory on Arab nations uh, in a constructive way? Uh, very good point. Um, it's, it's a good starting point. Mm, the problem is that sometimes his theories are taken by some groups in order just to underline the religious element, which is important, but it, which is not the only one. And uh, if, if we consider briefly the history of Ibn Khaldun, we know that it was partially rejected during, for centuries and rediscovered by the Turkish or Ottoman uh, philosophers. So 
uh, it was retaken in a very uh, modern form during the 16th, 17th centuries. And then he, his theories reached the Western philosophers, especially through uh, Italian and, and French Orientalists. It's very interesting what is happening now. There is a sort of confusion or a fusion between the, the, the philosophy of Ibn Khaldun and other philosophers like Ibn Taymiyyah, for example, which is extremely different, but they are put all these philosophers together in order to, uh, to uh, rebuild a sort of common ground of Islamic political theology. But if we take scientifically what Ibn Khaldun taught some centuries ago, it's a very good starting point, even for not only for Islamic countries or Arab countries, but for uh, other uh, people and other countries, especially uh, the Laffer Carve. He was the first one to describe the so-called Laffer Carve, which is very popular now in economic, um, in economic history. Thank you very much. Uh, so another question for the sake of time, probably the last one is for Dashan Shu. And that is uh, Aristotle in poetics uh, stresses the importance on, of catharsis, especially in the case of Antigone. Do you think that uh, such, of, uh, such a phenomenon can be a tool of such persuasion as you uh, pushed forward? Um, can, can you repeat about the relation between catharsis and persuasion? Yeah, if it can be uh, seen or perceived as a tool in order a to tool. persuade. Uh, no, I think, I think it comes after. After you have uh, been persuade, persuaded of the possibility, and then the emotional engagement would uh, introduce a catharsis. Thanks. Thank you very kindly. And so this is the end of the sixth panel. And I would like to thank to our contributors for all of the interesting presentations, as well as to our audience for their attention. Have a lovely uh, rest of the day and do not hesitate to stick around for the later program right after a short break. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. That was... That was really fantastic.
Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to, to the Liberal Herald, to uh, the eighth event of, of this conference. For those of you who have been following us for uh, uh, two days, congratulations. That's quite an achievement. Uh, good effort. And, and uh, uh, we're happy that you are with us um, and enjoying the sessions. Um, this next session is a keynote. Uh, my guest here is Philip uh, Gamagelian. If you can just wave so that people see you, you're muted. <laughs> hi, hi, Dasha. I, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. I really appreciate this. I believe this is my first keynote speech. <laughs> oh, well. Having done many, uh, of course, uh, other presentations. So I appreciate the chance. Yeah, I, I know you have, and we are very honored uh, to have you. Phil is actually, to uh, make a full disclosure, is a good and old friend of mine. We have met uh, years ago, it's like another lifetime uh, in, in Boston. And uh, uh, currently he's uh, the assistant professor at the John Croc uh, uh, School of Peace Studies at the University of San Diego, where he teaches uh, conflict resolution, conflict analysis, uh, mediation, politics of memory and uh, program design, monitoring, and evaluation. But he's not just a scholar. He's a scholar practitioner. Uh, and he founded uh, the Imagine Center for Conflict Transformation, which is also more than 10 years old now, uh, right? It was 2007 or eight when it was founded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, is the managing editor of the Caucasus edition of Journal of Conflict Transformation, which is highly recommended to anyone who wants to know, uh, uh, who wants wants to be uh, informed and oriented in uh, the conflicts in in the Caucasus, and especially Armenia, Azerbaijan. That's always my to go go to place um, to read up. And uh, he works in the post-Soviet uh, states, especially when he works in, in uh, um, conflict resolution programs, as well as in Turkey and Syria, uh, engaging policymakers, journalists, educators, uh, social scientists, uh, and other discourse creating professionals. His research focuses on politics of memory in conflict contexts and critical re-evaluation and design on conflict, conflict resolution interventions. Um, he is uh, the author of Conflict Resolution Beyond uh, the International Relations Paradigm, Evolving Designs uh, as, as a Transformative Practice in Nagorno-Karabakh and, and Syria, which again, I think for anyone who facilitates or um, is engaged in conflict transformation, community development in post-conflict areas, it is an important book because, because it is based uh, not only on the review of scholarly literature, but on years and years of, of practice, especially in identity-based conflicts. I also have to say on, on a, a personal note that Phil is an excellent facilitator. He has that combination uh, of being or feeling and thinking like an insider in the conflict, coming from Armenia and experiencing that conflict firsthand and living with it uh, entire life but also with a distance, uh, the professional distance of, of a facilitator, which is not an easy combination. And anyone who knows, uh, it's quite a feat to achieve. Um, he started with the classical conflict, uh, uh, conflict resolution training. That's actually, I think, when we met around that period of time. But he has worked his way uh, to really defining a unique approach uh, to conflict transformation that comes from the sustained dialogues. He's been de dealing with uh, lots of groups from conflict areas. So Phil, welcome. Welcome to the Liberal Herald. Thank you. And I will ask you probably straight away. Um, so you're a research scholar and also a practitioner. And uh, uh, I know that you didn't start that way. You, you started uh, more as a businessman, but somehow you ended up investing decades of your life uh, into conflict resolution of work and study. It, be, it really became your life to facilitate dialogues, medio, mediate, do conflict research. How did you end up this way? 
I heard your grandmother had something to do with that. Well, thank you again uh, for the invitation and for uh, starting us off. Uh, as you mentioned already, yeah, currently I live in San Diego uh, where I teach, but most of my life uh, has, I grew up in a conflict. I grew up in a Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Uh, I specifically was born in the final years of the Soviet Union. My teenage years were in the final uh, years of the Soviet Union, uh, Soviet Armenia specifically. And when the Soviet Union broke down and the conflicts emerged, uh, so essentially that was really uh, the environment in which I was growing up. I was 14, 15 uh, during that, uh, the beginning uh, of the wars. So again, my very formative years uh, were took place in this environment. Uh, before becoming a business person, as you mentioned, though, I was like just a nationalist teenager, which uh, most of my friends were, and I tried to volunteer for a war. I went through some military training, but lucky for me, I was too young and uh, was not eventually taken to the front line. Uh, but what happened uh, eventually was that a lot of, I started meeting people who went to the front line uh, with whom I almost ended up going and fighting. Uh, and I was planning to go because I heard a lot about, uh, I read in newspapers and heard from uh, friends and family about uh, all kinds of uh, war crimes committed by the other side against Armenians, and I had this strong urge and need to uh, defend. But I never actively thought what defending means until I started uh, meeting people who started coming back from the war, those who, with whom I almost went to fight. Again, not all of them came back, but those who did, they were telling about their war stories. And their war stories reminded me a lot of what I thought the other side is doing to us. So I never really realized that yeah, by going to war, you will be committing exact same or very similar type of uh, what I can call war crimes or uh, violence towards the others. And the others will be seeing you from the lens you were seeing them until now. So that was a very transformative moment uh, again in my late teenage years, uh, where I started really questioning my upbringing and really the way I understood the world and conflict. Uh, but my initial reaction was to just then move away from politics and from the war and become a business person and become, uh, try to really not think about uh, all of this uh, until, yeah, as mentioned, I probably read it in the book <laughs> that my grandmother asked me one day what's... Uh, you told me this story and, and I always remembered it, yeah. I see, yeah, I uh, also put it in the book eventually. The, my grandmother asked me someday about uh, going to be the meaning of my life and I gave a very cynical answer that uh, life has no meaning and I just want to live as good as I can. And at that point, I was a pretty successful business person supporting my grandmother and uh, of other parts of my family too. So I felt entitled and as a, how could she even ask that question? But that stayed with me. And um, when I started reflecting on my life at some point and towards my mid twenties, I realized that going to business uh, partially was a way to escape what I felt was a responsibility for wanting to participate in that first war, the supporting the war. Uh, and then make a big, made a big U-turn and uh, at about of 20, late in my late 20s, uh, started to look for conflict resolution programs to somehow contribute to the solution that in some small way I felt I was responsible for starting earlier. Uh, and, I, because there were no, I knew French at the time, and there were no conflict resolution programs in France, really the ones I liked. So I started learning English intentionally to um, yeah, learn that skill or uh, profession of conflict resolution and ended up in Boston at Brandeis, which is where we met, uh, studying really conflict resolution. And that has been my life since then, and trying to contribute, first of all, to the resolution of that particular conflict. Uh, but with time expanding and looking also into the theory of conflict resolution and also in the conflict in that neighborhood, but overall worldwide as well. And I, I remember you started really early, like already at Brandeis, you, you started running uh, <laughs> Turkish-Armenian dialogue groups, which for a beginning uh, practitioner in conflict resolution is, is quite uh, an ambitious, quite an ambitious endeavor, but uh, certainly a great learning process. Uh, yeah, ambitions. Uh, per, 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 perhaps also a bit hot-headed, yeah? as it's coming from a business world uh, and uh, really coming to solve conflicts was being my 
mindset. I just hit the ground running as, as you mentioned, just being a master student, barely knowing anything about conflict. I immediately started organizing um, dialogue uh, projects. So the, the first one was a uh, Turkish Armenian one indeed, because Armenia is in conflict, not only with Azerbaijan, with whom Armenia had the Nagorno-Karabakh war still has it, but also with Turkey, which is another neighbor, a much bigger neighbor uh, on the other side. So if Azerbaijan is the neighbor of Armenia on the east, Turkey is the neighbor on the west. Uh, so there is a long-standing conflict there as well um, that um, has, of course, big part of uh, um, culminated in the Armenian genocide um, in the early 20th century that has never been really settled or resolved uh, or really processed neither by Armenian society nor by the Turkish one. So I, as I arrived to Boston, I saw a lot of Turkish students, a lot of Armenian students, and they had constant conflict. And uh, yeah, I immediately offered to organize a dialogue workshop, which uh, went rather well, although it was very disorganized, as in we had no methodology really, if it was new for me uh, as well. Uh, so it was really a talk process that resulted uh, in an interesting resolution where we somehow reconciled but we didn't know how. So we went on backwards and reconstructed our process and understood how we really were able to work through our conflict and come to a place of reconciliation. And that became really the basis for starting my practice, uh, which in 2007 um, was registered as an Imagine Center for Conflict Transformation, the organization you mentioned, uh, that works primarily in Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict. And it has been founded by jointly by Azerbaijani and Armenian uh, scholar practitioners, which is uh, unfortunately a very unique case still. So we don't have many, if maybe even any other joint uh, organizations that were really founded not top bottom by some foreign organization, but that were really uh, founded by locals. And uh, since then, yeah, since 2007, uh, we've been working on this conflict, both uh, advising official level negotiations sometimes, well, but also conducting a lot of an official work uh, from young people, youth dialogues to uh, attempts to transform the history education or reform the history education and everything in between. So uh, in your work, and that, that's that's what uh, we want to work our way uh, towards, you, you um, conceive conflict differently than is usual, especially in international relations. Uh, based on your experience, etc., uh, placing history and memory at, at the center of resolution of, um, um, of, of conflict uh, analysis and conflict processes. But before we get there, before we get to the heart of the matter, uh, I realize that many, uh, many, even colleagues of mine, but especially students uh, in this day and age, actually do not know much, if anything, about the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, or even more broadly about the, the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict. Um, to, to me, that's unusual because, I mean, I remember growing up short, shortly after the, the Velvet Revolution. I think it's one of the first uh, significant uh, memories that, that we had of, of like uh, important events around us. It was the war in Nagorno-Karabakh and, and the war in Yugoslavia where it appeared that uh, there is war everywhere around us and the world is falling apart and it was really followed at that uh, point in time. But um, ever since then, it was, it was mostly uh, on the margins or at least uh, not as central in our media as it should be or as, as one would expect uh, it to be. So can, can you just very briefly, um, uh, like in broad strokes, tell us what this conflict uh, is, is about, and I'm sure we'll dissect it further. Um, I know from, from the little that I, I've, I've read uh, that it goes back to, to Joseph Stalin or that he was instrumental um, in, uh, in 1920s in uh, essentially designating Nagorno-Karabakh as uh, as an Azerbaijani territory, but uh, there's not much mention of him or of it within the narratives today. So I'm curious, how is, how is this perceived? How, how does that make part of the narratives today? How is Stalin remembered in relation to this conflict and what was it then really about? Complicated question, is, uh, not easy to answer briefly, but I will try. 
Uh, so first of all, let me pull up quickly a map and I don't have many slides, just one or two maps uh, to situate this conflict on a map somewhere for the audience if there are people who are not very familiar. Uh, so this is a map of the Soviet Union uh, in its final years. Uh, it looked very different in different parts, uh, different time periods of the Soviet Union. But this is the final um, division. And Soviet Union, uh, similar to Yugoslavia, yeah, consisted of a number of constituting uh, republics. Uh, specifically, 15 of them had the status of uh, forming republics, including from Russian, uh, starting from Russian Federation, uh, to 14 others that, uh, at least on paper, were independent states that chose to join uh, forces in the Union. So by the same uh, constitution, yeah, by the same uh, approach, they all were there voluntarily and could secede. So the way Soviet Union uh, really functioned, uh, uh, it was led, of course, by the Communist Party, but uh, on a more local formal level, each uh, constituting republic out of 15 had its own territory, its own borders, its own government, and uh, three of these were situated in the South Caucasus region. And this is that uh, kind of bottom uh, left corner of the screen where you see purple, green, and brown uh, <laughs> little republics. They are some of the smallest ones. Uh, so the green one is Armenia, the uh, brown one is Azerbaijan. Uh, so this is where really, that's the region they are talking about. And um, as you can see that each kind of color we have on the screen are one of these main, yeah, one of the main 15 republics. But you can see other dots and lines uh, on the map as well. And uh, a lot of these are uh, borders of autonomies within uh, many of these republics. Not each of them, a couple of them, smaller ones such as Armenia did not have autonomies, uh, but most others had. Uh, and again, these other lines you can see are also uh, administrative units within each republic, yeah. Uh, and one of them was Nagorno-Karabakh. So this is a too small of a map to see. So I'll try to go uh, backwards here uh, and show another one. So this is a close-up map. So you can see Armenia, which is uh, in the same borders as the Soviet Armenia. Uh, Azerbaijan uh, is the orange color, of course, uh, but also whatever you see in gray and, uh, sorry, in red and the darker uh, gray or brown shape. Uh, so all of that was the Soviet Azerbaijan. Uh, and within Soviet Azerbaijan, there were two autonomies. Yeah, one of them is Nakhijevan, the one uh, in the bottom of the screen next to the Iran border. And the second one is that red colored one, which is Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast or Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomy, essentially, which was an Armenian populated autonomy uh, in the, the Soviet Azerbaijan. Uh, from here on, let me jump uh, and quickly give a very short rundown of the way the conflict um, developed in late 80s, and then I'll go to the Stalin question that you asked. So what happened in the 80s, uh, of course, the Soviet Union collapsed, we had many conflicts emerging. Uh, they were about where really the borders are, yeah, and a lot of autonomy, specifically within Soviet republics, uh, were interested in uh, getting their own independence. Uh, you are closer to uh, the Balkans and Kosovo. So I think Kosovo's situation is, uh, you, uh, your audience might be more familiar with a similar situation happens. Kosovo was to remind, right? An autonomy within uh, the communist Serbia. Uh, so when the five initial the Yugoslav republics uh, gained independence, Kosovo wasn't one of them because it was autonomy. It didn't have the equal status with others. So similar to that, Nagorno-Karabakh, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, later Crimea, Chechnya, and many other autonomies within Soviet republics tried to um, secede. Uh, some de facto successfully, others like Chechnya are not successfully. What's unique about Nagorno-Karabakh was that uh, the one yeah, between Armenia and Azerbaijan is that uh, it's considered now not post-Soviet conflict, but in a way one of the conflicts that uh, pushed Soviet Union to collapse. Uh, because it really started in uh, late 80s, uh, in mid to late 80s, not after the Soviet Union collapsed, but before that. Uh, and kind of the mismanagement of this conflict was one of the, not the only, but one of the reasons uh, that really pushed Soviet Union uh, over the edge. So it started with Gorbachev's perestroika and uh, when there was more freedom of speech and Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh autonomy started demanding uh, leaving Soviet Azerbaijan and joining Soviet Armenia. 
So that didn't go well uh, with neither Soviet Azerbaijan leadership nor uh, the Soviet leadership in general. Uh, also, it was opening up a can of worms potentially because already an unstable country at that point, many more autonomies could start asking for similar moves. So there was an attempt to suppress uh, this movement that was initially a peaceful movement. So that resulted in uh, violence towards the local population that in turn started answering, uh, you know, arming itself and answering violently. And uh, by the time the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, that resulted in a full scale war uh, for independence of Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, supported by the now independent Republic of Armenia uh, against essentially the Republic of Azerbaijan. The war in the 90s, the one you remember and the one you mentioned, uh, the one they almost ended up fighting in, uh, ended with a ceasefire uh, in 1994. If I jump back again here twice, uh, so the way it ended was that um, Armenian forces took control not only of that red region, yeah, the Nagorno-Karabakh autonomy former, but also uh, regions around that, which were Azerbaijan proper. So all of that other uh, kind of dark gray, brownish color. Uh, and in addition to having a military victory, which was conditioned primarily by the collapse of the Soviet, uh, no, Soviet uh, independent Azerbaijani leadership. Uh, so Armenia had, mo having mobilized earlier uh, for the cause of the independence of Nagorno-Karabakh or joining of Armenia, had alternative structures, power structures in place. So when independence happened, so this movement that uh, was, was called, Kar called Karabakh movement, which was um, protesting uh, in Armenia uh, for the in joining of Karabakh into Armenia became the new government. So it was better organized because it had history of you know, uh, protesting and uh, history of organizing. Azerbaijan in a way became independent a bit more, uh, less in a less planned way, let's say, because the Soviet Union collapsed. So there, it was slower to organize. Uh, and that really gap, uh, I, in my understanding, was one of the main reasons um, the kind of better organized or smaller numbered Armenian forces were able to um, take over pretty big territory uh, relatively quick. The bad consequence of this was complete ethnic cleansing of Armenians from Azerbaijan and Azerbaijanis from Armenia. So the war wasn't only happening in this territory, uh, but there were also pogroms and massacres of uh, Azerbaijanis in Armenia, Armenians in Azerbaijan. So the full population uh, of the minority population of each other was ethnically cleansed, including from this territory that Armenians took over. Uh, that were hundreds of thousands of uh, Azerbaijanis. So the war ended uh, in a, with a ceasefire, Russian mediated ceasefire in 1994, uh, but it ended more or less in capitulation of Azerbaijan at the time, uh, because simply Azerbaijan could not continue fighting, continually losing territory uh, and people. So if I go back to my timeline, uh, after that, there were peace negotiations, obviously. Uh, this is again unique, conflict has been unique and or was unique until now, in a sense that this is the only conflict that until 2020 had no Russian or any kind of other foreign or NATO uh, boots on the ground. Uh, and so Armenia and Azerbaijan had, there were no peacekeepers in the middle. So the war, the ceasefire ended with Armenian and Azerbaijani forces facing each other and overall upholding the ceasefire for many years uh, and negotiating. And the negotiations were led by uh, what's called Minsk Group, consisting of three chair countries, uh, US, Russia, and France. France in a way representing European Union. Uh, pretty powerful trio, if you think. Uh, and this has been also the, probably the only format where US and Russia until now has been, have been cooperating pretty closely and overall shared uh, an outlook on the way the conflict should be solved. Uh, so between 1994, the ceasefire and 2011, there were pretty active negotiations. There were a few uh, periods where the sides came close to solution to uh, signing a peace agreement. All of them failed. Uh, and for many reasons, uh, some of them are geopolitical or in some cases geopolitical, but in many others, uh, the sides just backed down. One or the other side just backed down from signing in the last moment. Uh, and this is where I think history comes into play and which gradually moved me from uh, more of an international relations type of approach to mm -hmm. looking into uh, narratives and memories. Because it was 
Sorry, impossible for uh, any any of the government really to sign any peace agreement, which would be seen as a defeat as a defeatist by their populations. Yeah, yeah um, I, I know there was a, 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 you have it on the slide there, the, the Velvet Revolution in Armenia, um, where it seemed like it will turn uh, towards, uh, closer towards resolution, uh, where the stance might be more reconciliatory and something might eventually come out of the peace process, uh, right? And, and there was a, uh, an election and, and Nicole uh, Pashinyan, um, was essentially showing signs of, of this rapprochement. So what what happened? <laughs> Why has it returned to the to the same old uh, same old? Right. So but as I mentioned, the uh, negotiations were pretty active up to through 2011. After 2011, there was very little really happening. Uh, um, at that point, pretty much the mediators, everybody accepted the negotiations have collapsed. And the only focus was on maintaining a ceasefire, which was also being continually broken because especially Azerbaijan, having lost territories and uh, not able to gain them through negotiations was uh, clearly showing and saying that they would, uh, if they cannot get the territories back to negotiations, they will have to resort to war. And there was a mini war in 2016 that lasted four days and the war uh, ended, uh, it's not clear how uh, officially, but unofficially, uh, the Armenian leadership agreed uh, in, through an Russian mediation to concede, to be, become more serious about uh, the negotiations and about concessions. And yet uh, it was not really able to move uh, with that politically. Uh, and moreover, soon after, the, this was not a democratic state in the Armenian nor Azerbaijan. And after another non-democratic election and the former government trying to perpetuate itself and uh, most likely uh, winning through fraudulent elections uh, led to a mass protest in 2018. Uh, that, yeah, what you call uh, what is known as the Velvet Revolution, which was a non-violent movement that ended up displacing the regime that was in power for uh, about 20 years in Armenia. And Nikol Pashinyan, which is a former journalist, uh, along with a lot of young people uh, who represent civil society, including a lot of peace building, peace builders, those who were for decades involved in peace building came to power. So there was this very short uh, lived hope that this new generation of leaders that are democratic and uh, came yeah, through nonviolent means to power might uh, be more uh, constructive in negotiations than the previous government uh, of Armenia was. Azerbaijan initially also showed signs of uh, appeasement and they pulled the uh, you know, military away from the border. They stopped uh, really uh, military um, engagement and they downscaled the rhetoric. So there was this one year opening potentially uh, for solutions. It did not go anywhere uh, on its own. Uh, from the Armenian end, uh, the new government uh, very quickly uh, fell prey, I would say. So once it came to power, it was immediately attacked by the former regime, now opposition uh, for being too soft and coming from civil society and very likely kind of selling out the country and to prove that they are you know, strong or uh, they went way further than any previous government and became much more nationalistic. Uh, for example, if the previous government was negotiating about territorial concessions, these ones refused to negotiate at all. Uh, yeah, if the former government was never demanded, for example, anything from Turkey, which is another neighbor, this government demanded territories from Turkey. So they went uh, on an official level. The president, prime minister, foreign ministry started demanding territories from Turkey uh, directly or indirectly. So all of this, they went way further than any of the previous governments went. So they went kind of in a way to cover up for their civil society background almost. They uh, went very far, uh, in my view, making the war practically uh, unavoidable because with this more uh, kind of uh, even higher rhetoric than previously, uh, and especially after a period where there was a hope for negotiations, uh, war became uh, again practically unavoidable. Uh, moreover, Turkey got uh, involved in war, and uh, what we had was the second Nagorno-Karabakh war that ended about a week ago. Uh, this time, with practically a capitulation of Armenia, uh, where Turkey and Azerbaijan, well, Azerbaijan, with the support of Turkey, uh, engaged in a a major offensive and regained most of the territory it lost in 1990s. 
uh, and now it resulted in an ethnic cleansing of the Armenians from these territories. So we have a new ceasefire, a new uh, stat you know, potential status quo. The conflict is not resolved uh, at all. Uh, and yet where the armies are station stations uh, shifted, but yet another major develop development is Russia now uh, has its boots on the ground. It moved peacekeepers uh, into the region. Um, and now if Armenia Azerbaijan had a chance to solve the conflict directly in the past, that's probably not something they have anymore. And mm. I realize now we're going further and further from history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, but I think it's important to, to understand. But as you describe the conflict, uh, it, it sounds like there's two sides in conflict. Um, essentially contesting a, a territory sounds like a, you know, a classical case study <laughs> from international relations. Uh, there are some tangible grievances. There is an important oil pipeline that goes right next to Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, so, um, but that's not the approach that you see useful when analyzing or, or approaching a, a conflict like this, seeing two sides, you know, tangible interests, uh, uh, object of, of object of the of the uh, of, of the conflict. And you were essentially uh, uh, calling for this field or, or the field of conflict analysis to be freed from from this uh, paradigm of, of realist thinking or, or the classical approaches to, to international uh, relations and to see uh, more of, of the complexity within within the within the conflict. So, what are these uh, traditional approaches missing? Uh, to qualify my own probably previous uh, point here is that uh, the pipeline there are oh, Azerbaijan has oil. There are pipelines. Uh, there are oil politics involved. There are geopolitics involved uh, uh, in. Um, broader sense as well. It's a region over which there has been contestation of United States and Russia uh, throughout the 1990s. Uh, there was a chance or at least a move from this region to move to this uh, European Union and uh, even to NATO. And that got a major reaction from Russia. Well, in later years, as uh, United States started withdrawing in a way from the region, uh, Turkey and Russia started contesting the region more than the United States and Russia. So there are a lot of geopolitical uh, players involved this, uh, and I don't downplay their importance at all. I think that analysis is extremely important uh, and yet that's done. So that's continually done. So pretty much anybody who knows the Caucasus talks about pipelines, talks about uh, great power politics. Uh, that's just one dimension of it, which is again, I don't want to downplay its importance. Uh, where I but the, uh, where I see uh, what's missing for me is that the local peace builders, such as myself, who a lot of times don't have much of an input into the great power politics, uh, could have an input somewhere else. Uh, and specifically on the local attitudes and uh, local leaders' willingness to compromise. Because even with all the great power competition, there were periods where uh, they were aligned, geopolitical stars were aligned uh, for the solution. There were periods when they were not, yeah? So, uh, and in these cases, as much as the local leaders wanted to, they probably could not solve the conflict. But again, there were periods where it was possible. An example is 2008 to 2011 period uh, where Dmitry Medvedev was the president of Russia and Barack Obama was the new president of uh, United States. And they, were, they hit this reset button of Russia-US relations. And Russia recently emerged from a war with Georgia and uh, was trying to be more conciliatory. So there was a period where Russia and US jointly made a big push to solve this conflict. And along with this also normalized Turkey-Armenia uh, relations. Uh, so really the whole and the Euro European Union started sending a lot of money for informal uh, efforts. So the whole world really was working suddenly on solving this conflict and everybody was interested in the solution. And for three years, yeah, the local leaders either very unwilling or incapable uh, of solving it. So which is, this is where I see a need to have this additional focus on why is it that local leaders are never able to uh, get to a solution. And here where history becomes extremely important or the way we understand and interpret history and what the memories are, uh, because uh, since the 1990s, even prior to 1990s, uh, actually from even the Soviet years, uh, 
the way the histories were written, the way they were told, uh, have been extremely polarizing. Uh, and they were extremely, um, this is your conference, I know you know uh, theoretically and everybody uh, in probably in participating here know all this on a theoretical level, but I saw this unfolding very in a very textbook way, in a very problematic way uh, in this region as well, uh, where these very essentialist narratives, uh, where yeah, the whole uh, national memory was built on the opposition to the other, the other being portrayed in a very unhuman terms. Uh, as only capable of massacres uh, and discrimination against your side, too cold and too cold through, first of all, textbooks, but also movies, also yeah, speeches of politicians, uh, also speeches of intellectuals, and really left no space for uh, any possible compromise. And really all the events from the past were interpreted within this narrative. And um, you asked about Stalin, so let me okay, yeah. <laughs> use this as an example uh, of what Stalin, how Stalin was used uh, in these newer narratives, uh, specifically by the Armenian side. This is what the story that's been told so much that even you, uh, yeah, not being from the region, remember Stalin uh, giving away or uh, putting Nagorno-Karabakh into Azerbaijan while it was populated by Armenians. And interestingly, and that's about 1921. And when you say this, we, we all probably imagine Stalin uh, like 50 year old man, maybe older with a mustache and really this uh, totalitarian leader of the Soviet Union who could uh, have decision making power over everything, right? I think this is the image we convey when we say Stalin made this decision. They are talking about 1921 now. Uh, he was not the head of the Soviet Union at this time. He was a very powerful uh, leader, uh, right? But uh, he wasn't that totalitarian leader uh, of the 30s, 40s that we think when we mentioned the name Stalin. He simply didn't have such a strong decision-making power. Uh, moreover, again, 1921, uh, this region was incorporated, or uh, the Red Army entered here uh, in 1920, in late 1920. Uh, so this was far from clear uh, that this region will remain in the Soviet Union. They still had to fight a civil war. Yeah, uh, the, uh, it wasn't even clear that Bol Bolshevik government will be able to uh, preserve power in Moscow, let alone in the periphery. So very, very different time period. Not again, it's not 30s, it's not 40s that we normally think when we say Stalin. Uh, so another difference, uh, this is not the late Soviet map. At that point, this region was divided, uh, was um, called Transcaucasian Soviet Socialist Republics. So these were all kind of sub uh, administrative units within a broader entity called Transcaucasian Soviet Socialist Republic that included Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Abkhazians, and pretty much everybody else. Yeah, so they were all in a way smaller units within a one bigger administrative unit. Uh, so against this background, so I don't agree with the divide and rule narrative at all. I think this was the opposite. This was an attempt to solve conflicts. Uh, so there was a war fought with, before the Sovietization of the Caucasus. There was a war fought between our independent Armenia shortly and independent Azerbaijan who emerged from the Russian empire in 1918 as independent states with no borders. There was a war fought over this territory of Nagorno-Karabakh, but also over Zangezur, which is south of current Armenia and Nakhchevan, which is this other autonomy I showed on the map. So pretty much all that big part of the region was contested between Armenia and Azerbaijan. There was a war, it had a mixed population so when the Red Army entered, they had a problem of two of their new uh, republics uh, contesting a lot of territory. Uh, so creating autonomies or drawing borders was much more of a conflict resolution exercise than divide and rule exercise at that point. Yeah, they needed to appease them. They needed them to somehow be comfortable to not to contest them, uh, the Soviet leadership in the first place. Uh, so the autonomy was a compromise solution uh, rather than, again, I believe, a divide and rule solution. And yet, that's not how it was presented or understood uh, in later years, right? When the attitude toward Stalin changed, but also the attitude uh, towards each other changed. Mm -hmm. So this is one example out of many, uh, and uh, really these uh, late Soviet narratives and that were picked up by especially post-Soviet states were extremely nationalistic. The whole history was built on fight for independence, uh, not as much against kind of bigger countries, uh, but more also against each other, or others were seen uh, as puppets of the other. So for Armenians, Azerbaijan, 
is presented in textbooks uh, and popular narrative as nothing else but a small brother of Turkey that is together with Turkey trying to perpetuate a new genocide. And this is the mindset where the compromise is seen as impossible because it's a compromise not of ter over territory, but it's a compromise over eventual genocide. Uh, yeah, over uh, eventual genocide, their power type of approach. Azerbaijan in turn sees Armenia as nothing else but uh, a puppet of Russia or somebody who together with Russia is looking to colonize its own territory. So that Armenia kind of controlling internationally recognized Azerbaijani territory is seen as, as actually being a Russian plot to take over the region. So this is where it becomes very hard to see any compromise where the other side is not given any agency and is only presented as a kind of small angry group that's out there to massacre you with the help of a bigger empire. Mm -hmm. so, so these narratives, I mean, uh, were uh, extremely politicized from, from the point of view of power after, after independence, uh, but they also seem to resonate or maybe result, I'm, I'm not sure you, you, you tell me, in uh, the, the popular narratives, like they really seem to have taken hold. I mean, I remember vividly from, from the dialogue group that, uh, that we did together, um, how, um, how existential it, it was for the people, the, this conflict, how it defined their lives. Um, and became really part of part of their personal identity. So I'm, I'm wondering how how really memory um, enters in, in within this conflict. How how much it plays a role. And especially yesterday, we talked a lot about the concept of trauma, uh, whether psychological, personal trauma, or, or, or cultural uh, trauma. It seems that every single person has carries some some sort of personal trauma and is, is directly part of the, the collective trauma. So how, how do these narratives um, coalesce or, or actually um, are built against each other? Uh, indeed. So there is a lot of uh, violence uh, that was present in this region. Uh, the Armenian population is most of them are descendants of the uh, at least a very big part is descendants of the Armenian genocide survivors uh, in of early 20th century. So there are a lot of family stories connected to genocide uh, in Ottoman Turkey. And because Azerbaijanis and Turks um, speak the same language, but also because there were some massacres um, during uh, that wars of uh, over Nagorno-Karabakh and so on in uh, late uh, sorry, early 20th century, yeah, almost every Armenian has a personal story connected to violence either at the hands of Turks uh, or Azerbaijanis or jointly. Uh, and that's, yeah, it's a certainly it's not only textbooks, but also there is family stories that connect, uh, yeah, uh, that, that legitimize, let's say, the textbook narratives. Azerbaijan in turn uh, has its own uh, trauma story. So there have been massacres of Azerbaijanis at the hands of uh, Bolshevik troops uh, or Armenian uh, nationalist uh, groups uh, or uh, joint ones. Uh, there was a massacre in uh, Baku uh, of Muslim population uh, in early 20th century perpetuated jointly by Bolsheviks and uh, Armenian nationalist groups. So they also have uh, uh, their own trauma. Plus, uh, since Armenians won the war in 1990s, most of the uh, deaths happened on the Azerbaijani side. And uh, even though early uh, violence against civilian population was against Armenians, the biggest uh, violence, uh, violent incidents occurred by Armenians against Azerbaijanis uh, in 1990s. So this is recent population, plus the war ended in uh, hundreds of thousands of Azerbaijanis being displaced, including from Nagorno-Karabakh and surrounding territories. Uh, and that's about 10% of Azerbaijan's total population. So then they moved and resettled in other cities of Azerbaijan. So essentially there you also have the massive uh, trauma of yeah, recent violence and uh, a huge number of displaced people uh, who were clearly victimized by present-day living Armenians. So essentially personal stories, personal what people saw personally did, did corroborate um, the narratives promoted through textbooks. Of course, the issue is, again, there was no license necessarily in these narratives. The problem was that very narrow interpretation and the selective interpretation where you were only aware of the violence committed towards you and absolutely not aware of violence committed by you towards the others. Uh, or even if you knew of that, it was justified as a incident done in response. So of course they 
massacred us for centuries. So in one or two instances, when we had to fight back, maybe we also committed something. Yeah, so this is the way really uh, any, um, uh, any violence committed by your own side has been downplayed. And it fits very nearly yeah, with this one dish uh, ideological framework, uh, ideological uh, square rather, when he talks how we construct narratives where uh, we don't say lies, we simply upplay the uh, negatives of the other side and downplay uh, anything uh, critical, you know, anything we've done that is problematic. So but both sides doing this consistently, both in their personal stories, but also uh, through their textbooks uh, and movies and essentially the whole cultural production uh, continually did create this very existential threat image of each other, which made it practically impossible for any government to uh, compromise. And you have here this a very vicious cycle where on one hand, the governments perpetuate this themselves. So they, in both Armenia and Azerbaijan have centralized education systems where there are education ministries that uh, pretty much uh, dictate the content of the textbooks and the way they have to be taught. Yeah, so they create these narratives on the state level. Uh, and they, for example, also invest heavily into patriotic movies uh, that they are produced and this is on the popular level. Uh, people uh, watch and consume, uh, political speeches are similar. Uh, and then, so the population yeah, accepts this. And then when there is a need to compromise on the negotiation uh, table, it's impossible because the population really sees the other one as an existential threat. But I'll go even a step further. I wouldn't say that the governments are necessarily only the producers of these narratives. They are also a product of them, particularly the popular or democratic government, such as the current Armenian one, they again also consume this. There are also people who grew up consuming these narratives. So they probably also believe these narratives as much as anybody else. So it wasn't only uh, impossibility on popular demand that stopped them from uh, compromising, uh, but also their own fears and existential threats that they see having been brought up in the same society. Yeah, so there is this vicious cycle of people emerging from mm -hmm. uh, problematic narratives and then reproducing them as they are in charge of a government. Yeah, but well, any <laughs> any traditional, I didn't want to say normal, but uh, any conflict resolution practitioner who was trained in the traditional way, going through mediation, negotiation, trainings, would uh, um, would essentially avoid these topics <laughs> with a ten foot pole, you know, not coming near them. We were we were trained that that's contentious, that's explosive. Focus on shared interests, uh, focus on the future. What do what do people and groups have in common, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, you have converted these themes that we were discussing, and and especially the narratives of the conflict and. Uh, personal traumas and cultural traumas into a conflict resolution method, which is uh, which you've been using for a number of years. So, how how can this how can this be done? And and before you answer, I forgot to remind people that you can um, yes, you can pose your questions at Slido at hashtag Herald. This is my level of technological skills, but also of course, and I see that there is there is a question already. And also on Zoom, of course, just by either raising your hand uh, or um, uh, posting a question in, into the chat. But tell us how you converted uh, this approach uh, into your into your work, in, into a, into a model for conflict transformation. Uh, thank you. Uh, indeed, as uh, I mentioned, it's not instead of geopolitics, right? I want to uh, stress that again, it's uh, in addition, uh, because again, in the cases where geopolitically there were openings, uh, we couldn't use them given the uh, amount of animosity uh, between the two sides, uh, primarily, I believe, uh, reproduced by these historical narratives, which is why I decided to make a shift at some point and focus heavily on trying to confront or change or transform these narratives because this, again, simply uh, we couldn't afford to uh, get another period where geopolitically the solution was possible and yet we weren't ready for them. Uh, so I started working with historical narratives. Uh, in, first of all, uh, with young people. Uh, so when people were coming to a dialogue, well, in the, the initial dialogues we, I led were not focusing on history. 
because I just saw it as many others as impossible to focus on that. Uh, but then gradually realized, uh, looking into collective memory theory especially, that, oh, if you look at this as a subjective, as not a historical truth, right, but as uh, something uh, reproduced in a, in a very politicized way through textbooks, through cultural production, then you could actually uh, have an impact on changing the way textbooks are written, changing the way um, cultural production uh, produces or reproduces the conflict. And working with uh, the young people uh, to try to transform their own approach to their own understanding of, of what history is. Uh, and with the hope that they will then go on and grow into leaders that will work on this. Uh, but I also engaged more directly with the textbook production, which is probably the at least the most institutional form of reproduction of these narratives. Uh, and since uh, about 2000, early 2000s, uh, first of all, I started, I reached out to colleagues in Azerbaijan and later in Turkey, also in Georgia, Russia, Ukraine, pretty much all neighborhood because I saw a lot of similarities in the way the textbooks were produced. Uh, most In most of these places, they were produced top down. Yeah, so it was a very state central narrative um, mandated by the ministries of education that then made its way into the schools. Uh, but also interestingly, in a very few cases where that wasn't the case or there were attempts to reform, it didn't change much because an example is Georgia that had its own uh, nonviolent revolution in 2003 called Rose Revolution, uh, where a new reformist government came to power and they did all the right things initially, at least on paper. So they abolished this state imposed uh, narrative idea. They abolished state written textbook idea altogether you could have multiplicity of textbooks, anybody could write a textbook. And as long as it passed criteria, which were great. So there should be no xenophobia. Yes, there should be uh, you know, no enemy image production. There should be multi-perspectivity. There were some really, really good criteria put in place. Um, so anybody could write this textbook, any teacher or rather any school could choose its own textbooks. Yeah, you could have this diversity of perspectives and it failed pretty miserably on its own because A, the, historians are ready to write these new textbooks. Uh, and even when they were maybe in one or two cases, the teachers weren't ready to teach on these textbooks because they were trained for decades to be told by state, what's the narrative, what's the outcome, yeah, so, and it was presented as to the students that this is the lesson, this is the truth, and then they were checked on their memorization. So thousands and thousands of teachers trained in this methodology simply were not able to just make this jump to multi-perspectivity or yeah, a place of multiple textbooks and multiple narratives. So considering all of that, we decided to take the slower road and work on A, criticizing the textbooks, understanding where the problems exactly are. Uh, also, not only textbooks, but the production of textbooks process, the politics of textbook production, and then developing new textbooks uh, and then training uh, teachers or at least producing materials for training teachers. So when there is a political opening, we could, uh, we, will, we are more ready than Georgians were, uh, you know, when they had their political opening. So we produced a lot of works in 2000, early 2010s, uh, criticizing each of these textbooks and they were very similar. Uh, they were all talking about that very expected in a way, uh, narrative of uh, primarily victim nation, victimized by the neighbors and who was always fighting for its independence even when we were not aware of our national identity. Yeah, so this ethnogenesis uh, thesis was very heavy, which was uh, very central to the Soviet um, historiography that all of us, uh, all of the nations were born in antiquity. They just gained national consciousness later, right? Through different periods of time, there was constant national liberation struggle against some kind of a uh, enemy which could be changing names, but kind of keeps its form and it's some kind of colonial uh, power, and it eventually results in national liberation. Uh, and within that, there are necessarily these enemies, which tend to be the neighbors, including the current neighbors, who are presented in an exclusively very violent and very dehumanizing terms. Uh, so this is one, yeah, uh, that we saw consistently in a textbook after textbook, country after country. Uh, methodologically, it was very similar. It's one voice tells this as a truth. So you read this as a one story that is absolutely true. Uh, you cannot question it. 
it's almost seen as desecration of uh, your identity to even question anything in that narrative is just told by this very authoritative voice. Um, all the exams, all the questions, yeah, all the students do essentially memorize and just make sure that they understood and memorized and can repeat uh, item by item all the key uh, parts uh, from the story, which tends to be very violent as well. And usually violence is done against you unless there is a glory story of you fighting back, right? So it's very, it's a story of a war, constant war, essentially. Uh, and so on. So there are like a number of uh, yeah, problematic things. Again, very one line, uh, very authoritative one voice perspective. Uh, then we saw that they are mostly again mandated by uh, the states through the education ministries who give very little legal room to the authors to write anything. Essentially, most of the uh, learning outcomes really dictate how almost event by event or the way they should be written. So after criticizing this and seeing how similar they are uh, structurally uh, and how uh, harsh they are in terms of producing enemy image, uh, a lot of times crossing into very, very unacceptable territories so, such as a lot of epithets, a lot of adjectives, such as bloodthirsty, violent, uh, vile, and so on. So you have a lot of epithets like this towards each other in the textbooks, in addition to the story itself, yeah. We went on um, doing a lot of teacher trainings and working with teachers uh, to start producing alternatives, not only in terms of content, but in terms of also how the textbooks are written, such as uh, that should be multi-perspectivity. If there is a lesson about recent past, you don't only give the student five different sources that can contradict each other, but you also tell the student, ask the students to produce their own narrative by interviewing, for example, their family, right? So they also change uh, who is the producer of a textbook. So we try to incorporate a lot of yeah, what we know well from collective memory studies and uh, critical historiography approaches to this new alternative textbooks in a way waiting for an opening or political opening in one or two places. Uh, we piloted them in schools uh, a lot of time in many countries, uh, but overall we're working on this production of critique and alternative materials and training and kind of expanding the circle of people uh, who will be able to enact a reform. And then comes the Velvet Revolution in Armenia that we mentioned a couple of times in 2018 where not only we have a new and young government, but interestingly, a lot of authors of these alternative textbooks, a lot of people who were very closely involved or even leading the processes I was describing, uh, ended up in the government or in the parliament uh, of Armenia specifically. So we thought, okay, good opening to potentially uh, enact at least some of these changes. Uh, and they tried, they immediate, almost immediately attempted to make many reforms, including his, education reform across the board, uh, but history education uh, specifically, and that failed spectacularly as well, uh, where once there were even attempts to make one or two small changes in history education, such as talk about multi-perspectivity or removing this extreme production of enemy image, uh, received a very harsh reaction initially by the for, uh, authors of the previous textbooks, the ones who were writing these more nationalist yeah, textbooks mandated by the state who felt threatened, that's understandable. But that also caught up and solicited immediate, very popular support because the population is also used to these yeah, narratives, nationalist narratives. Um, so that kind of, the reaction was very immediate once any attempt was made. And uh, those people who were, again, wrote all these alternative textbooks and, went through many trainings and led many trainings, and now were in the government, found themselves almost immediately in a defensive position to try to justify themselves. They started downplaying all their work they've done over a decade or more in the past, and gradually shifted themselves towards trying to prove that they are more nationalist than mm -hmm. those who are <laughs> criticizing them for being not nationalist enough. Uh, and then there was a war that the whole thing collapsed in a uh, on its own just recently, but even prior to the war, uh, there was very little hope that anything can happen because again, the kind of the structure of nationalist historiography turned to be much stronger than even literally the authors of alternative textbooks coming to power could uh, implement. That, that sounds <laughs> quite hope, hopeless. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I still have uh, want to highlight the uniqueness of, of the 
uh, of the dialogue approach that you, I know you have done with uh, several generations of students, several generations of teachers and uh, me media, um, uh, the journalists, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which really works the hard way um, uh, through conflicting narratives of, of the past, uh, through individual people's memory, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I know you've written about it uh, way back when we wrote a chapter about it, but I'm sure it has evolved since then. Uh, again, something that I highly, highly, highly recommend to anyone working in a, a context of conflicts of identities. I'm super aware of time. Uh, so before I will ask you uh, the last question about what can be done and whether there's any hope, uh, for Armenia Azerbaijan uh, peace beyond the cold uh, cold peace or cold truce. Uh, we have a question on, on Turkey and that's potentially another large question uh, from Slido, um, uh, which is asking whether uh, uh, Turkey is more regionally uh, oriented, um, involved in conflicts in Syria and Co uh, Caucasus uh, because it was rejected by the European Union and what's, uh, what is the role of Eastern partnership? I'm tempted to expand it to like Turkey's own politics of memory, but that would be for another separate one hour long talk. Also, yeah, complex question. Uh, and so short answer will be certainly. So Turkey uh, in early to, in two, throughout 2000s and early 2010s when the European Union membership was on the table uh, was a much more constructive actor than it is now in all that neighborhood. Uh, and um, yeah, whatever the politics of rejection of Turkey, whether it was qualified or not, I'll leave aside. But uh, the really that, yeah, the loss, losing the chance to uh, uh, pr pr progress on the European Union accession did uh, certainly not serve our region at all. Uh, because again, this European Union accession period uh, had major uh, reforms, so major reforms in Turkey from judicial to uh, things like education. Uh, that uh, there was pretty open. There was a lot of civil society, a very active civil society emerging. There was a very active and very independent uh, education uh, scene emerging. And for example, the topic of Armenian genocide went from being a complete taboo and criminalized um, until the Erdogan came to power to becoming a very normalized uh, in uh, like mid 2010s, at least early 2010s, mid 2010s, because there was so much openness of civil society and academia and freedom of, freedom of speech. Yes, all facilitated by European Union accession. So once that failed, I completely agree with the question. Uh, Turkey went in a very different direction kind of having losing, lost this motivation and institutional support for democratization. Uh, it went in opposite direction, even on this topic. Yeah, so now it's dangerous again to speak about Armenian genocide, for example, you cannot hold open commemorations anymore, which was norm for over a decade at some point. And, but that applies to every other uh, topic as well, including a chance for history education reform, which is, I was talking about Armenia, but there was a long period where it looked much more realistic in Turkey. Uh, and Turkey had much bigger, um, uh, let's say intellectual, professional, academic scene that was able to potentially move this forward if it was politically possible. So yeah, Turkey did shift from a, relatively constructive to uh, a rather problematic actor in the whole neighborhood. Uh, we all know about Syria, but from now on also in the South Caucasus, where for the first time it openly supported uh, one of the conflict parties and essentially entered the war almost directly uh, in, with its support um, of Azerbaijan. It sounds like there was some form of compromise between Russia and Turkey to pretty much push out together the United States and European Union from the region. This is so European um, Eastern Partnership was not strong enough instrument in a way, couldn't really achieve all that much. And now we have one of the results of this recent war was that Russia and Turkey have much stronger influence over the whole region and will have be the main external players uh, with United States, but also European Union and Eastern Partnership roles being greatly reduced. So that's one of the uh, outcomes. And that does bring me though to this question of what uh, could be done, because I think one conclusion I'm getting to is that civil society efforts are important, but on their own, they are not enough. And we have an 
uh, challenge overall in peace building world that the official negotiations very rarely, uh, if ever, include the focus on history and uh, textbooks and narratives. Yeah, so they are focused on issues such as borders and pipelines and population exchanges, and you know, kind of hard topics, uh, and reparations and so on. But we don't. So, you know, at least I'm not aware of uh, of many peace processes that uh, do take history. Uh, and history education reform and narrative reform essentially into uh, or make them as key topic of negotiations and they should be because again even extensive efforts uh, we see after country after country led only by the civil society continually hit uh, yeah, the problem of um, essentially state resistance and state in turn popular resistance of enacted reform we saw this in Greece we saw this in many other you know Israel Palestine and many other countries where even the serious attempts by government to reform the education hit popular resistance. Um, so we need to, so another, my next chapter, I guess, of advocacy will be of trying to include uh, history reform uh, into and work with narratives overall into the official negotiation process because it's simply they will continue to fail unless the populations are more self-critical and ready to see the other side as anything. Well, else than just a person mm -hmm. or people interested in massacring you. That's that's a high calling <laughs> for for any any uh, representation. Um, I'm aware that we we are out of time, but uh, still, if there are any uh, questions or inputs from from the Zoom audience, feel free uh, to jump in at least with some small final question for Phil. Um, before we conclude and um, and uh, jump to the final roundtable of, of our conference. Okay. In, um, in that case, Phil, thank you very much. I feel like we should have scheduled uh, a lot more time because there's a number of questions I wanted to ask and simply did not get to. But again, um, I highly recommend looking at Phil's um, book on, uh, on conflict resolution. Um, uh, we can post it uh, in, in the chat later on or under YouTube. And thank you very much. I wish you good luck. Um, I feel like being a businessman was a much easier profession. <laughs> and uh, thank you for everything that you have done. I mean, from my own experience, I, I know that this was one of the most important uh, schools in conflict resolution that I could have gone through, going through the uh, dialogue uh, sessions, the Armenian Azerbaijani group. So thank you very much. Good luck to you and to the imagined uh, uh, Center for Conflict Transformation. Thank you. It will be needed. Thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate the chance. Thank you. And I think we'll take a 10 minute break. Yes. And come back shortly, a few minutes after uh, six to resume the final round table. Thank you very much.
Hello and welcome again to the final session of, of our seventh annual Liberal Herald Conference uh, titled Stories, Histories, uh, Memories. And uh, the final point on our program uh, is the roundtable on the politics of memory uh, in the era of the rise of authoritarian populism around the world. Um, first, I, mean, I think you see all of the speakers, uh, right? Yes, on, on the screen. Um, so I would like to welcome our speakers. We are still waiting, or oh, there's Udi. So the final speaker has, is joining us, Udi Ayran from, hello Udi, just on time, perfect timing. And uh, essentially I will take the liberty of introducing you uh, to, to the audience. Um, I think I will do it in the order as I see you on the screen, not, not to discriminate anyone. And then just to explain the format that we're experimenting with, we have a series of propositions that we formulated together with James Griffith, my co-facilitator uh, for the panelists. And uh, we, will, uh, we will essentially pose them to the panel and uh, the panel will tackle them agree, disagree, <laughs> whatever. Um, I think what's, uh, what's really special about this panel and um, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, be, to, to have a full disclosure, once again, I know all of the panelists uh, really well from all kinds of walks of life, whether, whether from International Center for Conciliation, from my previous life in, in Boston, uh, life before this one, and uh, from Muslim Jewish Conference, which we have been doing for 10 years uh, in a row, which had, uh, was one of the most unique events, I think uh, you will agree, um, that brought people together from all over the world and uh, was really a unique experience for the people. Or uh, Robert, who has been a veteran of uh, the Liberal Herald for a number of years and has been cooperating with us from, from CEU or from Stellenbosch University in, in, in South Africa. So uh, these are kind of um, academic uh, slash professional connections that resulted in this panel. And what's also unique is that we have uh, really, um, uh, we are covering several continents just, just through the participants on this level um, from Tunisia, to uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, to Pakistan, Brazil, United States uh, slash Israel, um, and uh, Hungary, uh, Hungary, Budapest. So I'm very happy that you could be here, here with us. It was not an easy feat to, to organize. And uh, without further ado, let me introduce uh, Huda Mziudet. Do I say your last name correctly? Um, from uh, Tunisia, Mzuda, uh, Mzuda Huda is a co consultant for the Arab uh, Reform Initiative. And I know about Huda that she has been very active uh, from the beginnings of the Truth and Dignity Commission, which was being established in, in Tunisia after the Arab Spring. And uh, uh, she focuses on North African affairs, especially Libya and Tunisia. She is in Canada now, a resident of, of Canada, but has lived in Tunisia and, and Libya uh, beforehand. And um, she, she is uh, posted at the University of Toronto, focuses on research on post-authoritarian uh, transitional justice, democratization, minorities, and the nexus between, uh, uh, between jihadist movements and broader socioeconomic dynamics in North Africa. Um, she's publishing with Brookings Institu uh, Institution and Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, she's also a journalist um, and working on a book chapter. <laughs> so welcome, Huda. Thank you. Thank you, Dagmar. Thank you for the nice uh, yeah. Uh, next, we have Robert Schatta, who's a research fellow with the Political Science Department at Central Uni uh, uh, European University in, in Budapest, in Hungary. And I know he also lived in Japan uh, for two years and focuses on uh, research of ethnic relations, minority rights, uh, Roma rights, as, as well in, in Central Eastern Europe, politics of identity, uh, populism, uh, political discourse. He also tortures students with 
research methodology, uh, uh, public spheres, gender politics, discrimination in, in general. And he is the recent editor of uh, Migration and, and uh, Border Making, Reshaping Policies and Identities, it was published with Edinburgh University Press. Welcome. Thank you. Looking forward. Um, Emery Kalema is joining us from Stellenbosch University, uh, South Africa, where um, he, he is a postdoctoral fellow at the uh, Chair in Historical Trauma and Transformation at Stellenbosch University. But Emery comes from Democratic Republic of Congo, which is also the subject uh, of his research, and is especially the uh, very violent Mulele rebellion and the traumatic memories um, of, of that event. He's also currently uh, working on a book, on uh, Violence and Memory, the Mulala Rebellion in Postcolonial Congo. And he's been researching the uh, narratives of trauma and the, the, their physical representations, kind of the, the embodiment or the, the, uh, the physical scars uh, that are result, uh, that result of violence and how they connect to identities and conflict narratives uh, today. Welcome, Emery. Thanks, Dagmar. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, we have next, at least on my screen, is Fad Humayun, whom uh, actually I, I remember a story when when I told you I visited uh, I visited a, uh, the the tomb of the Humayun tomb in New Delhi. Uh, Fad has told me that it was some relatives of his back in the line. <laughs> no which I was very impressed. Uh, anyway, that's what I will remember. That's how I will remember it. And he's a PhD candidate at uh, Yale University, um, where he studies the relationship between democratic institutions and regime behavior and foreign policy. He's from Islamabad, Pakistan, and I think you're in Pakistan right now. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's and uh, has spent several years working on issues of uh, track to diplomacy, um, between India and Pakistan and other regional peace initiatives. I also know about Fad that he was working on, on the narratives of partition between mm. in India and, and, and Pakistan. Um, uh, there was a fascinating initiative in both India and, and Pakistan around this. And you can often uh, read him in foreign policy or uh, Al Jazeera uh, and other lucrative uh, outlets. Welcome, Fad. Thank you. Thank you. And hello, Carla. Carla is joining us from Rio de Janeiro. Um, she is a history teacher, um, and she's also working on, on her doctorate um, at the uh, University of Rio de Janeiro. And I know her parents hail from Egypt. Uh, they came in 1950s to, to Brazil. Um, and uh, she has a master's degree in, in history. She teaches history. Um, and she was or is involved in a unique uh, project teaching teenagers about Holocaust and um, about Israeli uh, identity and, and issues in, in Brazil. So, so, yeah. Welcome, yeah. Carla. Hi. And last but not least, um, we have Udi Ayran, who's, uh, um, uh, who's an associate professor at the University of Haifa but he, he's all over the world as well. Uh, uh, currently uh, also um, visiting scholar at uh, University of Stanford. He's been uh, at Harvard Law School, uh, Kennedy School of Government, um, MIT, um, et cetera. He has founded Center for National Security at University of Haifa and uh, Security is also one of the topics of, of his research, um, uh, especially maritime security, but also conflict transformation, conflict resolution. Very accomplished writer. He has published more than 50 articles and two books. And actually, I have one of them here, which I find really excellent, the uh, post-colonial settlement strategy. So Huda was asking if, if you can do a bit of self-promotions. I'll do it for you. Uh, and I, I have to tell you that I'm, I've been using this book in, um, in my classes to show my students what a literature review should look like. So, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, but it's an excellent book, which I, I find very important uh, because it is look, uh, looking at settlements in a post-colonial 
context um, in, in Morocco, Israel, and Indonesia. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, again, highly recommend it. So, I mean, apologies for taking so long with the introductions, but we do have the, the luxury of, of having really exciting people with us. So I, I wanted to give you a plastic picture of, of who's sitting um, against you in, on your screen. <laughs> And so, as I explained, we have a series of propositions that we send um, to our guests uh, beforehand that uh, concern politics of memory in the, in the era of, of crisis of globalization and, and rise of uh, populist authoritarianism. It's a challenging task because we're covering a lot of ground and it's, it's a contentious topic. But I will ask James to introduce the, the first one. Thanks, Dagmar. Uh, Huda, you, you wanted to say something, you asked to say something for about five minutes, um, and this seemed like as good a time as any uh, before we launch okay. into it. Sure, it's just my presentation about, um, you know, what I wanted to talk about memory and polit uh, politics of memory and history. So I think it's a response to the first proposition. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. All right, great. Well, then we'll start with you. I'll just read the question uh, for the uh, for the audience who hasn't seen them ahead of time. Um, so over the last decade and a bit more, we have seen a significant rise in authoritarian populism and democratic backsliding, decline in, a decline in the quality of democracy in enough countries to speak of a global trend. Trust in authorities and institutions is declining, freedoms diminishing, perception of corruption increasing, and so on. Memory has been a most useful tool for the populist leaders not only to retell the past, but as much to shape the present and the future. The trend towards increased manipulation of memory in political use in countries like the US or UK or France has, uh, has also reverberated in other countries. Manipulated memory has been one of the drivers of authoritarian populism and democratic decline. So I will step back now and let you have at it. Thank you, James. Thank you, Dagmar, and thanks everyone for uh, being on this um, um, exciting, you know, um, uh, roundtable on the politics of memory. Um, just, you know, I'm going to read, you know, something that I scribbled this morning because I felt kind of um, inspired by uh, the uh, by the panelists yesterday. So, I'll start with memory as a history takes me back to December 2010 when I was frenetically tweeting and mess message Facebook and my friends abroad about Tunisia making history. Then the journey began with my change in my life to become a journalist converted a researcher in the Arab uprising, mainly covering Tunisia and Libya. As a nomad, immigrant and researcher, constantly searching for a place I can feel home, Canada uh, has become my final destination in my long journey to be, a perm uh, to be my permanent settlement. Living in one of the most multicultural and diverse cities in the world, Toronto, I realize how globalization in the world um, uh, is affecting human movement and settlement. Um, for a country like Canada, which has, uh, which is, um, which has, which is a young nation that is still struggling with its, uh, uh, with different identities there. Um, rewind to 2016. This is an, again when history was made in Tunisia uh, with the Truth and Dignity Commission that Dagmar has talked about earlier on, where the politics of memory was at play and were uh, was confronted by the counter-revolutionary forces in Tunisia and where the issues of denial, cultural memory, and traumas and temporality were at stake there. Um, my work on t the transitional justice was focusing on Black Tunisian activism. Uh, it was a very therapeutic yet painful exercise for me, being at the crossroad of research, journalism, and activism, trying to reinvent, rediscover, and rewrite the untold, repressed, buried, and forgotten stories of Black Tunisians. Fast forward to June 2020, amidst a world pandemic, George Floyd's symbolic death reignited the Black Lives Matter, reaching the young Tunisian democracy in its shaky transition. Uh, at the time, the uh, civil society organization have been steering the move from authoritarian regime to a democratic regime, notwithstanding the challenge of populism around the world, whose narrative of trying to keep the status quo of what history should be like. It led to a confrontation between different competing narratives, each claiming legitimacy. But in the work of Gayatri Spiva, can the subaltern speak, Black Tunisians as well as other minorities, including the Amazigh, the Jews, the LGBTQI populations found in this atmosphere of political freedom, a way to come out and reclaim their controversial, complex, and highly politicized identities. Um, as someone who 
who, who try to um, try to understand, you know, how these computer narratives, you know, are, are at stake. You know, I chose also to be to be focusing on a country like Libya, where things, you know, are um, are much more complex. And there was especially when um, uh, when the country has met a very tragic fate of um, a failed humanitarian intervention, in which um, uh, in which um, uh, the country, you know, slid into um, a an, an autocratic you know type of regime with different you know um, conflicting actors trying to uh, divide for power there uh, memories in north africa uh, as a political tool is trying to decolonize itself to liberate itself from the burden of a past that imposed a homogenized uniform and um, version of memory and impose a sense of conformity to a more politically correct collective memory. Memory for me is some kind of compartmentalized in a few nice boxes. Sometimes we can imagine them as Russian dolls, each having its own narrative stories, histories to disclose themselves to the world. Like a cassette recorder, we use it to fast forward and rewind some of the highlights of our lived experiences that usually have a lasting impact on our memory. Uh, and just to take um, uh, advantage of uh, this uh, short, you know, um, of, 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 the, of this five minutes of talk, I will um, uh, just send you know a, a, um, a to, to do like a little promotion for a, a book chapter that I'm co-authoring on the Black Tunisian activism and uh, transitional justice with a few other uh, researchers, uh, and it's this book will um, um, uh, includes you know you know uh, transitional justice you know. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, academics, uh, but also people who have been working on countries like South Africa, uh, also um, um, Morocco, Argentina, and when it comes to transitional justice reform and uh, other, um, and how these countries from authoritarian regimes were, were trying to, um, uh, to, uh, to return to some kind of um, a democratic, you know, um, um, uh, democratic uh, uh, reform. Um, so uh, I probably will share, share it on the, on the chat because I'm not sure if I can do that, but um, so this is um, just um, an idea, but I can also share them. It's actually a, um, um, what I had, it's a policy brief about, you know, the, the book chapter that will be, hopefully will be published, not sure, but maybe probably this year, next year, but um, let me just really quickly do this, trying to share. I don't want to take um, other people's time, but that's it. Okay. So there you go. Can you see them? So that's that's basically what um, what I'm working on right now. How the politics of memory actually is at work when it comes to Tunisia as a as a country that is transitioning from an autocratic regime to a democratic uh, um, country, and how the uh, the Truth and Dignity Commission has been. To, uh, has been trying to to play a very pivotal role in uh, in uh, in unearthing all these repressed memories, especially from the dictatorship of Ben Ali and Bourguiba, and how also the uh, the Truth and Dignity Commission has failed this job, unfortunately, because of the forces of counter revolutionary for uh, in Tunisia. So that's basically what I wanted to uh, for you to you know to to get an idea about the the whole uh, topic of uh, politics of memory in Tunisia. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, Huda. And um, um, I, I feel it or see it as, as closely connected to this whole era of um, globalization crisis. I mean, the entire uh, Arab Spring and the processes afterwards are in, in a way like, counter paralleled by the rise of authoritarian populism and the kind of pushback against decolonization movements we see it in the United States. Uh, South Africa, all, all over, all over the world. So the two seem to be closely connected. But it is not, not my space or time to talk. So <laughs> so we can uh, open this up to others, or uh, in my list when we had uh, been thinking about an order, uh, an imposed order. I think uh, we had Carla, if you wanted to start first, but um, yeah. Hi, how are you? So I'm speaking to you from Brazil and here the question of uh, memory is by far the main concern that lead us to basically relieve the same type of authoritarian government I think it's very important to 
noticed that in Brazil, we actually had most of our history made of authoritarian governments. We had very short periods of an actual democracy where the people were involved. I mean, the country was colonized for something about 500 years. And we have a very particular history that our independence was made by the government of Portugal. We, we were still governed by the country who were actually exploring Brazil. Um, and we also were one of the few countries that remained a uh, monarchy after its independence. We kept slavery. We basically kept the same rhythm. And even when Brazil became a republic by the end of the 19th century, it was a very elitist republic. Only white, free, uh, elitist men who had like a sort of amount of money could actually participate in politics. And this went on until the 1930s, when we had an authoritarian government, when we had our first declared dictatorship that went on for another 15 years. So we basically had a few democratic time between 1945 and 1964. We had about 20 years of a democratic government. And then we had another very, very hard dictatorship for another 20 years. And when this one felt, we again had a short time of uh, democratic government. What I intend to say is like the majority of the people in Brazil were always apart from the political process. I think one very effective tool that the government usually uses is to not provide people with proper education. So we have like a, a really huge part of the population who doesn't have access to any education at all. And another part who has access to a very poor education. And what brings us to leave the same type of authoritarian government again and it's important to say with the support of the people, it's with, with part of the people, of course, not everyone, I believe is the fact that um, people don't usually have a true comprehension of our history, of what we lived before. And this is very easily manipulated by the government. So we always have, if, you, if we analyze the dictatorship in the 30s and in the 60s and a lot of what is going on now, a lot is the same, like praising a past where you have like a traditional government where you didn't have um, robberies, where you didn't have corruption. So the discourse is about the same. And people tend to not recall things as persecution, murder, oppression, and actually a lot of economic problems that these governments created for Brazil. It's uh, a lot of people nowadays are claiming to the military to come back to power. And it's pretty unbelievable when you understand about history because it wasn't only about the oppression to the opposition, but it was also economic troubles that it brought to Brazil. Like our amazing international debt were actually created during this period. So I guess by this historical past where the government actually were made of small elites. And this is like a very long past that I'm talking about. And the majority of the population who doesn't have access to a proper study of history and doesn't have a lot of access to, to memory, actually, uh, once every 20 years, we end up in sort of the same place. Of course, it's not the same place, but it's a place very much alike. And I guess this is completely connected to our lack of connection from the main population to our memory that actually happened. And I'm sure that under Bolsonaro's government, uh, this, this has not died down. This trend has not died down, but was rather encouraged and drummed up from, from, the, from the top. It's, it's really surreal to, to actually watch people supporting him and believing in the things that he and his government say. It, it shows like how unconnected to our history people actually is. 
And the, the, those are the people praising to a dictatorship to be back actually. And it makes us, I think sometimes as a history teacher, we never believe we're gonna leave the things we study. And then you, you do and you watch the processes happening. And it's, yeah, you're, we are here and still pretty unbelievable. The Bolsonaro's government has a particular point that I think it's very important to, to say that he was elected based on fake news. He was elected by a campaign made through WhatsApp groups and Facebook and literally almost nothing was based on real facts and people still believed in it. So it's, it's a me memory historical issue for sure. That sounds familiar. <laughs> Entirely too familiar, <laughs> given the recent US election. Um, okay, did, um, I didn't want to step in, but uh, did others want to um, step in themselves? Um, there's, there's a direct connection to <laughs> actually all of the countries, but um, looking at the US slash Israel or, or Hungary, I mean, you have your own Bolsonaros in, in a way. <laughs> Hopefully one on the way out, but who knows? So. Well, I can say, you know, that in the US, you know, things are are going to be extremely tough, you know, to uh, dislodge someone like Donald Trump, unfortunately, because uh, this is something that I guess never happened in American history that you have someone who never concedes defeat like, you know, Trump. So it's, we're all holding our breaths, you know, especially here in Canada, I will feel like, you know, the heat, you know, is very, you know. Stirring. You will get the refugees. <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh, we're gonna build a wall, I guess. <laughs> but, um. I mean, yeah, talking about populists, yeah, I mean, I think that the wave has swept the world, I, I guess, not in, probably in the last decade. I mean, I think in, when in Tunisia, for instance, you know, we had our populist, you know, before the revolution, after the revolution, the current Tunisian president is considered as an intellectual populist, you know, someone who was, uh, who came out, you know, out of the middle of nowhere, uh, a constitutional uh, uh, professor of a constitutional law professor who was, uh, who used populist, you know, discourse, of course, not as aggressive as, for example, you know, Orban or, or Bolsonaro or Donald Trump, but um, it's in the, yeah, it's part of how democratic transition sometimes, you know, faces all these hurdles to become, you know, kind of, um, you know, to, 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 to you know, uh, to materialize and, and uh, build something strong because, you know, the economy is not doing well, the pandemic had, had made things worse. So it's not quite a gloomy, I mean, quite a, a nice uh, picture of what's going on, I guess, in, across the world right now, with this, uh, this wave of populism. Yes, Udi? Yeah, I'll just add, as you brought up the Israeli case, I'll just say maybe yeah. a few words about the connection between the two. So Israel did start as a democracy, though not necessarily as a liberal democracy in the late 1940s. It currently faces a number of challenges. So there is, as you hinted, a leader that's already in place 11 years and has adopted a lot of Donald Trump's uh, perspective of attacks on institutions, in part because he himself is being persecuted for uh, corruption. And his solution is to attack the institutions instead of dealing with the actual accusations. Israel's ongoing occupation in the West Bank also means that if this is not resolved, uh, uh, it will it will deteriorate to not not a democratic state. Um, and if I try to think about it from perspective of memory, I, maybe I have two points. One is the uh, uh, different lengths of memory. Um, Israel operates on a two level of memory. On one level, it's a relatively young state created in 1948. Uh, but it, the majority group, the majority ethnic group, Jewish people have a 2000 years memory. Uh, and one way to think of the internal tension in the country is between the, the interpretations of these two periods, a modern nation state that was created in the 1940s and has a large non-Jewish minority, separate from your occupation, 21% of Israel's citizens are Palestinian. Um, so you have a new memory of a state which had gone through different phases of its relationship with a, a minority and a much, much, much longer memory as a diasporic persecuted group um, culminating in the Holocaust, which is very recent and we still have among us, uh, even 2020, about 150,000 Holocaust survivors. Um, and so different political groups are taking, drawing their memories from these different uh, uh, links uh, and lessons. And, and fortunate or unfortunate, the Jewish history is much longer than Israeli history. So it's much easier to draw on memory of persecution 
and second class citizenship and so on than on the memory of a sovereign state. In fact, one way to think about it is we still don't have a true understanding of what sovereignty is after 2000 years of memories of being non-sovereign. The second being uh, interesting way to look at the, at the current tension, of course, it grows in the context of the Arab-Israeli conflict, which itself at its heart between Israelis and Palestinians is a clash between two traumas. Israeli Jews are still driven by the mem memories of the Holocaust and multiple wars uh, with our Arab neighbors. And the Palestinians are driven by the Nakba, the disaster, their loss in 1947-49, which led to the ejection of about 700,000 Palestinians. So each side feels morally superior because it relies on its own memories. Um, and so one interesting strategy is each side's attempt to erase the memory of the other. So there was a social movement in Israel said the Nakba wasn't so bad because many of these people, in fact, are Arabs who came from uh, uh, close by countries in the 19th century or in the early 20th century, which is partly true, but of course doesn't erase the pain of the people who had uh, to leave. Um, and on the Palestinian side, there's a, there was an effort at some point to deny the historical connections Jews had to the land, um, but disregarding even archaeology and so on. Um, so although this is a very physical battle uh, and conflict, it, it does rely on a long uh, a mountain, if you will, of memories, uh, reinterpreting your own memory and discounting the memory of the competing group. And I also feel that we have seen, I mean, Netanyahu was Netanyahu uh, uh, always, but um, it also seems like there has been a shift increasingly to the right in, in recent years and Trump administration probably helped that shift to some degree. Absolutely, I think he, Netanyahu became much more aggressive after he won some uh, somewhat unexpectedly elections in 2015. I think the legitimacy that Donald Trump gave uh, and other leaders uh, uh, of fake news, of attacking institutions, of arguments about the deep state that are copied from the US. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Emery? Uh, thanks, Dagmar, and thanks to, uh, uh, I mean, my, my colleagues who have spoken, uh, who have spoken previously. Um, so, um, yes, I, I know I'll speak about, I thought it was important to, uh, I mean, to some point, you know, based on the, um, the proposition that you, you, uh, you, 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 you sent us. Um, so it seems to me that we are dealing with, uh, I mean, yes, it's, it, it's a particular form of authoritarianism, which is populist, right? Um, so, um, and historically, if you, we, we, we go back in time, so it's, I mean, the literature is usually related to the 2008 crisis or even before that. So in the proposition, there's connection between that globalization and the decline of, you know, uh, the quality of, the, of, the, of democracy. I think these are very, very important. So now um, I think the question that this raises is uh, the difference between this form of, you know, authoritarianism and the more traditional one. Um, I think these are uh, quite important uh, things to, we should, we should be, uh, we should keep in mind. And then you connect the, all these with you know, issues of memory. So basically you are suggesting that there is a connection between uh, you know, uh, populist, uh, authorita populist authoritarianism and memory. They, because they usually rely, I mean, rely on memory, but it's not any kind of memory, it's a manipulated one. It is an altered form of memory. I think this is also uh, important as something to, to keep in mind. Now, um, what, what this raises as questions, especially uh, if, as I am concerned, is uh, if we, we, we say that you know, they rely on memory, so then what is specific about that memory? Because 
any institution, I mean, not only institution, but I mean, if you go back in time, uh, you know, in relation to uh, African history, so you will see that there's always these uh, lines of tradition, you know, tradition. So there are people who are in charge of those tradition and usually they, you know, interpret those tradition. It can also be manipulated for certain causes. So this raises an important question, which is what is specific about this connection? And also another set of questions, why people are, you know, why are they, you know, uh, getting a lot of, why these ideas are gaining traction among people? What is so specific about this? Now, if I have to link, I mean, uh, this suggestion and the, the, the DRC, how, I mean, my colleague from Brazil said that, uh, you know, from Tunisia, for, for example, that, I mean, it, it's been, uh, no, Tunisia, I can't remember, maybe Brazil, that, yes, Brazil, that uh, the country have experienced authoritarians for many, many, many years. And that's the case, you know, with the, the DRC as well. So, so in fact, we never had any, you know, democratic institution. I mean, government. We we came from, uh, you know, colonialism, a brutal one. To, uh, you know, Lumumba was killed, and then Mobutu came, and then Kabila. So we have that. And now, what what Kabila did, especially for in with regard to the last cycle of elections, so they were using history, a traumatic one to uh, you know, use that history so that they can at least uh, stay in power. So the idea was to say that, you know what, we are protecting you against, uh, let's say neo-colonialism because uh, that neo-colonialism is related to colonialism, the Belgium, they are going to steal uh, you know, the mineral, but if we succeed, we, 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 we win the election, we are going to protect you against those predators. So that's how history uh, has been used or mobilized or even manipulated, you know, so that the regime can stay in, in power. So at least that's uh, what I wanted to say with regard to, uh, you know, the DS, which reflect to, I mean, relate to uh, what uh, colleagues have said, uh, you know, with regard to other parts of the world. Yes, and, and you, you have had a, a re relatively recent election, right, with the new president stepping in, but, but it seems that um, despite any best intentions, the sp space uh, is quite limited, like with, with all of these ties to the past and uh, power relations with, within the country. Um, that his uh, his efforts uh, uh, towards democratization are quite limited in that sense, and, and part of the reason is um, is this heritage um, um, of politics of memory that is being used and that it operates in the background. Yes, exactly. Yes, that, that, that that's right. So uh, there's a really uh, a struggle. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know if maybe later on I'll get into those uh, you know dimensions where there's a fight between uh, I mean the people who want more justice, you know, with regard to the past, and him imposing some sort of amnesia, you know, collective amnesia that we have to move forward. We can't uh, dwell in the past. So that's his own politics of memory as well. Yeah. Can I just say something very quick? Because mm -hmm. I want to I wanna listen to my other colleagues. What she just said about like protecting the people, I, I see in this uh, populist authoritarian governments, they always bring us this huge enemy they have to protect us from. And I guess it's usually the same enemy for us in Brazil. It's always been the left. Like there's this amazing fear that it's going to come a leftist government, communist government, when we actually never had such a threat for real. 
And I would like to like listen to my colleagues from different countries, which is this enemy, because we know that's mm -hmm. one of the main tools those populist governors usually use to convince the people. And unfortunately, they do it. They convince the people. Can I just chime in again? Sure. By, with, with a follow up to Carla's, you know, uh, comment about, you know, well, exactly the same thing is happening right now in the US. I mean, Donald Trump, you know, his whole campaign is about this bogeyman that is uh, that is the left. And I've been, you know, uh, following the the um, the American elections big part of my uh, my class on the US political process. And and it's very depressing to see that a lot of um, Latino communities, especially in Florida, and also some Arab Christian communities in Michigan were rooting for Donald Trump and voting for him because he was seen as a savior from these uh, bogeyman who is the left. And usually they will bring, you know, someone like um, uh, Maduro and, uh, and Cuba's uh, Castro as, as being the enemy that could one day, you know, uh, take over, you know, the US. And, and sadly, a lot of people were taken in. I mean, I, at one time I thought, you know, Donald Trump will, will make it, you know, as president because of the whole propaganda machine that was behind him. And a lot of people, uh, unfortunately, you know, Around the world, I mean, uh, they, they, they were seeing in, in awe how 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 this whole um, this whole you know um, uh, uh, demonization of the left as the next enemy is is a, a is a, is a real threat you know to 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 democracy today. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I'm sure there's a there's a, a plenty of share of enemies in, in both Pakistan and, and Hungary. <laughs> uh, if I may. I mean, uh, Carla, I think you have an excellent point. And thinking about how populist or authoritarian uh, leaders would use uh, memory or, or, or the politics of memory, it, I, I actually was thinking the same, more or less. I would propose they, they use it uh, in a systematic way in, for attaining two different goals. And, and, and the first goal is exactly is what you mentioned that they construct these pictures of enemies, but at the same time, they also construct the pictures of the good people, right? The us. And I, I think the memory is important for both, right? So there's a general literature about this, that populists always look back to the past and pick some golden era, right? And in this golden era, everybody is somehow more happy. And this is the same idea as Trump is the let's make America great again, right? And this works. I mean, if you look at examples here in Europe, uh, I can speak of um, Hungary and Poland. After all, these are the two forerunners of uh, democratic backsliding, right? So we are, and I say we because I'm sitting here in Budapest, so Hungarians and Polish are, are now at the core of every EU debate, right? Where everything is questioned and memory is uh, I mean, really at the core of, of, of everything uh, populism is about and um, I believe there's also a secondary goal that they use memory for which might be actually less obvious yeah, and I would say this is the, their attempt to actually sell the politics that they do as politics as usual well, if you look at what they do exactly, and this has been mentioned by others, right? This is actually attack of democratic institution, deconstruction of all kinds of liberal rights, you know, attacking courts or independent institutions of the state. If you look at the economy, some would argue, right, this is a complete takeover of the uh, entire public sector in Hungary, others would claim even the private sector is overtaken by these people. So, and at the same time, I think memory is used actually to sell this radical politics as politics as usual, as nothing out of the ordinary, right? And I believe they can do this exactly because establishing this continuity with this whatever golden past there has been, they somehow build on, 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 on this historical continuity that they are serving national interest or the interest of the good people 
of course, this would resemble, I don't know, 19th century conservatism, right? So if you are a female that would like to work or God forbid you are a gay lesbian couple that would adopt a child, your chances are going to be basically zero because this doesn't comply with traditional forms of life or nativist views of the world. So I, I think, again, memory is at the core, and I'm not even sure whether we can, you know, speak of unbiased memories or unbiased historical uh, records. I mean, history has been always written by the winners, so to say, although Hungary is especially good at uh, using the history of trauma, right? So our history is only full of traumas. But I, I believe we should understand that this is really an instrumental use of memory to serve very clear authoritarian purposes. Thank you. Thank you. And then, Fad, I'm, I'm sure that India-Pakistani relations are actually built on the image of the enemy and uh, with, the, with the turn towards Hindu nationalism in, in India increasingly. This mm -hmm. is also probably not a trend that is likely to go away anytime soon. No, unfortunately not. Um, and uh, this does speak to Carla's question about how authoritarian governments very conveniently manage to otherize the enemy, not only domestically, but externally as well. Um, and just picking up, a, a from picking up on something that Robert said, um, so I think, I think the road the road from uh, trauma to uh, developing some notion of having an exceptional identity or seeing yourself as an exceptional nation is a very short, it's, it's, it's a short road. Um, the trauma doesn't have to be big. The trauma doesn't have to be on a mass scale. Uh, but what is important is that some of that, there is some, there are remnants within society that remember that trauma and there are, um, you know, you can think of, um, you know, would be autocrats as norm entrepreneurs who are very good at just sort of um, picking up on those threads in a way that uh, services their own political agenda. We've seen this happen time and again. And, and I, what I'm struck by is we were, so across this conversation, we've been talking about a range of countries, um, some which are more, uh, democratically re robust than others, some that are more weakly institutionalized. Um, but I think what's surprising is just how vulnerable all these political entities are to the manipulation of memory, to authoritarian tendencies. You know, we talk about uh, the United States as being one of the oldest democracies in the world. We talk about India as being one of the largest democracies in the world. Um, but yet, in the past, in the past ten years, we've seen a weakening of uh, the democratic structure and a questioning of the strength of the legitimacy of the institutions that run these countries um, in a way that would have been, you know, unfathomable. So, in the context of India and Pakistan, it's interesting because Pakistan has always been sort of the basket case in the region. Uh, was always seen as the 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 you know the more troubled of the two countries. Um, Pakistan is the one with, which has formally had a longer sort of relationship with authoritarianism, um, you know, like Brazil, periods of uh, military rule, um, and then very weak or inept uh, Democrats trying to lead the system. Um, but I, what's, what's actually surprising is, is that on, if you try and sort of just make a balance sheet and sort of look at where India and Pakistan are today and in, in terms of the, 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 you know, their proclivity for being dragged into an external conflict on, on the basis of, say, or, you know, the populist pull factor. Um, war is costly. I think, you know, there's no doubt about that. Um, but why is war popular? That, that's a really intriguing question. And I think what we have found is that um, more recently as, as, you know, in a consequence to globalization, but more specifically, you know, societies that have um, a lot of untapped resentment. Um, these are societies where it's easy for war or external conflict to 
uh, be sold as an elixir, as something that's popular, as something that could perhaps salvage some past glory. Um, and you actually have a public that believes in that. Um, a lot of this has to do with the media, but then a lot of this also has to do with myth making. Um, so one thing that's very interesting in the context of India and Pakistan is, in so in in Pakistan, if you look at you know the authoritarian sort of elements in society, they they will perhaps proceed to point to a more traditional sort of. Um, conception of how the world used to be this this idea of an islamic ummah that sort of ruled the world if you look at what's happening under narendra modi in india the conceptualization is equally one of myth making it's of a you know a hindu rashtra a hindu state that governed the whole of the subcontinent but these were these are just you know these this history tells us that the the Muslims never ruled the world, and history tells us that the Hindu the uh, Hindu majority never ruled the entirety of the subcontinent. Um, so, at play, I think what uh, there is is fundamentally um, dynamics that have to do with ex exclusion, uh, majoritarianism, um, and and uh, a, a strong desire by by the majority to to sort of um, enforce. Um, you know, its dominance and its domination on, on a minority. What's interesting is that authoritarian populists, uh, the, the way they sort of sell this is by saying that what's, what you, the majority risks is losing its status or losing its, you know, privileges. But we know that's far from the truth. Um, but that also tells us something very interesting about human nature, which is loss aversion. Um, so, you know, think back to Donald Trump's 2016 slogan. Why was it so captivating? Why was it so popular with so many people? It was make America great again. Um, it was this idea that Americans had lost or a certain class of Americans had lost the status or the privileges that they'd had. Um, and that certain certain demographics had cut the line, cut the queue to get ahead. It was, it was, you know, looking back, it was just a complete mastery of, of, taking a slogan and turning it into giving it a life of its own but it also tells you why hillary's hillary's stronger together or other sort of slogans that were coming out at the time just didn't have the same appeal because they weren't referring back to this sense of what have we lost as societies what have we lost as communities um, and just as one final point i think um it, it's it's unconventional to think of use use china's example here but i think there's something very interesting in what Xi Jinping says when he talks about uh, the Chinese Communist Party and, you know, he talks about Chinese history. He says that China, um, China is, uh, you know, uh, one of the most ancient civilizations in the world, and it has 5,000 years of continued centralized governance. 5,000 years is di disputed by historians because historians actually say that China, China's civilization is only 3,500 years old. At least that's what the oracle bones and that's what the documents that tell us about the Shang dynasty, which is when Chinese uh, civilization is said to have begun, um, marks that beginning period in time. But for, for, for Xi Jinping and for this idea of sort of legitimacy and propping up this idea of Again, China is an exceptional nation. Um, I think referring to that myth as an important cognitive marker becomes extremely important because, again, it becomes a, a question of, you know, their truth. And, and, and the more that truth is contested or questioned, that truth then becomes a source of also potentially political legitimacy. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And that actually really ties well with, with our uh, second proposition, although as, as I suspected, we're <laughs> taking our time to move through each one proposition, but that's uh, totally natural with uh, this number of people and contexts. But um, it is about the utility of the rituals, uh, of, of the rituals of collective memory, essentially. Uh, of, of its not only negative impact and connection to populism and identity politics, but also to, uh, to its um, beneficial side um, as, as a necessary element uh, of community building, if you, if you will. 
and essentially that um, without it, some cultures and peoples could uh, uh, fade into obscurity or, or worse. Um, the way memory is practiced in public space, the rituals and memorialization keep a people uh, uh, and, and uh, its past alive as testimony of what it is and has been. Uh, textbook and classroom learning are insufficient for this purpose because they maintain uh, the past as a museum piece or anatomical study of the group in question. So rituals of memorialization make the remembrance meaningful in the present uh, in a way a simple learning of facts can never achieve. So that's essentially the second proposition which seemingly, seemingly goes against uh, <laughs> what we were discussing, but it's, it's about the use of memory in public space currently. And, and I don't think we need to be as structured as, as in the first round, so, you know. If I may jump in, actually, I don't think this is in any contradiction as you, you might have suggested with our previous discussion, but it has exactly the uh, a continuity, so to say, because uh, for populist or authoritarian uh, conceptions of memory, I think what matters is, uh, that there is only a single interpretation that is allowed. I, I think this is the main difference that you cannot, you know, have a dispute about history. You are immediately declared the traitor of the nation if you start doubting that China has a 5,000 uh, years history, right? You are un-Chinese in, immediately in, in this sense. And, and this can be continued, I think. And you can look around and I, I, I guess the examples are everywhere, but uh, in Hungary, the, the main square near the parliament house is covered with new statues and the reinterpretation of who are the historical figures. The same can be said about Skopje in Macedonia that became like a, an amusement park with all kinds of statues erected there. But I, I think this uh, unique interpretation of the past is pushed through not only with these rituals, but also with the textbooks and the materials that children would study in schools. So I, I really believe this is really uh, integral part of, of this populist authoritarian uh, practice of using memory. And I wonder what the others think. If I may chime I in. Yeah. Should go ahead. Yeah, well, again, uh, just, you know, to, to follow up with Robert is that's exactly what's going on, I guess, all over the world. I can see it in, in North Africa and Tunisia in particular, where you have the politicization of collective memory, but also of, of amnesia. Like what type of memory that uh, pe people, you know, especially after, uh, you know, the end of uh, colonialism and these small nation states are struggling with their identity, what type of memory people they need to learn. I mean, when you talk about memorization, you know, we have seen, you know, how, um, you know, um, uh, in the US, you know, the toppling of um, Confederate, you know, uh, statues, uh, same thing, you see it in, uh, in certain, you know, have seen it, you know, in, um, after, you know, the fall of the, uh, um, uh, of, uh, the uh, regime of Saddam Hussein, how they toppled, you know, his statue. Uh, in Tunisia, ironically, which is kind of weird that uh, even though the country was going, is going through a democratic transition, which is supposed to be the only success story of the Arab Spring, there was some kind of revival of the memory of the father of the Tunisian independence, Habib Bourguiba, who is an extremely highly controversial person because uh, he's, he's like the uh, Mustafa Ataturk of, uh, of Tunisia in some ways, like he built the new uh, Tunisian state, you know, and he homogenized the nation actually uh, at the expense of minorities, including the blacks, the Amazigh and the Jews, you know, and so, uh, and so his statue has been reinstated uh, a few years ago by, uh, by he, uh, one of his, you know, um, his, I mean, uh, the, the former Tunisian president, uh, Sipsi, as a way to, to kind of uh, get, get more popularity himself as a populist nationalist leader uh, of a country that was going through a democratic transition. And that's, that comes in the context of, um, of, of, of a country that is struggling to, to deal with its transition among a sea of conflicts, you know, with Libya on, uh, on, uh, on, on the East, you know, um, trying, you know, to, 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 to you know, to, to to stabilize itself, unfortunately, you know, uh, in vain, you know, uh, through through this um, this whole conflict that you know engulfed it in 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 um, in, uh, in, um, 
in in a civil war and algeria uh, on on the, on on the uh, on the uh, on the west where where uh, where it is also seen its own you know type of you know um arab spring you know quote unquote kind of you know transition so in all of these you know um social economic and political you know um chaos as it were you have all these populist leaders you know taking advantage of of the anxiety of the people you know the ones especially who who, who at one time uh, became disillusioned with this thing called democracy and tried to reinstate, you know, this this uh, the, to, to to go back to this bygone past, you know, that used to be apparently romantic for some, but not so much for others. So these competing, you know, narratives between collective collective memory uh, that is being selective, highly selective by certain leaders, and amnesia of certain, you know, uh, part of history that needs to be totally erased because it's not politically correct for. For, for those populist leaders. Thank you. And Udi, you, you wanted to jump in? Um, just to say maybe two things. One, I think alongside the populism's use of memory, and as Robert said, the single-mindedness of interpretation, it's also interesting to see, at least in the US, how the response to them also includes uh, battles in the field uh, of shaping memory. So black, the response to Black Lives Matters uh, movement here, a lot of it was in reshaping memories, toppling statues, uh, Mississippi uh, just voting to change its flag and remove the Confederate flag, the United States Army's decision to not uh, to change all the names of buildings uh, of bases that have Confederate leaders. Even in Berkeley, I'm teaching now one course, course at Berkeley. On Thursday, we got a message that the name of the building where we <laughs> where the department sits was changed uh, because of uh, because of the uh, connection to bad things in the past of the, the person that had the name. So <clears throat> this battle on the memory is not only we tend to think of shaping memory as a state top down uh, endeavor, but also some of the responses uh, to it uh, should be understood in that uh, terms. And secondly, I'm wondering what's the effect of technology on all of this, uh, at least the way I think of this public space when, when you brought it up was about you know the public sphere, education, the things that the state controls. But technology now allows us to sit alone in front of Facebook and participate in some sort of a public a memory or interpretation of reality, which is maybe a much more lonely in a way, but connected to large, a much larger group of people. Um, and there's a lot of research, as we know, that shows, you know, that it re-echoes uh, fake news and different understandings of history. Uh, and as more as social life would move to this sphere, we have a whole new set of challenges that are a result of this uh, technological reality that, for example, allows for deep fakes or uh, for many of us not to trust. It's not clear if even the two stories that we could hold of Bourguiba and uh, others, of uh, what Robert said about holding two ideas, even that may be contested. Can I? Yes. To, to respond to one of Udi's um, points, I also think it's very important to, to observe how collective memory is used by populist authoritarian governments, but also by the people in opposition to it. So one main thing that we have to understand is that this type of seeing history and teaching history and writing history, it's also colonial. It was also made by European universities in a time to justify um, invasions of several places around the world. And there are other types of telling history from many African cultures, American, Native American cultures, which are a lot of passing through horror history and music and culture. And I believe that in times like this, that we're seeing a lot of rising of authoritarian populist governments. We're also seeing a lot of opposition to it, which is good, which is what usually happens. So here in Brazil, we have like amazing things um, like this movement we've been watching of Black Lives Matter. The, the situation here of racism in Brazil is terrible. It's much worse than in the US, which doesn't make it any, like we're not, in a contest or anything, but it's so much worse and the world seems not to know it, which is very interesting. And we are also watching a uh, resistance blacks movement of its own history and its own culture. 
and we can see it a lot through music, for example. So last year we have samba here, you all know it. And during Carnival, we have the parades. So last year, something amazing happened. One of the schools, the one who actually won the, the Carnival Parade, they made this samba who is called the history that history doesn't tell. And they bring all these historian facts that are not told in history books. And a lot of people didn't realize that. And when they heard the samba that actually won the contest, they started to research about it and look for about it. And it was very interesting. We also have a lot of um, theater plays and um, music encounters here. I think we, we have this sentence that we've been using since we have this political government going on. It's called, it's in the fight that we meet each other. And a luta que a gente se encontra. And those are places we, we gather not only to discuss, but also to exchange in a cultural way, which becomes like uh, we're trying to read Black authors, Native American authors. We're trying to write music about it and write plays about it. We're trying to revive all the African religions here in Brazil. So this is also very interesting, the collective memory coming from the people against those authoritarian governments. Thank you. Yes, I, I think that's fortunately also a, a trend in, in the past few years. I, I mean, we've seen it in South Africa. I'm, I'm sure it's happening in, in Congo as well, uh, you know, uh, telling other histories that have not been told before. But... If, if I may chime in again. Okay. Just, you know, to follow up on Carlos, yeah, it's true. I mean, that uh, civil society organizations right now especially in countries that have seen some democratic transition in, in the, the North African region, at least, you know, that I'm familiar with, are rediscovering their identities that have been repressed under authoritarian regimes. And I have seen that in the last 10 years, at least in Tunisia and Libya, where the Amazir, for example, you know, are trying to reclaim their identity and they are trying to rebuild a history that has been repressed because uh, because they they think they have always contested the fact that you know Arabness is something that should be uh, the norm in in, in in the region. But um, uh, I always find some kind of uncanny resemblance between Brazil and Tunisia. I don't know why, for some reason, because of slavery. You know, when you talk about slavery, for instance, as a collective memory in Brazil, and sometimes I feel really jealous. You know, that countries like the U.S., for instance, or even Brazil, they were able to teach that. As a black Tunisian, I have never been taught about where I come from and about slavery, which is part of my history because of the decision of an autocrat shortly after the independence of Tunisia in 1956 from the French, not to have this shameful part of, Tun of Tunisian history be part of history. And ironically, the Arab Spring quote unquote Tunisian revolution has brought this up to the surface that for the first time people would know about something called Black Tunisians. These people who have never existed before, they are, they're out of history, they never existed. And for the first time we hear that there are people, whenever I travel abroad, people, they, would, they are shocked to see that I come from a country called Tunisia because as a Mediterranean Muslim uh, country, African, its African heritage has been totally obliterated. And now the people are reclaiming that identity as part of how collective memory needs to be reconstructed. And thanks to the Truth and Dignity Commission in some ways, even though I have to say it has its own drawbacks. Uh, issues of you know Black Tunisian um, uh, uh, people who have been whose whose uh, whose whose stories about you know how slavery has impacted their lives. Tunisian Jews who have seen, for instance, you know, especially after 1967, you know, war with Israel, a lot of them they have left for Israel because you know they have been dispossessed, and the Amazir who have seen that their culture has been totally erased by the former regime of Bourguiba. They, all of them, they, they, they filed to the Truth and Dignity Commission about human rights abuses, but also about, you know, how the, uh, the, the necessity of, uh, to know the truth about what happened under these regimes and to, 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 to cut away with the homogenization of a nation that has never been just one. It's a, it's a small country, Tunisia, but it's so different. I mean, it's so, uh, it's really tiny. It's, it's, it's just, you know, I think for 12 million people, it would be probably the, the size of, you know, uh, I guess, uh, uh, um, Georgia, but, but it's, it's history that goes back to 2,500 years ago, you know, when the first, you know, uh, Jewish um, uh, refugees came from Jerusalem and built the oldest synagogue in Africa. These are things that people totally 
uh, didn't know about it until they had this, the Tunisian revolution had started, you know, to kind of bring in this to the surface. And in some ways people, uh, civil society was playing a big role in trying to educate, you know, um, Tunisians about how um, this collective memory is not only part of, uh, uh, for, for certain communities, but this is, this is type of history that needs to be rewritten, which is again, a very politicized, you know, type of, um, type of um, uh, uh, exercise because when you come from a region where religion is still has uh, has a very heavy you know um, impact on the population it's very uh, these you know these competing narratives for between religion and you know different cultures especially when they are non-islamic they can definitely clash but I guess in a democratic, you know, some kind of small democratic, you know, atmosphere, it could uh, bring some kind of dialogue, at least, you know, between these different communities and uh, kind of bring some kind of normality about what um, what uh, what a nation that is still struggling with with, with its identity can deal with its uh, with its very complex past, especially when it comes to uh, its different its its a racial uh, ethnic um, ethnic makeup. Thank you, Fad or Emery. Hi, hi, Martin. You you want to jump into our uh, discussion? Yeah, uh, this comment brings to me a theory we discussed quite a lot in Germany into our minds. Can you hear me? Is it okay. Um, it is a, a the theory of uh, that memory is always communicative. It's where people like Harald Welzer who wrote books on this and that you, your memories come normally because somebody asks you and shows interest and reinforce you to talk and and uh, of course a memory comes sometimes also automatically but it remains more with you but but you need normally somebody to get it socially affected that people are asking you and and we should pay much more attention on these so settings, whether uh, narratives are welcomed or not, whether people are asked about something, or whether nobody is interested in, in several things. And uh, and this is, I think, a good uh, a good example of the positive histories uh, from Tunisia, especially, and also from Brazil, that uh, that there is an interest in in some of the narratives in Germany. But just to say, it, there was also a, a group, to, to, to mention a group that is maybe a bit from another side, politically from the spectrum, this were the refugees from Eastern Europe who had lost their homes and came to Germany. And uh, their first years in Germany were not so pleasant like the official narrative was, but they were in many ways discriminated and uh, uh, even some were brought first into ancient concentration camps like Bergen-Belsen and lived there at a certain time and because there were no rooms and things uh, of course they were not treated like a, like a concentration camp inmates but but there was a lot of discrimination hard time uh, to go through and this was only since um, something like the beginning of the 90s end of the 80s that books were written on this and people were interested in this and uh, so we should look a bit around in every direction where uh, there are uh, narratives which were not so interested, found not so interest in reinforcement in society. This is, this is a bit my contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Emery, did you want to, uh, yeah? Yes. Um, so I, I think I agree with uh, what Robert said that, uh, uh, it shouldn't be, you know, simply look at uh, in a positive way. So there's also the, I mean, the populist, uh, you know, aspect that we we're discussing earlier, which is included in this uh, ritual of memorialization. Um, so the danger here is that, uh, you know, there's a, you know, a tendency of the uh, creation of grand narrative. Um, so it reminds me of Rwanda, which I visited, uh, I think, um, twice. Um, so you go, you know, through that uh, memorial, um, so it's the museum or 
Um, so there's a story that is tell, you know, it's, it's telling a particular way. Um, so that's, that's the downside of, uh, of, of that process. Um, so the other example could be, uh, you know, in uh, you know, um, Zimbabwe, where you have Great Zimbabwe, uh, you know, monument. And, and uh, I mean, that's, uh, uh, you know, history, or let's say there's a story that, that has been told and retail in a very, very particular way, depending on, uh, you know, which side is want to put which idea forward. Um, and then this lead to the exclusion of ordinary people as well. So I heard somebody pointing out to um, the fact that uh, this process should be, you know, democratized, you know, include more people so that, uh, you know, get to decide which, uh, uh, which event can be memorialized. Um, so that leads to the creation of heroes, of the making of heroes. Um, so usually it's the, it's the uh, those in power that, you know, create these kinds of, um, you know, uh, things. Um, but I would also say that, uh, you know, academics, uh, you know, have also contributed to this, uh, you know, um, I, I mean, this, uh, uh, these processes, um, for example, those in heritage and, uh, you know, museum practices. Um, so they tend to, they tend to um, um, I mean, they tend to essentialize this is a form of essentialization of these processes at the expense of the majority of people. So I think that's something that we need to also, you know, consider. Yeah. Oh yeah, but in, 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 in the Congo, um, so that's very interesting, you know, as uh, something to, to say. Um, you know, compared to Rwanda, where these practices are, you know, memorialization, they have memorial, uh, uh, you know, everywhere. In the DRC, it's not so common. Uh, we have, uh, you know, few statues, uh, you know, like uh, for uh, Lumumba, uh, Laurent Kabila, and recently, you know, about uh, Chisekedi. So again, is who is in power, you know, decide to do what? Um, and for the Mulele rebellion, uh, Mulele, there's a street in, Ki, in Kinshasa named after Mulele. But during my research, uh, you know, people were, uh, you know, contexting that, uh, you know, aspect uh, why it should have a, um, it should get a, a name, a street name after him, when. As you know, we also suff we suffered during that war, but we've been left aside. So this is very interesting, you know, in to see. Uh, I mean, who decides which events become can be memorialized in which form and how? Uh, you know, what you, which ritual ritual should be done in relation to um, to that? Yeah. Thank you, Fat. Did you want to? I see you thinking. I no, I, I'm, I've, I've learned so much, honestly, from what uh, all, all, all my colleagues have said, um, and and this has been such a sort of rich, rich, rich session. Um, I, I, I don't think I have much more to add, actually. Um, I think there was Udi brought up the point about um, how has technology changed. Or impacted the ritualization of memory. That I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I think inherently um, the ritualization of political memory has always been predicated on the idea of the spectacle. Um, and so you can think of you know these big iconic events. Um, you can think of the, the you know uh, the the awful day that, uh, on on. 9-11 when the Twin Towers fell and how that image then came to define, um, you know, a generation of, of um, both American domestic and, and foreign policy, as well as uh, international public opinion. Um, 
I think in some ways the advent of of um, you know the cell phone has um, paradoxically um, democratized the 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 authoritarian experience in a lot of a lot of these places where history is contested. Um, so in other words, you now go, authoritarian governments don't need to rely on propaganda departments to be changing curriculums and changing textbooks to put out their version of history because you now have WhatsApp groups and you have sm uh, smartphone users who are the actual foot soldiers of um, authoritarian memory myth making or, you know, putting out revisionist versions of history, which can be very powerful. Um, and, and just as one sort of final anecdote, um, I was, so I was thinking about, um, uh, you obviously all know that Osama bin Laden was discovered in, in Pakistan in 2011. Um, and what's, what's interesting is, is so the, the, the government of Pakistan was, was caught unaware. And, and the official line has been that Pakistan had no idea that uh, Osama was hiding where he was hiding. Um, the Americans had to come in and carry out a covert raid and, and take him out. Um, but the next day, I thought it was very interesting, um, which is the, the Pakistani authorities went to that compound where Osama had been hiding, um, allegedly for a few years, and demolished it, raised it to the ground. Um, and within, within, I think, a period of months, the, a playground developed over there. If you visit that site today, there's absolutely no, there's no, you know, hint of the sort of huge events that happened there. Equally interesting is the fact that I think the U.S., um, when they came in and they found Osama and they took him out, the first thing that they did was they dumped his body into the ocean. Um, and I think there was uh, official concern at the time is that had they done anything but that, um, it would have created perhaps, you know, legacies for Al-Qaeda or other sort of groups that might want to um, take inspiration from this or call Osama a martyr. Um, and therefore, sometimes it's quite interesting what rational governments also have to do in terms, in terms of revising history to ensure that um, you know, the, the legacy that remains is a legacy that is in, in tandem with democratic principles and, of course, the peace and security of the societies that they, they house. If I can pick up on Fahad's, you know, comment about uh, t technology, actually, you know, um, I just, you know, had in mind, you know, um, uh, an American singer, um, Gil Scott Heron, he was, uh, he was, he used to, his, it's actually it's a rap song, the revolution will not be televised. And I remember when the Arab Spring started, you know, people were talking about the uh, the Arab Spring revolutions, you know, that will be Twitterized and Facebook, you know, uh, um, spread out or, across the world. And there were, at, at, at one time, there was this kind of theory, like if there was no Facebook, no Twitter, will there be an Arab Spring? That was like something that people were asking, like there was the, that was the uh, third wave of democ uh, democratization in, in Eastern Europe. And they, 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 you know, you can see the legacy is usually very mixed, but you know, when you talk about the Arab Spring is totally bleak, but if there was no, um, no none of these, you know, um, uh, social media outlets, will it be possible to get rid of, you know, Ben Ali and Gaddafi and uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh and all these autocrats, or will things will be back to normal? That's something that, even people in these in, in, in this part of the world are still struggling to to think about you know the effect of social media on that and a lot of them at least you know that who believe in conspiracy theory that because of social media you know the things you know have gotten out of control because in the past you know autocrats were able you know to control you know uh, social media in a way that you know uh, things will not get out of control you know uh, from them but globalization kind of played a role in that young people who were behind this whole uh, transform, transform, uh, transformation, democratic transformation in the region um, uh, are, are able to see that, you know, they were out of history in some ways compared to other regions of the world, whether in Latin America, where there was a democratization in a wave at one, at one time or even Eastern Europe. So 
uh, I, bec I, I always remain very uh, perplexed about, you know, this, how, how social media in some ways was, um, were um, um, a blessing, but at the same time could be a curse when it comes, you know, to, uh, to bring in either democratic, some kind of democratic, you know, uh, normality, quote unquote, or, uh, you know, slide it back into authoritarianism, as it were. Uh, I think Emery, for you. Yeah, I just I just want to follow up on this question of uh, social media. Um, so the point I want to to, to make is that um, uh, yeah, it might seem impossible, you know, to control, but I mean, control has been done. Um, so I have um, a colleague of mine, well, a friend of mine who uh, went back to the DRC and he was arrested at the airport based on you know some co the comment that he made so there are um you know uh people in charge of checking who is saying what where and how i mean what they're posting on social media um and now and then the other way of uh of controlling is i mean they can just cut the network it's up in the drc during the elections because people were sharing you know um the results which was against the law they there was a complete blackout for i think um more than 10 days uh, people didn't have internet they couldn't share anything so this is also a form of you know what they resorting to um you know to to implement their control yeah just to respond very quickly, uh, unfortunately, autocrats, you know, before the Arab Spring are the best, probably tech savvy people. I mean, starting from Ben Ali, I'm not sure about Gaddafi, but I guess, you know, Mubarak. But yeah, these are people, they know how to use this highly, you know, um, uh, very complex and sophisticated way of controlling their own people. And this is how they were able, you know, to, you know, to, uh, you know, to, 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 um, to remain in power for such a long time, but some of them they probably were uh, did underestimate the power of the street. But at the same time, uh, the fact that things you know were changing at a very 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 fast pace that they couldn't keep up with that you know with with that change. Of course, uh, um, uh, that's something. Of course, the counter revolutionary movements you know quote unquote they were not like you know this, this idea of you know having you know uh, spontaneous you know protests because they will always try love to blame it on. The U.S. or Israel for wanting, you know, to get rid of uh, um, of these, you know, uh, uh, leaders who have brought us peace and, you know, prosperity for for, for such a long time. So it's um, it's 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 um, I, I'm, unfortunately, the autocrats probably, generally speaking, they're very good at knowing uh, having these, you know, very sophisticated uh, tools of control to be able, you know, to stay in power for a long time. Um, and with the complicity, unfortunately, sometimes of some Western companies, you know, we had Microsoft at one time, you know, uh, you know, uh, spying on certain certain uh, North African, you know, reg uh, regimes, you know, and, uh, but that's something that, of course, you know, that is kept under the carpet because, you know, business is business, you know. Thank you. And of course, this, <laughs> these techniques are also used by the police in, in America uh, against Black Lives Matter uh, protesters and things like that. Um, and yeah, I mean, very often autocratic systems are technologically and technically adept. Um, and I was actually thinking about this a little bit, Fad, uh, I think when Fad and, and Ehud were talking about uh, when you brought up 9-11 because and, and the, uh, the kind of disappearance of Bin Laden's body, um, Jacques Derrida in uh, philosophy in the time of terror and his last lectures, uh, one of the last lectures he gave in called The Beast and the Sovereign, right after 9-11, talks about uh, how there was a near perfect archive, quote unquote, perfect archive of the event because somebody in San Francisco had recorded uh, the FDNY and the NYPDs back and forth. And then there was the video and all of this is happening before things like Twitter and, and cell phones. Um, but then the bodies, of course, the, the people who were in the Twin Towers, those, those, are not body, those are bodies that were disappeared as well. And yet the trace remains in the form of uh, a, a kind of a technique of memory uh, being deployed by multiple sides in all of this 
the effects that 9-11 had on the global international scene. Um, and sorry, I'm trying to work my way into a transition to our last proposition here um, because I love Derrida and I, and I kind of worked on work. One of the things that uh, I have a particular interest in in terms of um, uh, institutions and, and memory is the question of, of desire by institutions, institutional desires. Um, so I'm gonna try to kind of combine those third and fourth propositions um, because we're, well, we're actually over time now, aren't we? <laughs> All right. So we knew this would happen. Um, so cultural trauma and contested narratives of collective memory are the best investment into a, into society, into a society that's more open, tolerant, and socially cohesive. At the same time, very often, contestation occurs over those memories uh, in the form of expressions of certain desires, both by individuals and by academic, political, and social institutions, specifically the desire to be right, to know that they know the facts, and so to present a singular in incontestable or uncontestable story. And when the desire to be right comes into view, these contests over history become contests over truth and fact. So I'm gonna uh, leave it there for the moment. I mean, if nobody wants to start, I, I think these are exactly the issues that we have been discussing and uh, we even moved beyond, let's say, of this original proposition because we also already started talking about the aspect of technology. And uh, just to summarize, it seems that, you know, on the one hand, we seem um, to witness this uh, increased interest or increased push from authoritarian or populist leaders for a unique interpretation of uh, history or memory, which uh, does not allow for any uh, dispute, right? So, but at the same time, and Udi suggested this, right? So there might be new technologies as new avenues to voice uh, discontent with this, uh, let's call it official interpretation. But at the same time, uh, this is a question more than a anything else, I was thinking of China, right? And this, uh, what we can read about that they are building this super system of surveillance, which would more or less silence any alternative voice again, because um, unless you conform with the system, you might lose those points that might basically disable your everyday life. So are we, really, moving forward into, let's say, a spectator type of democracy where everything is decided for us and like it or not, there is no choice, I wonder. I think all these technologies are driven by, you know, essentially, if you go the drill down to enlightenment and ideas about, uh, you know, human freedom. So you wonder, we think of these technologies, at least the way Robert presented it, and many of us experiencing it as something that is, is suppressive. But at the end of the day, to advance in technology, you have to have some openness, some uh, inquisitive approach, an ability to doubt the current realities. And it's a big question when you look at academic institutions, I don't know, in places that are less open. So maybe the Soviet Union did offer a model of technological advance uh, with political suppression, but I think we have this notion from the West that they go hand in hand. So what will be the, the future of technological development in a suppressed environment in which there is only one story, one history, and uh, not being able to doubt and so on. Can you leave the scientific inquiry separate from the social and historical inquiry? So, um... I'm also gonna raise a question more than anything else here. 
And I'd like to thank, we've been chatting and discussing about um, authoritarian governments. And I believe as academics, as teachers, as writers, we should ask ourselves which, what is our role in the middle of all that. And I think this is something for us also to, to reflect together as a group of people in different countries. Um, and I keep asking myself, being a PhD student, um, we were talking about it, how, how we were going to try to conduct this roundtable more informal and to have like a nice chat and not actually presentations. And I think something that really bothers me sometimes in, in, in the academic environment is that we're using very difficult words and we're actually writing for each other and not writing for, for people to read. So this is one thing that I think what as academics can we do is our role contesting this, this politics of memory, this official one. And I guess also try to bring it to our day-to-day -day life. Like what can we do to try to dialogue with other people that are buying into this fake, fake news and into this um, social media and, and what the government is putting out there is propaganda. So I guess people don't actually talk anymore. They don't actually try to exchange information. And this demands a lot, something I learned actually from Dasha. Um, it's important to, to come to the table and to listen is the hardest part. But I guess like we, we should recover that and do that to listen why people are buying into this narrative, to understand their reasons, and then to be able to actually dialogue with them and present new facts and also rethink our roles as academics in all this. It's just raising another question actually, more than anything else. Can I chime in? <laughs> I may sound a bit of fatalist, I mean a fatalist unfortunately, but uh, one of the reasons why I, I left my country because I felt it's really hard as an academic to survive in an environment where history has been totally manipulated by one single you know, version of what history is about. So, um, and because at the same time, we as academics, we live in our ivory tower and we are unable you know, to, to reach out to the you know, to the to I mean to speak the language of the people, but but that's again uh, not our, really our fault. But because there's this kind of frustration that um, that this discourse of academics, you know, when it comes to um, uh, to to uh, to presenting history, you know, and memory of uh, uh, that has always been you know manipulated by by let's say by authoritarian regimes. It, it, it becomes like an, an, an uphill struggle, you know, uh, to, uh, to make people, you know, um, believe, you know, an alternative, you know, story, because it's easier, you know, to brainwash people into a beautiful, you know, version of what history is than uh, try to tell them what the truths are, because there are so many truths, you know, especially when you come from a part of the region where you have so many contested, you know, identities and histories and each is fighting, you know, for its own legitimacy. I think, um, as I said, I'm a fatalist in this, unfortunately, because uh, I know sometimes um, in, I, I chose to write because uh, it's, I was given that chance, thanks to the democratic transition in Tunisia, that for the first time you hear about, you know, this minority called Black Tunisians who could speak out, you know, and they could write something. But before that history of these minorities were written by the, the victors, were written by the former colonizers, like most of the archives, for example, when it comes to slavery, when it comes to what happened after the, um, before the independence, after the independence, you find them in Paris, you know, in French, you know, um, in French, you know, the museums or, 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 or French libraries, because this this is what happens when you have this new what this nation. Uh, I mean, the nation states, you know, they are rebuilding their own, you know, identities after the decolonization. They will be struggling again with with the, with their former colonizers. We have seen that with Algeria, for instance. The right now, you know, how you know Macron has in some ways tried you know to kind of reach out to you know to the to the algerians by in 2007 17 as a way you know to um, you know to win the elections you know against marine le pen and and declare that you know what happened in algeria was a crime against humanity it's all a political ploy so i i guess you know probably given 
more voice, you know, to those who have been marginalized, you know, especially, you know, marginalized academics is, uh, is, is probably the, the first, um, it's what it's, I mean, it will open the door for others, you know, to be able to tell their stories. And especially when it comes to a lot of those marginalized communities, I'm talking about black Tunisians, but also about, you know, Tunisian Jews and, uh, uh, and the Berbers have a strong oral history that is so important that it could, you know, you know uh, that it could bring something, you know, to the world about, you know, what is, uh, what, how, how this, how this, how, how, how memory could be seen in, in a different way uh, away from how the orthodoxy of uh, political, you know, um, uh, politicians or you know autocrats, you know, have tried, you know, to you know to to paint, you know, the the, the history of one country, you know, with with just you know with with the same brush, you know, that that this history is something that is um, uh, uh, that that is that cannot move. That that is it's a, it's a history that is uh, that is uh, um, um, that is usually. Um, 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 uh, you know, uh, that, that it has, um, how to put it, you know, <laughs> that uh, it's a mobile, you know, kind of history. Uh, history. It's not something that is uh, dynamic and that could uh, be, uh, uh, that could be questioned, but also that could be, uh, could be a, a way for other, um, uh, other generation of, you know, historians, you know, uh, um, will take, you know, advantage of or, 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 or at the same time, learn from what the mistakes of you know previous generations of historians have 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 um, have um, uh, have, ma have made. You know. So maybe. This is the moment to uh, end on a more positive uh, note, right? And uh, this was like, uh, what can we do as academics or teachers or maybe just simple people that are interested in these issues? I personally believe it's very important that uh, you tell everybody. And if, if you know ordinary people cannot understand you, then most likely you are speaking or writing in the wrong way, I believe. But uh, you should just always say that, you know, you need to be critical and there is no single truth. I think this is what's most important, that people just scrutinize everything and, uh, and they actually learn to accept criticism and to be critical because it is actually the danger of this plurality of views uh, is in, is a danger, I believe, and, and this is what I, I, I would say it's most important that, you know, you always emphasize there is a plurality of opinions, views, beliefs, whatever, and you should be ready to accept this. Um, so I think I should say something um, as well. Um, um, so the question of, um, you know, us as academics um, and uh, what we write about, um, um, the language that we use, and most of the time we tend to speak to each other rather than, you know, um, the first public. Um, I think attached to that is the, the question of audience, which I think is also very important. So, um, I mean, when I, 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 I write, so at least I always ask that question. So who uh, do I want to, um, you know, reach? Is it the vast, you know, I mean, the vast population or it's a, it's a specific group of individuals? I think that's very important. And that would help at least, that helped me to craft my, you know, writing in a, in a particular way. Um, and I have friends who have translated their PhDs, you know, uh, into, 
local languages. So my colleague Nancy Rushora, you know, just translated her PhD dissertation into Swahili, so that at least she can reach, you know, it's a form of giving back to um, those who, you know, share those stories. And uh, I think that's that's also uh, a medium. Um, and then there are blogs as well. So because when I, you know, writing a blog, so I wouldn't write it as a, an academic piece because I want to communicate, uh, you know, um, let's say, uh, broader ideas, but in a very, very concise way, so that it reach, you know, a majority of people. Um, I think that these are um, some important things to to consider as well. Um, because we were to, we are talking about democracy, uh, you know, freedom, um, you know, authoritarianism. Um, I think imagination is also important here. You know, although physically we are deprived, we we can't exercise certain um, you know forms of freedom. Um, but there's this imagination, you know, space which which becomes also important. Um, so the example here is, you know, when Emmanuel Macron uh, won the election in France. Um, so in Central Africa and West Africa, especially in Francophone speaking countries, people were ecstatic. So they were like, they were very happy. They were so happy that Macron won. So uh, the question then this raises is, um, uh, is uh, does it have to do with colonialism? I, I, I mean, how the people in Central Africa, West Africa, you know, still colonized mentally. Um, so this, well, some people said yes. But the other, th I, I, which for me was plausible was the idea that we have been deprived of these, you know, um, these things. You go, you choose your, the, I mean, the person you vote for somebody and then the result is the opposite. It's not the same. Now to relieve yourself, at least you, you I mean, you venture into imagination. You use that you know, example as a way of consolation. So I think the imagination uh, you know, realm is, is quite important in, in those processes in, when we think about you know, freedom um, or I mean, lack of freedom or I mean, whatever we can, we can call it, yeah. But I still haven't tackled those uh, questions of, uh, you know, those two last proposition, yeah. <laughs> If I may respond to Emery about the language, you know, uh, which language do we use, you know, to to tell these stories, you know, this his, these histories. I was reading recently uh, an article uh, on a website called Africa as a Country, and it's called Linguistic Famine. And uh, the author um, is criticizing all these African, you know, uh, thinkers and academics when they go to the U.S. and they start speaking in a flawless uh, English. And then uh, they end up in some ways not writing in their local languages, but rather in uh, in in their, you know, in the colonizers' language. And I am guilty of that because I speak English, which is which is uh, an alien language to me. But after the Arab Spring, a lot of I've noticed that uh, a lot of more and more young Arabs are reclaiming Arabic language, which which is a highly politicized language. For instance, in country like France, Arabic is considered by some. French, let's say, far right as a terrorist language because of the long history of colonization that France was uh, totally failed, you know, to 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 solve when it comes to the Alge to Algeria uh, to Algeria. So um, the reclaiming of these languages, you know, especially local languages, whether it's Kiswahili or or or, or Arabic or um, or even Berber languages, you know, uh, is a way for people to kind of reclaim. Uh, their history and write it in a way that it becomes more democratized in, in, in their nations. And I remember the first time I wrote in Arabic uh, was a few years ago about black uh, about racism in the Arab world. 
And I was really scared that people might attack me because I wrote it in Arabic uh, uh, in uh, trying to, you know, dig into this taboo that people wouldn't want to see it in the Arab in the Arab region. And I brought from history, someone like Ibn Khaldun, who was considered, um, was even though he's considered as the father of sociology, who happens to come, to come from Tunisia, but he had some kind of racist undertones in his own writing. And writing that in Arabic was kind of, kind of, of liberation. Uh, so I felt like I was suffering less from this, uh, this syndrome of um, linguistic famine and felt more enriched, you know, and I think it's important that, you know, that especially when it comes to academia, academia in the Arab world is probably the one that is suffering the most in the, in the region because a lot of Arab academics, they choose to, to migrate to other countries, especially in, in the West, because they are unable to find, you know, um, uh, the, the atmosphere that is conducive to some kind of, you know, um, um, some kind of imagination, as you know, Amir has talked about, so some kind of uh, innovation, because an autocratic regime will never allow people to, you know, academics, you know, to flourish in in a, in um, in in a, in a, in, a, in an an environment, an academic environment that that can retell the story or history in a way that is away from the propaganda that that those regimes, you know, have been propagating for uh, for since uh, since you know uh, the, decolon uh, uh, the decolonization. And on 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 the fact that the Fran some francophone countries, you know, they celebrated the um, the victory of, for example, of Macron. Unfortunately, still uh, the issue of you know uh, decolonization is uh, is uh, on how to decolonize, you know. These countries, you know, uh, whether in West Africa, but also North Africa, because we were, I think we're, we're in the same type, you know, of, of struggle, you know, how to kind of try to find this kind of, you know, um, a divorce, you know, that shouldn't be very painful with the former colonizers. That's something that, that I guess academics, but also even, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, people in general that are uh, trying to, you know, to, 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 to deal with, you know, how to, uh, to try and find a way of, of making you know it less sufferable, um, um, this whole process of uh, reclaiming you know uh, the history and uh, uh, reassessing you know the whole you know uh, post-colonial history uh, as it were. Thank you, Huda. So we're kind of making a full circle towards decolonization where we started, and I'm looking at the at the clock and. Um, uh, and I'm looking at Fad, who hasn't uh, who hasn't said his piece. Do you want to tell us some beautiful final words? Uh, I, I I don't. No pressure. Um, I think I think everything every I, I agree in in entire entire entirety with what's been said so far. I think Emery's point about uh, the need for more imagination is extremely important. And I think as historians, academics, um, political scientists, social scientists, we do need to hold ourselves to a higher standard. Why is it okay for political charlatans to sort of, you know, step in one day and sort of magically diagnose what is ailing society and then find these um, idioms and frameworks that they can then use to tap into that resentment uh, which in turn then fuels their rise. Um, I think as scholars, there is a greater sort of, um, it is, there is a greater imperative for us to step up and provide those frameworks and provide ways in which um, two different communities is, need to be right, can coexist with one another and can in fact speak to one another. Um, so I think being able to uh, provide the language for that um, and to provide the analytical frameworks that allow for that coexistence to happen is extremely important. Uh, you know, these don't, we can't just wish for these sort of chasms to be bridged overnight, but it does require a little bit of, I guess, introspection as well. And um, also thinking normatively in terms of how the re research that we do speaks to affecting, speaks to the lives of those who are living these realities on the ground. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, and we even failed to open for, for questions uh, from the public, um, but you've all been amazing. Uh, I, I was a little bit worried when we came up with this uh, experiment idea 
um, whether it will not be too scattered and, and uh, too much all, all, over, all over the place. But um, uh, it has been amazing to listen from, from this side um, and find the interconnections and, and the common themes in, uh, um, in uh, so many continents. Um, there's a, a beautiful essay by, by Hannah Arendt about truth and politics, um, where she says that um, uh, truth and especially factual truth is especially endangered um, in the political realm, realm by politicians. And uh, the rational truth resides in academia, in, uh, uh, in our minds and in our professions, essentially. So I think that the final round was uh, especially pertinent to what we do and um, kind of a call for us to do it really well. So thank you again so, so very much. Um, for being here. I know that it's, it's early morning in California and it's late, late in, uh, in the night in, in Pakistan, which are our extremes in, in our time zones. So I appreciate very much that, that you joined us uh, uh, for this chat. And I only wish that it could have been in Bratislava in person. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and see you soon. Thank, Thank you. you. And I think thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Martin. And I think we're, we're actually not, not going to have a special session on uh, on closing of, of the conference because th there's not much else to, to do other than close. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> if we can uh, invite uh, everybody else just just so that we can see each other for one last time. Uh, hi, hi, Charles. Good to see you again. Um, we wanted to thank especially all of the students that were helping us that you were hearing from. Uh, there's Maika, um, Maciej, Alexa, uh, who were doing a lot of the run of the mills and some others. Um, uh, oh, there he is. Yeah, there is Maciej. Maciej is the technological guru who made all of this possible and Alexa made it all, all beautiful <laughs> in terms of design. So thank you guys very much. Um, we also had uh, uh, support staff from our current students. There was Damian, Vicky, um, um, and others. <laughs> without <laughs> whom, yeah, without whom it wouldn't be possible. Uh, it's been amazing the, the whole two days. Um, I'm really glad we went for this difficult topic. Um, and um, yeah, let's do it again. James? Uh, I was just checking to see what, what else there was. Um, so for those of you who might, we, we have, in the past, we've turned uh, selected submissions from this into a book, but we had a, a plan ahead of time on how to do that. So we didn't want to mention that. We, didn't have, we don't have a specific <coughs> publisher. Um, and I know some people have committed what they presented to other places. So we, um, but we're going to be in touch uh, once we get a little bit more of a plan. Um, and just to see, just to garner and poll people for interests and things like that. Um, and uh, I think, well, I also wanted to thank the students who did all that work in the background and, and all the participants, because this was a lot, but, <laughs> Um, but I learned a lot, which is always, always the mark of a good, a good conference, I think. Um, and I think a special yeah. medal goes to all of the people who lasted the entire two days. Um, <laughs> and, and there are such people. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think my floor may have a permanent indentation now <laughs> from sitting in it, sitting in this chair. Um, other than that, we were going to invite you for wine and cheese, but um, I suppose you'll, we'll all have to do that <laughs> in our own individual hobbles. Uh, I, I think that's, that's all I have, but thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> all the, all the left. The ones, everyone who's left. <laughs>